edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. The Glories of Ireland We had at first intended that this should be a book without a preface, and indeed it needs none, for it speaks in no uncertain tones for itself. But on reconsideration, we decided that it would be more seemly to give a short explanation of our aim, our motives, and our methods. As a result of innumerable inquiries which have come to us during our experience as educators, we have been forced to the conclusion that the performances of the Irish race in many fields of endeavor are entirely unknown to most people, and that even to the elect they are not nearly so well known as they deserve to be. Hence there came to us the thought of placing on record, in an accessible, comprehensive, and permanent form, an outline of the whole range of Irish achievement during the last 2,000 years. In undertaking this task, we had a twofold motive. In the first place, we wished to give to people of Irish birth or descent substantial reason for that pride of race which we know is in them, by placing in their hands an authoritative and unassailable array of facts as telling as any nation in the world can show. Our second motive was that henceforward, he who seeks to ignore or belittle the part taken by men and women of Irish birth or blood in promoting the spread of religion, civilization, education, culture, and freedom should sin, not in ignorance, but against the light, and that from a thousand quarters at once champions armed with the panoply of knowledge should be able to spring to his confutation. To carry out in a satisfactory manner over a field so immense our lawfully ambitious aim was, as we realized at the outset, not possible to any two men who are primarily engaged, as we are, in other work of an exacting nature. Therefore, to render feasible the execution of our undertaking, we decided to invite the collaboration of many scholars and specialists, each of whom could, out of the fullness of information, speak with authority on some particular phase of the general subject we are glad to say that the eminent writers to whom we addressed ourselves answered with promptitude and alacrity to our call, and have supplied us with such a body of material as to enable us to bring out a book that is absolutely unique. From each contributor we ask nothing but a plain, verifiable statement of facts, and that, we think, is exactly what they have given us. For while we do not make ourselves personally responsible for everything set down in the following pages, we believe that what stands written therein bears every mark of careful research and of absolute reliability. Although on many of our subjects little more remains to be said than what appears in the text, yet the treatment on the whole does not claim to be exhaustive, and therefore each writer has, at our request, appended to his contribution a short and carefully selected bibliography, so that those who are interested may have a guide for further reading. For our part, we consider these lists of works of reference to be a highly useful feature. It is a glorious thing for us, who are proud, one of us of his Irish descent and the other of his Irish birth, to think that the sons and daughters of Mother Erin have so conspicuously distinguished themselves in such varied spheres of activity in every age and in so many lands and that we were privileged to make public the record of their achievements in a form never before attempted. We have other works in contemplation, and some actually in preparation, which will go far to strengthen the claims put forward in this book. In the meantime, we trust that the reception accorded to it will be such as to encourage us to persevere in making still better known the glories of Ireland. Joseph Dunn, P.J. Lennox Catholic University of America, Washington, D.C., November 1914. The Glories of Ireland, A Romance of Irish History by Sir Roger Casement, CMG. The history of Ireland remains to be written, for the purpose of Irish men remains yet to be achieved. The struggle for national realisation, begun so many centuries ago, is not ended. And if the long story offers a so frequent record of failure, it offers a continuous appeal to the highest motives and a constant exhibition of a most pathetic patriotism linked with the sternest courage. Irish wars throughout all time have been only against one enemy, the invader, and, 
ending so often a material disaster, they have conferred always a moral gain. Their memory uplifts the Irish heart. For no nation, no people can reproach Ireland with having wronged them. When, at the dawn of the Christian era, we first hear of Ireland from external sources, we learn of it as an island harbouring free men, whose indomitable love of freedom was hateful to the spirit of imperial exploitation. Agricola's advice to the empire builders of his day was that Rome should war down and take possession of Ireland, so that freedom might be put out of sight. It was to meet this challenge of despotism that the Scottish clans of Alba turned to their motherland for help and the sea was white with the hurrying oars of the men of air and speeding to the call of their highland kinsmen, threatened with imperial servitude. The first external record we possess thus makes it clear that when the early Irish went forth to carry war abroad, it was not to impose their yoke on other peoples, or to found an empire, but to battle against the empire of the world in the threatened cause they held so dear at home. In this early Roman reference to Ireland, we get the keynote to all later Irish history. A warring down on the one hand so that freedom might be put out of sight, an eternal resistance on the other so that it might be upheld. It was this struggle that Ireland sought to maintain against every form of attack, down through Danish, Norman, Tudor, Stuart and Cromwellian assault, to the larger imperialism of the 19th century. When, as Chiri, the historian of the Norman Conquest, tells us, it still remained the one lost cause of history that refused to admit defeat. This indomitable persistency, this faculty of persevering through centuries of misery, the remembrance of lost liberty and of never despairing of a cause always defeated, always fatal to those who dare to defend it, is perhaps the strangest and noblest example ever given by any nation. The resources of Ireland opposed to her invaders have been unequal to the founding of a great state, but have preserved a great tradition. The weakness of Ireland lay in the absence of a central organization, a state machine that could mobilize the national resources to defend the national life. That life had to depend for its existence under the stress of prolonged invasion on the spontaneous patriotism and courage of individuals. At times one clan alone, or two clans, maintained the struggle. Arrayed against them were all resources of a mighty realm, shipping, arms, munitions of war, gold, statecraft, a widespread and calculating diplomacy, the prestige of a great sovereign in a famous court. And the Irish clan and its chieftain, by the sheer courage of its members, by their bodily strength and hardihood and feats of daring, for years kept the issue in doubt. When Hugh O'Neill, leagued with Red Hugh O'Donnell, challenged the might of Elizabeth, he had nothing to rely upon but the stout hearts and arms of the men of Tyr Owen and Tyr Connell. Arms and armaments were far from Ulster. They could be procured only in Spain or elsewhere on the continent. English shipping held the sea. The English mint the coinage. The purse of England, compared to that of the Ulster princes, was inexhaustible. Yet for nine years the courage, the chivalry, the daring and skill of these northern clansmen, perhaps twenty thousand men in all, held all the might of England at bay. And the Spanish king, at any time during the contest, made good his promise to lend effective aid to the Irish princes. O'Neill would have driven Elizabeth from Ireland, and a sovereign state would today be the guardian of the freedom of the western seas for Europe and the world. It took the best army in Europe, and a vast treasure, as Sir John Davies asserted, to conquer two Ulster clans three hundred years ago. The naked valour of the Irishman excelled the armed might of Tudor England, and the struggle that gave the Empire of the Seas to Britain was not won in the essay of battle, but in the assay of the mint. It is this aspect of the Irish fight for freedom that dignifies an otherwise lost cause. Ever defeated, yet undefeated, a long-remembering race believes that these native qualities must in the end prevail. The battle has been from the first one of manhood against might. The state papers, the official record of English rule in Ireland, leave us rarely in doubt. We read in that record that, where the appeal was to the strength or courage of the opposing men, 
the Irish had nothing to fear from English arms. Thus the Earl of Essex, in a dispatch to Elizabeth, explained the failure of his great expedition in 1599 against O'Neill and O'Donnell. These rebels have, though I do unwillingly confess it, better bodies and perfecter use of their arms than those men whom your majesty sends over. The flight of the earls in 1607 left Ireland leaderless, with nothing but the bodies and hearts of the people to depend on. In 1613 we read, in the same records, a candid admission that, although the clan system had been destroyed and the great chiefs expropriated, converted, or driven to flight, the people still trusted to their own stout arms and fearless hearts. The next rebellion, whenever it shall happen, doth threaten more danger to the state than any heretofore, when the cities and walled towns were always faithful. One, because they have the same bodies they ever had, and therein they had and have advantage of us. Two, from infancy they have been and are exercised in the use of arms. Three, the realm, by reason of the long peace, was never so full of youths. Four, that they are better soldiers than heretofore their continental employment in wars abroad assures us, and they do conceive that their men are better than ours. And when that next rebellion came, the great uprising of the outraged race in 1641, what do we find? Back from the continent sails the nephew of the great O'Neill who had left Ireland a little boy in the flight of the earls, and the dispossessed clansmen, robbed of all but their strength of body and heart, gathered to the summons of Owen Roe. Again it was the same issue. The courage and hardihood of the Irishman to set against the superior arms, equipment and wealth of United Britain. Irish valour won the battle. A great state organisation won the campaign. England and Scotland combined to lay low resurgent Ireland. And again the victory was not to the brave and skilled, but to the longer purse and the implacable mind. Perhaps the most vivid testimony to these innate qualities of the Irishman is to be found in a typically Irish challenge issued in the course of this ten years' war from 1641 to 1651. The document has a lasting interest, for it displays not only the better body of the Irishman, but something of his better heart and chivalry of soul. One Parsons, an English settler in Ireland, had written to a friend to say, among other things, that the head of a colonel of an Irish regiment, then in the field against the English, would not be allowed to stick long on its shoulders. The letter was intercepted by the very regiment itself, and a captain in it, Phelim O'Malloy, wrote back to Parsons. I will do this if you please. I will pick out sixty men and fight against one hundred of your choice men. If you do but pitch your camp one mile out of your town, and then, if you have the victory, you may threaten my colonel. Otherwise, do not reckon your chickens before they are hatched. It was this same spirit of daring, this innate belief in his own manhood, that for three hundred years made every Irishman the custodian of his country's honour. An Irish state had not been born. That battle had still to be fought. But the romantic effort to achieve it reveals ever an unstained record of personal courage. Freedom has not come to Ireland. It has been warred down and kept out of sight. But it has been kept in the Irish heart from Brian Boru to Robert Emmett by a long tale of bloodshed always in the same cause. Freedom is kept alive in man's blood only by the shedding of that blood. It was this they were seeking, those splendid scorners of death, the lads and young men of Mayo, who awaited with a fearless joy the advance of the English army fresh from the defeat of Humbert in 1798. Then, if ever, Irish men might have run from a victorious and pitiless enemy, who, having captured the French general and murdered in cold blood the hundreds of Kalala peasants who were, with his colours, were now come to Kalala itself to wreak vengeance on the last stronghold of Irish rebellion. The ill-led, and half-armed peasants, the last Irish men in Ireland to stand in open, pitched fight for their country's freedom, went to meet the army of General Lake, as the Protestant bishop who saw them says, running upon death was as little appearance of reflection or concern as if they were hastening to a show. 
The influences that begot this reverence for freedom lie in the island itself, no less than the rote ancestry of the people. Whoever looks upon Ireland cannot conceive it as the parent of any but free men. Climate and soil here unite to tell man that brotherhood, and not dominion, constitutes the only nobility for those who call this fair shore their motherland. The Irish struggle for liberty owes as much, perhaps to the continual influence of the same lakes and rivers, and the same mountains, as to the survival of any political fragments of the past. Irish history is inseparably the history of the land, rather than of a race, and in this it offers us a spectacle of a continuing national unity that long continuing disaster has not been able wholly to efface or wholly to disrupt. To discover the Europe that existed before Rome, we must turn to the East, Greece, and to the West, Ireland. Ireland alone among Western lands preserves the recorded tradition, the native history, the continuity of mind, and until yesterday of speech and song, that connect the half of Europe with its ancestral past. For early Europe was very largely Celtic Europe, and nowhere can we trace the continuous influence of Celtic culture and idealism coming down to us from a remote past save in Ireland. To understand the intellect of pre-Roman Gaul, of Spain, of Portugal and largely of Germany, and even of Italy, we must go to Ireland. Whoever visits Spain or Portugal to investigate the past of those countries will find that the record stops where Rome began. Take England in further illustration. The first record the inhabitants of England have of the past of their island comes from Roman invasion. They know of Boadicea, of Cisavellanus, the earliest figures in their histories, from what a foreign destroyer tells them in an alien tongue. All the early life of Celt Iberians and Lusitanians has passed away from the record of human endeavour, save only where we find it recorded by the Italian invaders in their own speech and in such terms as imperial exploitation ever prescribes for its own advancement and the belittlement of those it assails. Ireland alone, among all Western nations, knows her own past. From the very dawn of history, and before the romance of Romulus began, down to the present day, in the tongue of her own island people, and in the light of her own native mind. Early Irish history is not the record of clan strivings of a petty and remote population, far from the centre of civilization, It is the authentic story of all Western civilization before the warm solvent of Mediterranean blood and iron melted and moulded it into another and rigid shape. The Irishman called O'Neill, O'Brien, O'Donnell, steps out of a past well-nigh co-eval with the heroisms and tragedies that uplifted Greece and laid Troy in ashes and swept the Mediterranean with an odyssey of romance that still gives its name to each chief island, cape, and promontory of the mother sea of Europe. Ireland, too, steps out of a story just as old. Well nigh every hill or mountain, every lake or river bears the name today it bore a thousand, two thousand years ago, and one recording some dramatic human or semi-divine event. The songs of the Munster and Connacht poets of the 18th and 19th centuries gave to every cottage in the land the ownership as well as the tale of an heroic ancestry. They linked the Ireland of yesterday with the Ireland of Finn and Oscar, of Dermot and Grania, of Deirdre and the sons of Ushnik and Cuchulain and the Hound of Ulster. The people bred on such soul-stirring tales as these, linked by a language the most expressive of any spoken on earth in thought and verse and song the very dawn of their history were in there moved as familiar figures, men with the attributes of gods, great in battle, grand in danger, strong in loving, vehement in death. Such a people could never be vulgar, could never be mean, but must repeat in their own time and in their own manhood actions and efforts thus ascribed as a vital part of their very origin. Hence the inspiration that gave the name of Fenian in the late 19th century to a band of men who sought to achieve by arms the freedom of Ireland. The law of the Fenian of the days of Marcus Aurelius was the law of the Fenian in the reign of Victoria, to give all, mind, body and strength of purpose to the defence of his country, to speak truth and harbour no greed in his heart. Some there are who may deny to Finn and his Fenians of the 2nd and 3rd centuries corporeal existence 
Yet nothing is surer than that Ireland claims these ancestral embodiments of an heroic tradition by a far surer title of native record than gives to the Germans Arminius, to the Gauls Ariovistus, to the British Caractacus. This conception of a national life, one with the land itself, was very clear to the ancient Irish, just as it has been and is the foundation of all later national effort. If ever the idea of a nationality becomes the subject of a thorough and honest study, it will be seen that among all the peoples of antiquity, not excluding the Hellenes and the Hebrews, Ireland alone among western lands preserves the recorded tradition, the native history, the continuity of mind, and until yesterday of speech and song, that connect the half of Europe with its ancestral past. For early Europe was very largely Celtic Europe, and nowhere can we trace the continuous influence of Celtic culture and idealism coming down to us from a remote past, save in Ireland. To understand the intellect of pre-Roman Gaul, of Spain, of Portugal, and largely of Germany, and even of Italy, we must go to Ireland. Whoever visits Spain or Portugal to investigate the past of those countries will find that the record stops where Rome began. Take England in further illustration. The first record the inhabitants of England have of the past of their island comes from Roman invasion. They know of Boadicea, of Cisavellanus, the earliest figures in their histories, from what a foreign destroyer tells them in an alien tongue. All the early life of Celt Iberians and Lusitanians has passed away from the record of human endeavour, save only where we find it recorded by the Italian invaders in their own speech. And in such terms as imperial exploitation ever prescribes for its own advancement and the belittlement of those it assails. Ireland alone among all Western nations knows her own past. From the very dawn of history and before the romance of Romulus began, down to the present day, in the tongue of her own island people and in the light of her own native mind. Early Irish history is not the record of clan strivings of a petty and remote population, far from the centre of civilization. It is the authentic story of all Western civilization before the warm solvent of Mediterranean blood and iron melted and moulded it into another and rigid shape. The Irishman called O'Neill, O'Brien, O'Donnell steps out of a past well nigh coeval with the heroisms and tragedies that uplifted Greece and laid Troy in ashes and swept the Mediterranean with an odyssey of romance that still gives its name to each chief island, cape and promontory of the mother sea of Europe. Ireland too steps out of a story just as old. Well nigh every hill or mountain, every lake or river bears the name today it bore a thousand, two thousand years ago, and one recording some dramatic human or semi-divine event. The songs of the Munster and Connacht poets of the 18th and 19th centuries gave to every cottage in the land the ownership as well as the tale of an heroic ancestry. They linked the Ireland of yesterday with the Ireland of Finn and Oscar, of Dermot and Grania, of Deirdre and the sons of Ushnik, and Cucullan and the Hound of Ulster. The people bred on such soul-stirring tales as these, linked by a language the most expressive of any spoken on earth, in thought and verse and song, with the very dawn of their history wherein there moved as familiar figures men with the attributes of gods, great in battle, grand in danger, strong in loving, vehement in death, such a people could never be vulgar, could never be mean, but must repeat in their own time and in their own manhood actions and efforts thus ascribed as a vital part of their very origin. Hence the inspiration that gave the name of Fenian in the late 19th century to a band of men who sought to achieve by arms the freedom of Ireland. The law of the Fenian of the days of Marcus Aurelius was the law of the Fenian in the reign of Victoria, to give all, mind, body and strength of purpose to the defence of his country, to speak truth and harbour no greed in his heart. Some there are who may deny to Finn and his Fenians of the second and third centuries corporeal existence, yet nothing is surer than that Ireland claims these ancestral embodiments of an heroic tradition by a far surer title of native record than gives to the Germans Arminius, to the Gauls Ariovistus, to the British Caractacus. This conception of a national life, one with the land itself, was very clear to the ancient Irish, just as it has been 
and is the foundation of all later national effort. If ever the idea of a nationality becomes the subject of a thorough and honest study, it will be seen that among all the peoples of antiquity, not excluding the Hellenes and the Hebrews, the Irish held the clearest and most conscious and constant grasp of that idea, and that their political divisions, instead of disproving the existence of the idea, in their case intensely strengthened the proof of its existence and emphasized its power. In the same way, the remarkable absence of insular exclusiveness, notwithstanding their geographical position, serves to bring their sense of nationality into higher relief. Though pride of race is evident in the dominant Gaelic stock, their national sentiment centers not in the race but altogether in the country, which is constantly personified and made the object of a sort of cult. It is worth noting that just that the Brehan laws are the laws of Ireland without distinction of province or district, as the language of Irish literature is the language of Ireland without distinction of dialects, as the Dinschenkus contains the topographical legends of all parts of Ireland, and the festilities commemorate the saints of all Ireland, so the Irish chronicles, from first to last, are histories of the Irish nation. The true view of the Book of Invasions is that it is the epic of Irish nationality. Professor Owen McNeill in a letter to Mrs. A. S. Green, January 1914. The Book of Invasions, which Professor McNeill here speaks of, was compiled a thousand years ago. To write the history of later Ireland is merely to prolong the Book of Invasions, and thus bring the epic of Irish resistance down to our own day. All Irish valour and chivalry, whether of soul or of body, have been directed for a thousand years to this same end. It was for this that Sarsfield died at Landon, no less than Brian at Clontarf. The monarch of Ireland at the head of a great Irish army driving back the leagued invaders from the shores of Dublin Bay in 1014 and the exiled leader of 1693, heading the charge that routed King William's cause in the Netherlands, fell on one and the same battlefield. They fought against the invader of Ireland. We are proudly told the sun never sets on the British Empire. Wherever an Irishman has fought in the name of Ireland, it has not been to acquire fortune, land or fame, but to give all, even life itself, not to found an empire, but to strike a blow for an ancient land and assert the cause of a swordless people. Wherever Irishmen have gone, in exile or in fight, they have carried this image of Ireland with them. The cause of Ireland has found a hundred fields of foreign fame, where the dying Irishman might murmur with Sarsfield, would that this blood were shed for Ireland, and history records the sacrifices made in no other cause. Ireland, too, owns an empire in which the sun never sets. The Island of Saints and Scholars by Canon Dalton, M.R.I.A., L.L.D. Unlike the natives of Britain and Scotland, the Irish in pre-Christian times were not brought into contact with Roman institutions or Roman culture. In consequence, they created and developed a civilization of their own that was in some respects without equal. They were far advanced in the knowledge of metalwork and shipbuilding. They engaged in commerce, they loved music and had an acquaintance with letters, and when disputes arose among them, these were settled in duly constituted courts of justice, presided over by a trained lawyer called a brehon, instead of being settled by the stern arbitrament of force. Judaism was their pagan creed. They believed in the immortality and in the transmigration of souls. They worshipped the sun and the moon, and they venerated mountains, rivers, and wells. And it would be difficult to find any ministers of religion who were held in greater awe than the Druids. Commerce and war brought the Irish into contact with Britain and the continent, and thus was Christianity gradually introduced into the island. Though its progress at first was not rapid, there were, by 431, several Christian churches in existence, and in that year Palladius, a Briton and a bishop, was sent by Pope Celestine to the Irish who already believed in Christ. Discouraged and a failure, Palladius returned to Britain after a brief stay on his mission, and then in 432 the same Pope sent St. Patrick, who became the Apostle of Ireland. Because of the great work he did, St. Patrick is one of the prominent figures of history, and yet, to such an extent has the dust of time settled on his life and acts that the place and year of his birth, the schools in which he was educated, 
and the year of his death are all matters of dispute. There is, however, no good reason to depart from the traditional account, which is that the Apostle was born at Dumbarton in Scotland in the year 372, that in 388 he was captured by the Irish King Neil, who had gone on a plundering raid into Scotland, that he was brought to Ireland and sold as a slave, and that as such he served a pagan chief named Milko, who lived in what is now the county of Antrim, that from Antrim he escaped and went back to his own country, that he had many visions urging him to return to Ireland and preach the gospel there, that, believing these were from God, he went to France, and there was educated and ordained priest, and later consecrated bishop, and then, accompanied by several ecclesiastics, he was sent to Ireland. From Wicklow, where he landed, he proceeded north and endeavored, but in vain, to convert his old pagan master Milko. Thence he proceeded south by Downpatrick and Dundalk to Slane in Meath, where, in sight of Tara, the high king's seat, he lighted the paschal fire. At Tara he confounded the Druids in argument, baptized the high king and the chief poet, and then, turning north and west, he crossed the Shannon into Connacht, where he spent seven years, from Canachtipest into Donegal, and thence through Tyrone and Antrim, after which he entered Munster and remained there seven years. Finally he returned to Armagh, where he made his Episcopal see, and died at Saul near Downpatrick in 493. St. Patrick wrote two short works, both of which have survived, his Confession and his Epistle to Caroticus. In neither are there any graces of style, and the Latin is certainly not that of Cicero or Livy. But in the Confession, the character of the author himself is completely revealed, his piety, his zeal, his self-sacrifice, his courage in face of every danger and every trial. Not less remarkable was the skill with which he handled men and used pagan institutions for the purposes of Christianity, and equally so was the success with which his bloodless apostolate was crowned. One great difficulty which St. Patrick had was to provide the people with a native ministry. At first he selected the chief men, princes, brehons, bards, and these, with little training and little education, he ordained. Thus, slenderly equipped with knowledge, the priest with his ritual, missal, and a catechism, and the bishop with his crozier and bell, went forth to do battle for the Lord. This condition of things was soon ended. In 450, a college was founded at Armagh, which in a short time grew to be a famous school and attracted students from afar. Other schools were founded in the 5th century, at Nendrum, Louth, and Kildare. In the 6th century arose the famous monastic schools of Clonfort, Clonard, Clonmacnish, Arran, and Bangor, while the 7th century saw the rise of Glendalough and Lismore. St. Patrick was educated in Gaul, at the monasteries of Mamoutier and Lerang, and, perhaps as a result, the monastic character of the early Irish church was one of its outstanding features. Moreover, it was to the prevalence of the monastic spirit, the desire for solitude and meditation, that so many of the great monastic establishments owed their existence. Fleeing from society and its attractions, and wishing only for solitude and austerity, some holy man sought out a lonely retreat, and there lived a life of mortification and prayer. Others came to share his poverty and vigils. A grant of land was then obtained from the ruling chief. The holy man became abbot, and his followers his monks, and a religious community was formed destined soon to acquire fame. It was thus that St. Finian established Clonard on the banks of the Boyne, and St. Kieran Clonmacnish by the waters of the Shannon, and thus did St. Enda make the wind-swept Isles of Arran the home and the resting place of so many saints. Before the close of the 6th century, 3,000 monks followed the rule of St. Corngall at Bangor, and in the 7th century, St. Carthage made Lismore famous, and St. Kevin attracted pious men from afar to his lonely retreat in the picturesque valley of Glendalough. And there were holy women as well as holy men in Ireland. St. Bridget was held in such honor that she is often called the Mary of the Gael. Even in St. Patrick's Day, she had founded a convent at Kildare, beside which was a monastery of which St. Conleth was superior, and she founded many other convents in addition to that at Kildare. Her example was followed by St. Ida, St. Fanacha, and many others. And if at the close of the 6th century there were few districts which had not monasteries and monks, there were few also which had not convents and nuns. Nor was this all. 
Fired with missionary zeal, many men left Ireland to plant the faith in distant lands. Thus did St. Columkill settle in Iona, whence he converted the Picts. Under his successors, St. Aidan and his friends went south to Lindisfarne to convert Northumbria in England, and the ninth abbot of Iona was the saintly Edemnen, whose biography of St. Columkill has been declared by competent authority to be the best of its kind of which the whole Middle Ages can boast. Nor must it be forgotten that the monasteries of Luxel and Babio owed their origin to St. Columbanus, that St. Gaul gave his name to a town and canton in Switzerland, that St. Friedolin labored on the Rhine, and St. Fursey on the Marne, and that St. Cataldus was Bishop of Tarentum, and is still venerated as the patron of that Italian see. And if we would know what was the character of the schools in which these men were trained, we have only to remember that Colgu, who had been educated at Clonmacnish, was the master of Alquin, that de Cule, the geographer, came from the same school, that Cumian, abbot and bishop of Clonfert, combated the errors about the paschal computation with an extent of learning and a wealth of knowledge amazing in a monk of the 7th century, and that at the close of the 8th century two Irishmen went to the court of Charlemagne, and were described by a monk of St. Gaul as, quote, men incomparably skilled in human learning, unquote. The once pagan Ireland had by that time become a citadel of Christianity and was rightfully called the School of the West, the island of saints and scholars. With this state of progress and prosperity, the Danes played sad havoc. Animated with the fiercest pagan fanaticism, they turned with fury against Christianity and especially against monks and religious foundations. Erma, Clonmacnish, Bangor, Kildare, and many other great monastic establishments thus fell before their fury. Ignorance, neglect of religion, and corruption of manners followed, and from the 8th to the 12th century there was a noted falling off in the number of Irish scholars. At home, indeed, were Cormac and Melmera, O'Hartigan and O'Flynn, and abroad was John Scotus Erigena, whose learning was so great that it excited astonishment even at Rome. The love of learning and zeal for religion lived on through this long period of accumulated disasters. After the triumph of Brian Baru at Clontarf, there was a distinct revival of piety and learning, and, when a century of turmoil followed Brian's fall and religion again suffered, nothing was wanted to bring the people back to a sense of their duty but the energy and reforming zeal of St. Malachy. Gerald Barry, the notorious Anglo-Norman who visited Ireland towards the close of the 12th century, has been convicted out of his own mouth when he states that Ireland was a barbarous nation when his people came there. He forgot that a people who could illuminate the Book of Kells and build Cormac's chapel could not be called savages, nor could a church be lost to a sense of decency and dignity that numbered among its children such a man as St. Lawrence O'Toole. Abuses there were, it is true, consequent on long-continued war, though these abuses were increased rather than lessened by the coming of the Anglo-Normans, and to such an extent that for more than two centuries there is not a single great name among Irish scholars except Dun Scotus. The fame of Dun Scotus was European, and the subtle doctor, as he was called, became the great glory of the Franciscan, as his rival St. Thomas was the great glory of the Dominican order. But he left no successor, and from his death at the opening of the 14th century, till the 17th century, the number of Irish scholars or recognized Irish saints was small. Yet, in the midst of disorders within, and despite oppression from without, at no time did the love of learning disappear in Ireland, nor was there ever in the Irish church either heresy or schism. The attempted reformation by Henry VIII and his daughter Elizabeth produced martyrs like O'Hurley and O'Healy, and there were many more martyrs in the time of the Stuarts, and especially under the short but sanguinary rule of Cromwell. Those were the days of the penal laws, when they who clung to the old religion suffered much. But nothing could shake their faith, neither the proclamations of Elizabeth and James, the massacres of Cromwell, nor the ferocious prescriptions of the 18th century. The priest said Mass, though his crime was punishable by death, and the people heard Mass, though theirs also was a criminal offense, and the schoolmaster, driven from the school, taught under a sheltering hedge. The clerical student, denied education at home, crossed the sea, to be educated at Louvain or Salamanca or Sevilla, and then, perhaps loaded with academic honors, he returned home to face poverty and persecution and even death. 
The Catholic masses, socially ostracized, degraded, and impoverished, shut out from every avenue to ambition or enterprise, deprived of every civil right, knowing nothing of law except when it oppressed them, and nothing of government except when it struck them down, yet clung to the religion in which they were born. And when, in the latter half of the 18th century, the tide turned and the first dawn of toleration appeared on the horizon, it was found that the vast majority of the people were unchanged, and that, after two centuries of the most relentless persecution since the days of Diocletian, Ireland was, in faith and practice, a strongly Catholic nation still. On a soil constantly wet with the blood and tears of its children, it would be vain to expect that scholarship could flourish. And yet the period had its distinguished Irish scholars both at home and abroad. At Louvain in the 16th century were Lombard and Cray, who both became Archbishops of Armagh, and O'Hurley, who became Archbishop of Cashel. An even greater scholar than these was Luke Wadding, the eminent Franciscan who founded the convent of St. Isidore at Rome. At Louvain was John Colgan, a Franciscan like Wadding, a man who did much for Irish ecclesiastical history. And at home in Ireland, as parish priest of Tibrid in Tipperary, was the celebrated Dr. Geoffrey Keating, the historian, once a student at Salamanca. John Lynch, the renowned opponent of Gerald Barry, the Welshman, was Archdeacon of Tuam, and in the ruined Franciscan monastery of Donegal, the four masters, aided and encouraged by the friars, labored long and patiently, and finally completed the work which we all know as the Annals of the Four Masters. This work, originally written in Irish, remained in manuscript in Louvain till the middle of the 19th century, when it was edited and translated into English by John O'Donovan, one of Ireland's greatest Irish scholars, with an ability and completeness quite worthy of the original. On the Anglo-Irish side, there were also some great names, and especially in the domain of history, notably Stanhurst and Hammer, Morrison and Campion and Davies, and above all, Usher and Ware. James Ware died in 1666, and though a Protestant and an official of the Protestant government, and living in Ireland in an intolerant age and in an atmosphere charged with religious rancor, he was, to his credit be it said, to a large extent free from bigotry. He dealt with history and antiquities and wrote in no party spirit, wishing only to be fair and impartial, and to sit out the truth as he found it. James Usher, Archbishop of Erma was a much abler man and a much greater scholar than Ware. His capacity for research, his profound scholarship, the variety and extent of his learning raised him far above his co-religionists, and he has been rightly called the great luminary by the Irish Protestant Church. It is regrettable that his fine intellect was darkened by bigotry and intolerance. Far different was the character of another Protestant bishop, the great Barclay of Cloyne, a patriot, a philosopher, and a scholar, who afterwards left money and books for a scholarship which is still in existence at the then infant Yale College in New England. He lived in the first half of the 18th century, when the whole machinery of government was ruthlessly used to crush the Catholics. But Barclay had little sympathy with the penal laws. He had words of kindness for the Catholics, and undoubtedly wished them well. Nor must Swift be forgotten, for though he took little pride in being an Irishman, he hated and despised those who oppressed Ireland, and is rightly regarded as one of the greatest of her sons. The short period during which Grattan's Parliament existed was one of great prosperity. It was then that Maynooth College was established for the education of the Irish priesthood. But Catholics, though free to set up schools, were still shut out from the honors and emoluments of Trinity College, the one university at that time in Ireland. Still, Charles O'Connor, McGagan, and O'Flaherty were great Catholic scholars in the latter part of the 18th century. In the following century, while Protestant ascendancy was still maintained, the Catholics had greater scope. Away back in the days of Queen Elizabeth, Campion found Latin widely spoken among the peasantry, and Father Mooney met country lads familiar with Virgil and Homer. In 1670, Petty had a similar story to tell, in spite of all the savageries of Cromwell and the ruin which necessarily followed. And in the 18th century, the schoolmaster, though a price was set on his head, was still active. With an inherited love of learning, the Irish in the 19th century would have made rapid progress had they been rich. But their impoverishment by the penal laws made it impossible for them to set up an effective system of primary education. 
and until the national school system came into existence in 1831, they had to rely on the hedge schools. Secondary education fared better, for the bishops, relying with confidence on the generosity of their flocks, were soon able to establish diocesan colleges. And in higher education, equally determined efforts were made by the establishment of the Catholic University under Cardinal Newman. But in this field of intellectual effort, in spite of the energy and zeal of the bishops, in spite of the great generosity of the people, so many of whom were poor, and in spite of the fame of Newman, it is failure rather than success which the historian has to record. Nor has the love of the Irish for religion, any more than their love of learning, been lessened or enfeebled by time. The mountainside as the place for mass in the penal days gradually gave way to the rude stone church without steeple or bell. And when steeple and bell ceased to be proscribed, and the people were left free to erect suitable houses of sacrifice and prayer, the fine churches of the 19th century began gradually to appear. The unfettered exercise of freedom of religious worship, the untiring efforts of a zealous clergy and episcopate, the unstinted support of a people, who, out of their poverty, grudged nothing to God or to God's house, formed an irresistible combination, and all over the country beautiful churches are now to be found. In every diocese in Ireland, with scarcely an exception, there is now a stately cathedral to perpetuate the renown of the patron saint of that diocese, and even parish churches have been built not unworthy to be the churches of an ancient sea. At Erma, cathedral has been built which does honor to Irish architecture, and worthily commemorates the life and labors of St. Patrick, the founder of the primatial sea. At Turles, a cathedral stands, the chief church of the southern province, statelier far than any which ever stood on the rock of Cashel. At Tuam, a noble building associated with the memory of John McHale, the Lion of the Fold of Judah, perpetuates the name of St. Jarleth. At Queenstown, the traveler going to America or returning from it to the old land, has his attention attracted to the splendid cathedral pile sacred to St. Colman, the patron saint of the Diocese of Cloyne. And if we would see how splendid even a parish church may be, let us visit the beautiful church in Drahida, dedicated to the memory of Oliver Plunkett. Nor are these things the only evidence we have that zeal for religion among the Irish has survived centuries of persecution. Columbanus and Columkill still have their successors, eager and ready as they were to bring the blessings of the gospel to distant lands. In recent years, an Irish-born Archbishop of Sydney has been succeeded by an Irish-born Archbishop. An Irishman rules the Metropolitan See of Adelaide, and an Irish-born Archbishop of Melbourne has as his coadjutor a former president of the College of Maynooth. In South Africa, the work of preaching and teaching and ruling the church is largely the work of Irish-born men. In the Great Republic of the West, the three cardinal archbishops at the head of the Catholic Church have the distinctively Irish names of Gibbons and Farley and O'Connell and in every diocese throughout the United States the proportion of priests of Irish birth or descent is large. Nor must the poorer Irish be forgotten. How much does the Catholic Church, both in Ireland and in America, owe to the generosity of Irish-American laborers and servant girls? Out of their scanty and hard-earned pay they have contributed much, not only towards the building of the plain wooden church in the rural parishes, but also of the stately cathedrals of American cities and many a church in Old Ireland owes its completion and its adornment to the dollars given by the poor but generous Irish exiles. And if the zeal of the Irish for religion has thus survived to the 20th century, so also in an equally remarkable degree has their zeal for learning. We have evidence of this in the numerous primary schools in every parish, filled with eager pupils and presided over by hard-working teachers in the colleges where the sciences and the classics are studied with the same energy as in the ancient monastic schools, and in Maynooth College, which is the foremost ecclesiastical college in the world. And if there are now new universities, the National and the Queen's, sturdy and vigorous in their youth, this does not imply that Trinity College suffers from the decrepitude of age. For among those whom she sent forth in recent times are Dowden and Mahaffey and Lecky, to name but three and these would do credit to any university in Europe. It would be difficult to find in any age of Irish history a greater pulpit orator than the famous Dominican Father Tom Burke, or a more delightful essayist than Father Joseph Farrell, and who has depicted Irish clerical life more faithfully than the late Canon Sheehan, 
whose fame as a novelist has crossed continents and oceans. O'Connell was a great orator as well as a great political leader, and Dr. Doyle and Archbishop John McHale were scholars as well as statesmen and bishops. We have thus an unbroken chain of great names, a series of Irishmen whom the succeeding ages have brought forth to enlighten and instruct lesser men. And Ireland in the 20th century is not less attached to religion and learning than she was when Clone McNeish flourished and the saintly Carthage ruled at Lismore. Irish Monks in Europe by Reverend Columba Edmonds, OSB St. Patrick's work in Ireland was chiefly concerned with preaching the faith and establishing monasteries which served as centres of education. The great success that attended these efforts earned for Ireland the double title of Island of Saints and a second Tebaid. The monastic institutions organised by St. Patrick were characterised from their commencement by an apostolic zeal that knew no bounds. Sufficient scope was not to be found at home, so it was impatient to diffuse itself abroad. Scotland. Hence, in the year 563, St. Columcille, a Donegal native of royal descent, accompanied by twelve companions, crossed the sea in carracks of wickerwork and hides, and sought to land in Caledonia. They reached the desolate Isle of Iona on the day preceding Whitsunday. Many years before, colonies of Irishmen had settled along the western parts of the present Scotland. The settlement north of the Clyde received the name of the Kingdom of Dalriada. These Dalriadan Irish were Christian, at least in name, but their neighbours in the Pictish Highlands were still pagans. Columcille's apostolate was to be among both these people. Adamnan says that Columcille came to Caledonia for the love of Christ's name, and well did his afterlife prove the truth of this statement. He had attained his forty-fourth year when King Connell, his kinsman, bestowed Iona upon him and his brethren. The island, situated between the Dalriadans and the pits of the highlands, was conveniently placed for missionary work. A numerous community recruited from Ireland, with Columcille as its abbot, soon caused Iona to become a flourishing centre from which men could go forth to preach Christianity. Monasteries and hermitages rapidly sprang up in the adjacent islands and on the mainland. These, together with the Columban foundations in Ireland, formed one great religious federation in which the Celtic apostles of the northern races were formed under the influence of the Holy Founder. St. Columcille recognised the need of securing permanence for his work by obtaining the conversion of the Pictish rulers, and thus he did not hesitate to approach King Brood in his castle on the banks of the river Ness. St. Comgall and St. Canice were Columcille's companions on his journey through the Great Glen, now famous for the Caledonian Canal. The royal convert, Brood, was baptised, and by degrees the people followed the example set them. Opposition, however, was keen and aggressive, and it came from the official representatives of Pictish paganism, the Druids. Success, too, attended Column Seal's ministrations among the Dalriadans, and on the death of their king, Aidan Gabran, who succeeded to the throne, sought regal consecration from the hands of Columcille. In 597 the saint died, but not before he had won a whole kingdom to Christ and covered the land with churches and monasteries. Today his name is held in honour not by Irishmen alone, but by the Catholics and non-Catholics of the land of his adoption. There are other saints who either laboured in person with Columcille or perpetrated the work he accomplished in Caledonia, and their names add to the glory of Ireland, their birthland. Thus, St. Molwag, 592, converted the people of Lismore, and afterwards died at Rosemarkey. St. Druston, St. Columcille's friend and disciple, established the faith in Aberdeenshire, 
and became abbot of Deer. Saint Kieran, 548, evangelized Kintyre. Saint Mun, 635, labored in Argyleshire. Saint Buet, 521, did the same in Pictland. Saint Mal Ruba, 722, preached in Rosshire. Saint Modan and Saint Macar benefited the dwellers on the western and eastern coasts, respectively, and St. Fergus, in the 8th century, became apostle to Forfa, Buchan, and Caithness. Distant Islands But Irish monks were mariners as well as apostles. Their hide-covered currachs were often launched in the hope of discovering solitudes in the ocean. Adamnan records that Baitan set out with others in search of a desert in the sea. St. Cormac sought a similar retreat and arrived at the Orkneys. St. Molaise's Holy Isle guards Lamlash Bay off Arran. The island retreats of the Bass, Inchkeith, May and Inchcombe in the Firth of Forth are associated with the Irish saints Baldred, Adamnan, Adrian and Columcille. St. Macaldus, a native of Down, became Bishop of the Isle of Man. Remarkable, too, is the fact that Irish monks sailed by way of the Faroe Islands to distant Iceland. These sailor clerics who settled on the southeast of the island were spoken of by later Norwegians as Papa. After their departure, they were probably driven away by Norwegian pagans, these Icelandic apostles left behind them Irish books, bells and croziers, wherefrom one could understand they were Irishmen. But St. Brendan, the voyager, is the most wonderful of the mariner monks of Ireland. He accomplished apostolic work in both Wales and Scotland, but his seafaring instincts urged him to make missionary voyages to regions hitherto unknown. Some writers, not without reason, have actually maintained that he and his followers travelled as far as the American shore. Be this as it may, the tradition of the discoveries of this Irish monk kept in mind the possibly existing western land, and issued at last in the discovery of the great continent of America by Columbus. Northumbria Turn now to Northumbria. Adamnan writes that St. Columcille's name was honoured not only in Gaul, Spain and Italy, but in Rome itself. England, however, owes to it a special veneration because of the widespread apostolic work accomplished within her borders by Columcille's Irish disciples. The facts are as follows. Northumbrian Christianity was well nigh exterminated through the victory of Penda the Pagan, over Edwin the Christian, A.D. 633. St. Paulinus, its local Roman apostle, was driven permanently from his newly founded churches. Meanwhile, Oswald and his brother Edwith sought refuge among the Irish monks of Iona and received baptism at their hands. Edwith died and Oswald became heir to the throne. A battle was fought. The day before he met the pagan army between the Tyne and the Solway, Oswald beheld St. Columcille in vision, saying to him, Be strong and of good faith, I will be with thee. The result of this vision of the abbot of Iona was that a considerable part of England received the true faith. Oswald was victorious. He united the kingdoms of Dyra and Bernicia and became overlord of practically all England, with the exception of Kent. There was an evangelization to be done, and St. Oswald turned to Iona. In response to his appeal, the Irish bishop, St. Aidan, was sent with several companions. They were established on the island of Lindisfarne, in sight of the royal residence at Bambra. These monks laboured in union with, and even seemed to exceed in zeal, the Roman missionaries in the south under St. Augustine. However great the enthusiasm they had displayed for conversions in Iona, they displayed still greater on the desolate island of Lindisfarne. In the first instance, St. Aidan and his monks evangelised Northumbria. Want of facility in preaching in the Anglo-Saxon tongue 
was at first an obstacle, but it was speedily overcome, for King Oswald himself, who knew both Gaelic and English, came forward and acted as interpreter. When St. Aidan died in 651, Iona sent St. Finnan, another Irish bishop, to succeed him. Finnan spread the faith beyond the borders of Northumbria and succeeded so well that he himself baptized Penda, king of the Mid-Angles, and Sigebert, king of the East Saxons. Dioma and Kellac, Irish monks, assisted by three Anglo-Saxon disciples of St. Aidan, consolidated the mission to the Mercians. Anglia While Christianity was thus being restored in Northumbria, other Irish apostles were teaching it in East Anglia. St. Fursey, accompanied by his brother St. Voilin and St. Alton, and the priests Gobham and Dickwill, landed in England in 633 and began to labour in the eastern portions of Anglia. In his monastery at Bergcastle in Suffolk, the convert King Sigebert made his monastic profession, and in the same house many heavenly visions were vouchsafed to its founder. The South Saxons had in Dickwill an apostle who founded the monastery of Bosham in Sussex, whence originated the Episcopal See of Chichester. Another Irish monk named Maeldub settled among the West Saxons and became the founder of Malmesbury Abbey and the instructor of the well-known St. Aldham. Thus did Irish monks contribute to the conversion of, of Great Britain and its many distant islands. They built up the faith by their holy lives, their preaching and their enthusiasm, and wisely provided for its perpetuation by educating a native clergy and by the founding of monastic institutions. They were not yet satisfied, so they turned towards other lands to bring to other peoples the glad tidings of salvation. Gaul in 590, St. Columbanus, a monk of Bangor in Ireland, accompanied by twelve brethren, arrived in France, having passed through Britain. After the example of St. Columcille in Caledonia, they travelled to the court of Gontram, king of Burgundy, in order to secure his help and protection. During the course of the journey they preached to the people, and all were impressed with their modesty, patience and devotion. At that epoch, Gaul was sadly in need of such missionaries, for, owing partly to the invasion of barbarians and partly to remissness on the part of the clergy, vice and impiety everywhere prevailed. Columbanus, because of his zeal, sanctity and learning, was well fitted for the task that lay before him. One of his early works in Burgundy was the founding of the monastery of Luxeuil, which became the parent of many other monasteries founded either by himself or by his disciples. Many holy men came from Ireland to join the community, and so numerous did the monks of Luxeuil become that separate choirs were formed to keep up perpetual praise, the Laus Perennis. But Columbanus did not remain at Luxeuil. In his strict, uncompromising preaching he spared not even kings, and he preferred to leave his flourishing monastery rather than pass over in silence the vices of the Merovingians. He escaped from the malice of Brunehol, and being banished from Burgundy, made his way to Neustria, and thence to Metz. Full of zeal, he resolved to preach the faith to the pagans along the Rhine, and with this purpose set out with a few of his followers. They proceeded as far as the Lake of Zurich, and finally established themselves at Bregenz, on the Lake of Constance. By this time his disciple, St. Gaul, had learned the Alemannian dialect, which enabled him to push forward the work of evangelization. But Columbanus felt that he was called to labour in other lands while vigour remained to him. So, bidding his favourite follower farewell, he crossed the Alps and arrived at Milan in northern Italy. King Agilulf and his queen, Theodolinda, gave the Irish abbot a reverent and kind welcome. His zeal was still unspent, and he worked much for the conversion of the Lombard Arians. Here he founded, between Milan and Genoa, the monastery of Bobbio, 
which, as a centre of knowledge and piety, was long the light of northern Italy. In this monastery he died in the year 615, but not before the arrival of messengers from King Clothair, inviting him to return to Luxeuil, as his enemies were now no more. But he could not go. All he asked was protection for his dear monks at Luxeuil. It has been said, most truly, that Ireland never sent a greater son to do God's work in foreign lands than Columbanus. The fruit of his labours remained, and for centuries after his death, his influence was widely felt throughout Europe, especially in France and Italy. His zeal for the interests of God was unbounded, and this was the secret of his immense power. Some of his writings have come down to us and comprise his rule for monks, his penitential, sixteen short sermons, six letters, and several poems, all in Latin. His letters are of much value as evidence of Ireland's ancient belief in papal supremacy. Switzerland Gaul, Columbanus's disciple, remained in Switzerland. In a fertile valley lying between two rivers and surrounded by hills, he laid the beginning of the great abbey which afterwards bore his name and became one of the most famous monasteries in Christendom. St. Gaul spent thirty years of his life in Helvetia, occupying himself in teaching, preaching, and prayer. He succeeded where others had failed, and that which was denied to Columbanus was reserved for Gaul, his disciple, and the latter is entitled the Apostle of Alemania. Other districts had their Irish missionaries and apostles. Not far from St. Gaul, at Seckingen, near Basel, St. Fridolin was a pioneer in the work of evangelization. Towards the close of the 7th century, St. Killian, an Irishman, with his companions, Tottenham and Coleman, arrived in Franconia. He was martyred at Würzburg, where he is honoured as patron and apostle. Sigisbert, another Irish follower of St. Columbanus, spread the faith among the half-pagan people of eastern Helvetia and founded the monastery of Dissentis in Raetia. St. Ursan, a little town on the boundaries of Switzerland, took his origin from another disciple of St. Columbanus. Other Apostles and Founders Desire for solitary life drew St. Fiaca to a hermitage near Mo, where he transformed wooded glades into gardens to provide vegetables for poor people. This charity has earned for Fiaca the title of patron saint of gardeners. St. Fersi, the illustrious apostle of East Anglia, crossed over to France, where he travelled and preached continuously. He built a monastery at lagny sur marne and was about to return to East Anglia when he died at Mezerol, near Doulon. St. Gobham followed his master's example, and like him evangelised and founded monasteries. St. Eto, Zé, acted in like manner. St. Foylan and St. Alton, brothers of St. Fersi, became apostles in southern Brabant. The monastery of Onau, on an island near Strasbourg, and that of Altomunster in Bavaria, owe their foundation to the Irish monks Tuban and Alto, respectively. Not far from Luxeuil was the Abbey of Lure, another great Irish foundation, due to Dei Collis, Dale de Chouil, a brother of St. Gaul and a disciple of St. Columbanus, so important was this house considered in later times that its abbot was numbered among the princes of the Holy Roman Empire. Rouen, in Normandy, felt the influence of the Irish monks through the instrumentality of saint Ouen, and the monasteries of Jouard, Roubaix, Jumiège, Le Canal, and saint Vendril were due at least indirectly to Columbanus or his disciples. Turning to Belgium, it is recorded that St. Romold preached the faith in Mechlin, and St. Livinus in Ghent. Both came from Ireland. St. Vergilius, a voluntary exile from Erin, for the love of Christ, established his monastery at Salzburg in Austria. He became bishop there and died in 781. Moreover, the Celtic rule of Columbanus was carried into Picardy by St. Valery, St. Omer, 
St. Bertin, St. Mummelin, and St. Valdelanus, but the Irish Cadoc and Frico had already preceded them, their work resulting in the foundation of the Abbey of St. Riquier. Italy. Something yet remains to be said of the monks of Ireland in Italy. Anterior to St. Columbanus's migration, his fellow countryman, St. Frigidian, or Fridian, had taken up his abode in Italy at Monte Pisana, not far from the city of Lucca, where he became famed for sanctity and wisdom. On the death of the Bishop of Lucca, Frigidian was compelled to occupy the vacant see. St. Gregory the Great wrote of him that he was a man of rare virtue. His teachings and holy life not only influenced the lives of his own flock, but brought to the faith many heretics and pagans. In Luca, this Celtic apostle is still honoured under the name of St. Frediano. St. Pellegrinus is another Irish saint who sought solitude at Garfanana in the Apennines, and Cathaldus, a Waterford saint, in 680, became Bishop of Taranto, which he governed for many years with zeal and great wisdom. His co-worker was Donatus, his brother, who founded the church at Lecce in the kingdom of Naples. Of the two learned Irishmen, Clemens and Albinus, who resided in France in the 8th century, Albinus was sent into Italy, where at Pavia he was placed at the head of the school attached to St. Augustine's monastery. Dungal, his compatriot, was a famous teacher in the same city. Lothair thus ordained concerning him, We desire that at Pavia and under the superintendence of Dungal, all students should assemble from Milan, Brescia, Lodi, Bergamo, Novara, Vercelli, Tortona, Acqui, Genoa, Asti, Como. It was this same Dungal who presented the Bango Psalter to Bobbio. Therefore it may be reasonably conjectured that he came from the very monastery that produced Columbanus, Gaul, and Comgaul. Faisal in Tuscany venerates two Irish 8th century saints, Donatus and Andrew. The former was educated at Iniscaltra, and Andrew was his friend and disciple. After visiting Rome, they lingered at Faisal, Donatus was received with great honour by clergy and people, and was requested to fill their vacant bishopric. With much hesitation he took upon himself the burden which he bore for many years. His biographer says of him that he was liberal in almsgiving, sedulous in watching, devout in prayer, excellent in doctrine, ready in speech, holy in life. Andrew, who was his deacon, founded the church and monastery of St. Martin in Mensola and is known in Faisal as St. Andrew of Ireland or St. Andrew the Scot, that is, the Irishman. Hospitalia Thus Irish monks were to be found in France, Belgium, Switzerland, Germany and Italy and even in Bulgaria. So numerous were they and so frequent their travels through the different countries of Europe that hospices were founded to befriend them. These institutions were known as Hospitalia Scotorum, hospices for the Irish, and their benefactors were not only pious laymen, but the highest ecclesiastical authorities. Sometimes the hospices were diverted to purposes other than those originally intended, and then church councils would intervene in favour of the lawful inheritors. Thus, in 845, we read that the Council of Meaux ordered the hospices of France to be restored to the dispossessed Irishmen. In the 12th century, Ireland still continued to send forth a constant succession of monk pilgrims, renowned for faith, austerity and piety. Ratisbon. Special monasteries were erected to be peopled by the Irish. The most renowned of these dates from 1067, when Marianus Scotus, Marianus the Irishman, with his companions John and Candidus, left his native land and arrived in Bavaria. These holy men were welcomed at Ratisbon by the Bishop Otto, and on the advice of Merturat, an Irish recluse, took up their residence near St. Peter's Church at the outskirts of the city. 
Novices flocked from Ireland to join them, and a monastery was erected to receive the community. In a short time, this had to be replaced by a still larger one, which was known to future ages as the Abbey of St. James's of the Scots, that is, Irish, at Ratisbon. How prolific was this parent foundation is evidenced from its many offshoots, the only surviving monasteries on the continent for many centuries intended for Irish brethren. These, besides St. James's at Erfurt and St. Peter's at Ratisbon, comprised St. James's at Würzburg, St. Giles's at Nuremberg, St. Mary's at Vienna, St. James's at Constance, St. Nicholas's at Memmingen, Holy Cross at Eichstadt, a priory at Kelheim, and another at Oils in Silesia, all of which were founded during the 12th or 13th century, and formed a Benedictine congregation approved of by Pope Innocent III, and presided over by the abbot of Ratisbon. These Irish houses, with their long lines of Celtic abbots, in the days of their prosperity did much work that was excellent and civilizing, and rightly deserve a remembrance in the achievements of Ireland's ancient missionaries. Ratisbon and its dependent abbeys, as is set forth in the papal briefs of 1218, possessed priories in Ireland, and from these novices were usually obtained. But evil days came for the congregation of St. James, and now it is extinct. The subjugation of Ireland to England, says Wattenbach, contributed no doubt to the rapid decline of the Stotic, that is Irish, monasteries. For from Ireland they had up till then been continually receiving fresh supplies of strength, in this their fatherland, the root of their vitality was to be found. Loss of independence involved loss of enterprise. Scholarship and influence. Irish monks were not only apostles of souls, but also masters of intellectual life. Thus, in the 7th century, the Celtic monastery of Luxor became the most celebrated school in Christendom. Monks from other houses and sons of the nobility crowded to it. The latter were clearly not intended for the cloister, but destined for callings in the world. There were outstanding men among these missionaries from Ireland. St. Virgilius of Salzburg in the 8th century taught the sphericity of the earth and the existence of the Antipodes. It was the same teaching that Copernicus and later astronomers formulated into the system now in vogue. St. Columcille himself was a composer of Latin hymns and a penman of no mean order, as the Book of Kells, if written by him, sufficiently proves. In all the monasteries which he founded, provision was made for the pursuit of sacred learning and the multiplication of books by transcription. The students of his schools were taught classics, mechanical arts, law, history and physics. They improved the methods of husbandry and gardening, supplied the people whom they helped to civilize with implements of labor, and taught them the use of the forge, an accomplishment belonging to almost every Irish monk. The writings of Adamnan, who spent most of his life outside his native land, show that he was familiar with the best Latin authors and had a knowledge of Greek as well. His Vita es Columbi, Life of St. Columcille, has made his name immortal as a Latin writer. His book, De Locis Sanctis, On the Holy Places, contains information he received from the pilgrim bishop Arculfus, who had been driven by a tempest to take refuge with the monks of Iona. On account of the importance of the writings of Adamnan, and because of his influence in secular and ecclesiastical affairs of importance, Few will question his right to a distinguished place among the saintly scholars of the West. Irish monks, abroad as well as at home, were pre-eminently students and exponents of Holy Scripture. Sedulius wrote a commentary on the Epistles of St. Paul. John Scotus Eregena composed a work De Predestinatione concerning predestination. Dungall was not only an astronomer, but also an excellent theologian, as is clear from his defence of Catholic teaching 
on the invocation of saints and the veneration of their relics. His knowledge of sacred scripture and of the fathers is exceedingly remarkable. Saint Columbanus, besides other works, is said to have composed an exposition of the Psalms, which is mentioned in the catalogue of St. Gaul's library, but which cannot now be identified with certainty. The writings of this abbot are said to have brought about a more frequent use of confession, both in the world and in monasteries, and his legislation regarding the Blessed Sacrament fostered Eucharistic devotion. Marianus Scotus is the author of a commentary on the Psalms, so precious that rarely was it allowed to pass beyond the walls of the monastic library. His commentary on St. Paul's epistles is regarded as his most famous production. Herein he shows acquaintance with Saints Jerome, Augustine, Gregory and Leo, with Cassiodorus, Oregon, Alcuin, Cassian and Peter the Deacon. He completed the work on the 17th of May, 1079, and ends the volume by asking the reader to pray for the salvation of his soul. Transcription. In all the monasteries, a vast number of scribes were continually employed in multiplying copies of the sacred scriptures. These masterpieces of calligraphy, written by Irish hands, have been scattered throughout the libraries of Europe, and many fragments remain to the present day. The beauty of these manuscripts is praised by all, and the names of the best transcribers often find mention in monastic annals. The work was irksome, but it was looked upon as a privilege and meritorious. It remains to speak of that glorious monument of the Irish monks, the Abbey of St. Gaul in Switzerland. It was here that Celtic influence was most felt and endured the longest. Within its walls for centuries, the sacred sciences were taught and classic authors studied. Many of its monks excelled as musicians and poets, while others were noted for their skill in calligraphy and the fine arts. The library was only in its infancy in the 8th century, but gradually it grew and eventually became one of the largest and richest in the world. The brethren were in correspondence with all the learned houses of France and Italy, and there was constant mutual interchange of books, sacred and scientific, between them. They manufactured their own parchment from the hides of the wild beasts that roamed in the forests around them, and bound their books in boards of wood clamped with iron or ivory. Such was the monastery of St. Gaul, which owes its inception to the journey through Europe of the great Columbanus and his monk companions, men whose lives, according to Bede, procured for the religious habit great veneration, so that wherever they appeared they were received with joy as God's own servants. And what will be the reward, asked the biographer of Marianus Scotus, of these pilgrim monks, who left the sweet soil of their native land, its mountains and hills, its valleys and its groves, its rivers and pure fountains, and went like the children of Abraham without hesitation into the land which God had pointed out to them. He answers thus, They will dwell in the house of the Lord with the angels and archangels of God for ever. They will behold the God of gods in Sion, to whom be honour and glory for ever and ever. The Irish and the Sea by William H. Babcock LLB. The beginning of Irish navigation, like the beginning of everything else, is hidden in the mist of antiquity. Vessels of some kind, obviously, must have borne the successive waves of immigrants or invaders to the island. Naturally, they would remain in use afterwards for trade, travel, exploration, and war. Irish ships may have been among those of the Breton fleet that Caesar dispersed at Van after an obstinate struggle. Two or three centuries later we find Njal of the nine hostages making nautical descents on the neighboring shores, especially Britain, and there is every probability that ships of the island conveyed some at least of the Scots, Irish, whom Gildas in the sixth century describes as joining the Picts and furiously storming the Roman wall. The, the equally adventurous but more pacific work of exploration went on also 
if we may judge by that extraordinary series of Irish sea sagas, the Imirama, comprising the voyages of Bran, Meldwin, the Ui Cora, and St. Brendan, the last mentioned deservedly the most famous. These vary in their literary merits and in the merits of their several parts, for they have been successfully rewritten at different periods, receiving always something of the color, belief, and adornment which belong to the writer's time. But under all may be dimly traced, as in a palimpsest, the remote pagan original. At their best they embody a lofty and touching poetry, very subtle and significant, as when we read of Brand's summoning by a visitant of supernatural beauty to the Isles of Undying Delight, where a thousand years are but as a day. His return with a companion, who had been overcome by longing for Ireland and home. The man's falling to ashes at the first touch of the native soil, as though he had been long dead, and the flight of Bran and his crew from the real living world to the islands of the blessed. At least equally fine and stirring is St. Brendan's interview with the exiled spirit of heaven, whose sin was but little, so that he and his fellows were given only the pleasing penance of singing delightfully in the guise of beautiful birds, the praises of the God who showed them mercy and grace amid the charms of an earthly paradise. Then all the birds sang evensong, so that it was an heavenly noise to hear. It is not very surprising that St. Brendan's legend, with such qualities in prose and verse, made itself at home in many lands and languages, and became for centuries a widespread popular favorite and matter of general belief, also influencing the most permanent literature of a high contemplative caste, which we may suppose to be out of touch with it altogether. Certain of its more unusual incidents are found even in Arab writings of romance founded on fact, as in Edrisi's narrative of the Magrurin explorers of Lisbon and the adventures of Sinbad related in the Arabian Nights. But perhaps here we have a case of reciprocal borrowing, such as may well occur when ships' companies of different nations meet. The most conspicuous, insistent, and repeated feature of all these Imrama is a belief in Atlantic islands fair enough or wonderful enough to tempt the shore-dwellers of Ireland far away and hold them spellbound for years. It is easy to ascribe these pictures to sunset on the ocean or the wonders of mirage, but all the time, within long sailing distance, there actually were islands of delightful climate and exceeding beauty. These had been occasionally reached from the Mediterranean ever since early Carthaginian times as classical authors seem to tell us. Why not also from Ireland, perhaps not quite so distant? It is undoubted that the Canary Islands were never really altogether forgotten, and the same is probably true of the Madeiras and all three groups of Azores, though the knowledge that lingered in Ireland was a distorted, glimmering tradition of old voyages, occasionally inciting to new ventures in the same field. Some have supposed, though without sufficient evidence, that St. Brendan even made his way to America, and parts of that shoreline in several different latitudes have been selected as the scene of the exploit. His first entry into serious geography is in the fine maps of Dulcer, 1339, and the Pizzigani, 1367, both of which plainly label Madeira, Porto Santo, and Las Desertas, the fortunate islands of St. Brandon. That there may be no possibility of misunderstanding, the Pisagani brothers present a full-length portrait of the holy navigator himself bending over these islands with hands of benediction. The inscription, though not the picture, was common, thus applied, on the maps of the next century or two and no other interpretation of his voyage found any place 
until a later time. Of course, the 14th century was a long way from the 6th, when the voyage was supposed to have been made, and we cannot take so late a verdict as convincing proof of any fact, but it at least exhibits the current interpretation of the written narrative among geographers and mariners, the people best able to judge. And here the interval was much less. The story itself seems to corroborate them in a general way, if read naturally. One would say that it tells of a voyage to the Canaries, of which one is unmistakably the island under Mount Atlas, and that this was undertaken by way of the Azores and Madeira, with inevitable experience of great beauty in some islands and volcanic terrors in others. Madeira may well have been pitched upon by the interpreters as the suitable scene of a particularly long tarrying by the way. Of course, magic filled out all gaps of real knowledge, and wonders grew with each new rewriting. Whatever Brendan did, there is no doubt that Irish mariner monks, incited by the great awakening which followed St. Patrick's mission, covered many seas in their frail vessels during the next three or four centuries. They set up a flourishing religious establishment in Orkney, made stepping stones of the intervening islands, and reached Iceland sometime in the eighth century, if not earlier. The Norsemen, following in their tracks as always, found them there, and the earliest Icelandic writings record their departure, leaving behind them books, bells, and other souvenirs on an islet offshore which still bears their name. Did they keep before the Norsemen to America too? At least the Norsemen thought so. For centuries the name Great Ireland or White Men's Land was accepted in Norse geography as meaning a region far west of Ireland, a parallel to Great Sweden, Russia, which lay far east of Sweden. The saga of Karlsefni, first to attempt colonizing America, makes it plain that his followers believed Great Ireland to be somewhere in that region, and it is explicitly located near Wineland by the 12th century Lanlamaba. Also, there were specific tales afloat of a distinguished Icelander lost at sea, who was afterward found in a western region by an Irish vessel long driven before the storm. The version most relied on came through one Ruffin, who had dwelt in Limerick, also through Thorfinn, Earl of the Orkneys. Brazil, the old Irish Brazil, was another name for land west of Ireland, where there is none short of America. On very many medieval maps, of which perhaps a dozen are older than the year 1400, the earliest yet found being that of Delorto. 1325. Usually, it appears as a nearly circular disk of land opposite Munster, at first altogether too near the Irish coast, as indeed the perfectly well-known Corvo was drawn much too near the coast of Spain, or as even in the 16th century, when Newfoundland had been repeatedly visited, that island was shifted by diverse mapmakers eastward towards Ireland, almost to the conventional station of Brazil. Also, not long afterwards, the maps of Nicolay and Saltieri adopted the reverse treatment of transferring Brazil to Newfoundland waters, as if recognizing past error and restoring its proper place. The name Brazil appears not to have been adopted by the Norsemen, but there is one 15th century map, perhaps at 1480 preserved in Milan, which shows this large disc form, Brazil, just below Greenland, Ile Verde, in such relation that the mapmaker really must have known of Labrador under the former name and believed that it could be readily reached from that Norse colony. It seems altogether likely that Brazil was applied to the entire outjutting region of America surrounding the Gulf of St. Lawrence that part of this continent which is by far the nearest Ireland. Besides the facts above stated, certain coincidences of real geography and of these old maps favor that belief, 
and they are quite unlikely to have been guessed or invented. Thus, certain maps, beginning with 1375, while keeping the circular external outline of Ireland, reduce the land area to a mere ring, enclosing an expanse of water dotted with islands, and certain other maps show it still nearly circular externally and solid, but divided into two parts by a curved channel nearly from north to south. The former exposition is possible enough to one more concerned with the nearly enclosed Gulf of St. Lawrence and its islands than with its two comparatively narrow outlets. The second was afterward repeated approximately by Gastoldi's map, illustrating Ramuzio, when he was somehow moved to minimize the width of the gulf, though well remembering the straits of Belle Isle and Cabot. There are some other coincidences, but it is unnecessary to dwell on them. Land west of Ireland must be either pure fancy or the very region in question, and it is hardly believable that fancy could guess so accurately as to two different interpretations of real, though unusual, geography and give them right latitude, which, with such an old Irish name, Brazil, as might naturally have been conferred in the early voyaging times. That an extensive region, chiefly mainland, should be represented as an island is no objection, as anyone will see by examining the maps which break up everything north of South America in the years next following the achievements of Columbus and Cabot. There was a natural tendency to expect nothing but islands short of Asia. It seems likely, therefore, that America was actually reached by the Irish even before the Norsemen, and certainly long before all other Europeans. Irish Love of Learning by Rev. P. S. Deneen, M. A. R. U. I. The distinguishing property of man, says Cicero, is to search for and follow after truth. Therefore, when disengaged from our necessary cares and concerns, we desire to see, to hear, and to learn, and we esteem knowledge of things obscure or wonderful as indispensable to our happiness. De Officius 1.4 I claim for the Irish race that throughout their history they have cut down their bodily necessities to the quick in order to devote time and energy to the pursuit of knowledge, that they have engaged in intellectual pursuits, not infrequently of a high order, on a low basis of material comfort that they have persevered in the quest of learning under unparalleled hardships and difficulties even in the dark night of a nation's eclipse when a school was an unlawful assembly and school teaching a crime I claim, moreover, that, when circumstances were favorable, no people have shown a more adventurous spirit or a more chivalrous devotion in the advancement and spread of learning. Love of learning implies more than a natural aptitude for acquiring information. It connotes a zest for knowledge that is recondite and attainable only at the expense of ease, of leisure, of the comforts and luxuries of life, and a zeal for the cultivation of the mental faculties. It is of the soul and not of the body. It refines, elevates, adorns. It is allied to sensibility, to keenness of vision, to the close observation of mental phenomena. Its possessor becomes a citizen of the known world. His mind broadens. He compares, contrasts, conciliates. He brings together the new and the old, the near and the distant, the permanent and the transitory, and weaves from them all the web of systematized human thought. 
I am not here concerned with the extent of Ireland's contribution to the sum of human learning, nor with the career of her greatest scholars. I am merely describing the love of learning which is characteristic of the race, and which it seems best to present in a brief study of distinct types drawn from various periods of Irish history. In the pre-Christian period, the Druid was the chief representative of the learning of the race. He was the adviser of kings and princes, and the instructor of their children. His knowledge was of the recondite order and beyond the reach of ordinary persons. The esteem in which he was held by all classes of the people proves their love for the learning for which he stood. Patrick came, and with him came a wider horizon of learning and greater facilities for the acquisition and diffusion of knowledge. Monastic schools sprang up in all directions, at Clonard, Armagh, Clonmanoy, Bangor, Lismore, Kildare, Innisfallen. These schools were celebrated throughout Europe in the earlier Middle Ages, and from the fifth to the ninth century, Ireland led the nations of Europe in learning and deserved the title of the Island of Saints and Scholars. Our type is the student in one of these monastic schools. He goes out from his parents and settles down to study in the environs of the monastery. He is not rich. He resides in a hut. His time is divided between study, prayer, and manual labor. He becomes a monk, only to increase in devotion to learning and to accentuate his privations. He copies and illuminates manuscripts. He memorizes the psalms. He glosses the Vulgate scriptures with vernacular notes. He receives ordination. And, realizing that there are benighted countries ten times as large as his native land beyond the seas, and, burning with zeal for the spread of the gospel and the advancement of learning, sails for Britain, or passes into Gaul, or reaches the slopes of the Apennines, or the outskirts of the Black Forest. The rest of his life is devoted to the foundation of monasteries, to which schools are attached, to the building of churches, and to the diffusion around him of every known branch of knowledge. He may have taken books from Ireland overseas, and of these, relics are now to be found among the treasures of the ancient libraries of Europe. Columcill, Columbanus, Adamnan, Gaul, Virgilius occur to the mind in dwelling on this type. The hereditary Sean Chade, who treasured up the traditional lore of the clan and its chief, was held in high honor and enjoyed extraordinary privileges. He held a freehold. He was high in the graces of the chief, and officiated at his inauguration. An important type is the Irish ecclesiastical student abroad in the penal days. School teaching, unless at the sacrifice of faith, was a crime in Ireland, and the training required for the priesthood had to be obtained on the continent. The Irish, out of their poverty, established colleges in Rome, 1628, Salamanca, 1593, Seville, 1612, Alcala, 1590, Lisbon, 1593, Louvain, 1634, Antwerp, 1629, Douai, 1577, Lille, 1610, Bordeaux, 1603, Toulouse, 1659, Paris, 1605, and elsewhere. As late as 1795, these colleges contained 478 students, and some of them are still in existence. The young student in going abroad risked everything. He often returned watched by spies, with his life in danger. Yet the supply never failed, the colleges flourished, and those who returned diffused around them not only learning, but the urbanity and refinement which were a striking fruit and mark 
of their studies abroad. Another type is the Irish scribe, in the days of Ireland's fame and prosperity, and of the flood tide of her native language, he was a skilled craftsman, and the extant specimens of his work are unsurpassed of their kind, but I prefer to look at him at a later period, when he became our sole substitute for the printer, and when his diligence preserved for us all that remains of a fading literature. He was miserably poor. He toiled through the day at the spade or the plough, or guided the shuttle through the loom. At night, by the flare of the turf fire, or the fitful light of a splinter of bogwood, he made his copy of poem or tract or tale, which but for him would have perished. The copies are often ill-spelt and ill-written, but with all their faults, they are as noble a monument to national love of learning as any nation can boast of. In our gallery of types, we must not forget the character whom English writers contemptuously call the hedge schoolmaster. The hedge school, in its most elemental state, was an open-air daily assemblage of youths in pursuit of knowledge. Inasmuch as the law had refused learning a fitting temple in which to abide and be honoured, she was led by her votaries into the open, and there, beside the fragrant hedge, if you will, with the green sward for benches and the canopy of heaven for dome, she was honoured in Ireland, even as she had been honoured ages before in Greece, in Palestine, and by our primordial Celtic ancestors themselves. The hedge schoolmaster conducted the rites, and the air resounded with the sonorous hexameters of Virgil and the musical odes of Horace. In the Irish-speaking portions of the country, the hedge schoolmaster was often also a poet, who wrote mellifluous songs in Irish, which were sung throughout the entire district, and sometimes earned him enduring fame. Uwen Rud O'Sullivan and Andrew McGrath, called An Mangar Sugak, or The Jolly Peddler, are well-known instances of this type. The Poor Scholar is another type, that under varying forms and under various circumstances has ever trod the stage of Irish history, from an ancient Irish manuscript, C. O'Curry, Manners and Customs, 2, 79 and 80. We learn that Adamnan, the biographer of St. Columcill, and some other youth studied at Clonard, and were supported by the neighborhood. The poor scholar, more than any other type, embodies the love of learning of the Irish race. In the schools which preceded the national, he appeared in a most interesting stage of development. He came from a distance, attracted by the reputation of a good teacher and the regularity of a well-conducted school. He came avowedly poor, his only claim on the generosity of his teacher and of the public was a marked aptitude for learning and an ardent desire for study and cultivation of mind. He did not look for luxuries. He was satisfied if his bodily wants were reasonably supplied, even with the inconveniences of frequent change of abode. A welcome was extended to him on all sides. His hosts and patrons honored his thirst for knowledge and tenacity of a purpose. He was expected to help the students in the house where he found entertainment, and it may not have been unpleasing to him on occasion to display his talents before his host. When school was over, it was not unusual to find him surrounded by a group of school companions, each pressing his claim to entertain him for the night. Despite the hospitality of his patrons, the poor scholar often felt the bitterness of his dependent state, but he bore it with equanimity, his hand ever eagerly stretched out for the prize of learning. What did learning bring him? Why was he so eager to bear for its sake? 
All the thousand aches that patient merit of the unworthy takes. Sometimes he became a priest, sometimes his life was purposeless and void, but he was ever urged onward by the fascination of learning and of the cultivation of the nobler part of his nature. As might have been expected, the Irish who have emigrated to the American and Australian continents have given touching proof of their devotion to the cause of learning. I have space only for a few pathetic examples. An Irish workman in the United States, seeing my name in connection with an Irish dictionary, wrote to me a few years ago to ask how he might procure one, as, he said, an Italian in the works had asked him the meaning of Aaron Gobra, and he felt ashamed to be unable to explain it. A man who, at the age of three, had emigrated from Clare in the famine time, wrote to me recently from Australia, in the Irish language and character. An old man named John O'Regan of New Zealand, who had been twelve years in exile in the United States, and forty-eight on the Australian continent, with failing eyesight in a letter that took him from January to June of the year 1906 to write, endeavored to set down scraps of Irish lore which he had carried with him from the old country and which had clung to his memory to the last. In my digging life in the quarries, he says, books were not a part of our swag, prayer book accepted. In 1871, when I had a long seat of work before me, I sent for McCurtain's Dictionary to Melbourne. It is old and wanting in the introductory part, but for all was splendid, and I loved it as my life. C. Gaelic Journal, December 1906 Irishmen of Science by Sir Bertram C. A. Windle, S.E.D., M.D., President, University College, Cork. We may divide our survey of the debt owed to Ireland by science into three periods, the earliest, the intermediate, and the latest. In the earliest period, the names which come before us are chiefly those of compilers, such as Augustine, a monk and an Irishman who wrote at Carthage in Africa in the 7th century, a Latin treatise on the wonderful things of the sacred scripture, still extant, in which, in connection with Joshua's miracle, a very full account of the astronomical knowledge of the period, Ptolemaic but in many ways remarkably accurate, is given. There are, however, three distinguished names. Virgil, the geometer, that is, Fergil, or Ferrell, was abbot of Agabo, went to the continent in 741, and was afterwards bishop of Salzburg. He died in 785. He is remembered by his controversies with St. Boniface, one of which is concerned with the question of the antipodes. Virgil is supposed to have been the first to teach that the earth is spherical. So celebrated was he that it has been thought that a part of the favor in which the author of the Aeneid was held by medieval churchmen was due to a confusion between his name and that of the geometer, sometimes spoken of as St. Virgil. Dicuil, also an Irish monk, was the author of a remarkable work on geography, the Mensura Provinciarum Orbis Terrae, which was written in 825 and contains interesting references to Iceland and especially to the navigable canal which once connected the Nile with the Red Sea. He wrote between 814 and 816 a work on astronomy which has never been published. It is probable but not certain that he belonged to Clonmacnois. Dungal, like the two others named above, was an astronomer. He probably belonged to Bangor and left his native land early in the ninth century. In 811 he wrote a remarkable work, 
Dungali reclusi epistola de duplici solis eclipsi anno octigenti decem ad carolum magnum. This letter, which is still extant, was written at the request of Charlemagne, who considered its author to be the most learned astronomer in existence and most likely to clear up the problem submitted to him. Before passing to the next period, a word should be said as to the medieval physicians, often if not usually belonging to families of medical men, such as the Leahes and Ohignes, and attached hereditarily to the greater clans. These men were chiefly compilers, but such works of theirs as we have throw light upon the state of medical knowledge in their day. Thus there is extant a treatise on Materia Medica, 1459, written by Cormac MacDunslepe, Dunlevy, hereditary physician to the clan of O'Donnell in Ulster. A more interesting work is the Cursus Medicus, consisting of six books on physiology, three on pathology and four on semiotica, written in the reign of Charles I of England by Niall O'Glacken, born in Donegal, and at one time physician to the King of France. O'Glacken's name introduces us to the middle period, if indeed it does not belong there. Inter arma silent legis, and it may be added scientific work. The troublous state of Ireland for many long years fully explains the absence of men of science in any abundance until the end of the 18th century. Still, there are three names which can never be forgotten, belonging to the period in question. Sir Hans Sloane was born at Killilly in Ulster in 1660. He studied medicine abroad, went to London where he settled, and was made a fellow of the Royal Society. He published a work on the West Indies, but his claim to undying memory is the fact that it was the bequest of his most valuable and extensive collections to the nation, which was the beginning and foundation of the British Museum, perhaps the most celebrated institution of its kind in the world. Sloane's collection, it should be added, contained an immense number of valuable books and manuscripts, as well as of objects more usually associated with the idea of a museum. He died in 1753. The Honourable Robert Boyle was born at Lisma in the county Waterford in 1627, being the fourteenth child of the first Earl of Cork. On his tombstone he is described as the father of chemistry and the uncle of the Earl of Cork, and indeed in his Skeptical Chemist, 1661, he assailed and for the time overthrew the idea of the alchemists that there was a materia prima, asserting as he did that theory of chemical elements, which held good until the discoveries in connection with radium led to a modification in chemical teaching. This may be said of Boyle that his writings profoundly modified scientific opinion, and his name will always stand in the forefront amongst those of chemists. He made important improvements in the air pump, was one of the earliest fellows of the Royal Society, and founded the Boyle Lectures. He died in 1691. Sir Thomas Molyneux was born in Dublin in 1661, of a family which had settled in Ireland about 1560 to 70. He practised as a physician in his native city, was the first person to describe the Irish elk, and to demonstrate the fact that the giant's causeway was a natural, and not, as had been previously supposed, an artificial production. He was the author of many other scientific observations. He died in 1733. We may now turn to more recent times, and it will be convenient to divide our subjects according to the branch of science in which they were distinguished, and to commence with mathematicians, of whom Ireland may boast of a most distinguished galaxy. Sir William Rowan Hamilton born in Dublin 1805, died 1865, belonged to a family long settled in Ireland, but of Scottish extraction. He was a most precocious child. He read Hebrew at the age of seven, and at twelve had studied Latin, Greek, and four leading continental languages, as well as Persian, Syriac, Arabic, Sanskrit, and other tongues. 
In 1819, he wrote a letter to the Persian ambassador in that magnate's own language. After these linguistic contests, he early turned to mathematics, in which he was apparently self-taught. Yet, in his seventeenth year, he discovered an error in Laplace's Mécanique Céleste. He entered Trinity College, where he won all kinds of distinctions, being famous not merely as a mathematician, but as a poet, a scholar, and a metaphysician. He was appointed Professor of Astronomy and Astronomer Royal, whilst still an undergraduate. He predicted conical refraction, afterwards experimentally proved by another Irishman, Humphrey Lloyd. He twice received the gold medal of the Royal Society, one for optical discoveries, two for his theory of a general method of dynamics, which resolves an extremely abstruse problem relative to a system of bodies in motion. He was the discoverer of a new calculus, that of Quaternions, which attracted the attention of Professor Tate of Edinburgh, and was by him made comprehensible to lesser mathematicians. It is far too abstruse for description here. Sir George Gabriel Stokes, born in Sligo, 1819, died 1903, was, if not the greatest mathematician, at least among the greatest of the last one hundred years. He was educated in Cambridge, where he spent the rest of his life, being appointed Lucasian Professor of Mathematics in 1849, and celebrating the jubilee of that appointment in 1899. He was Member of Parliament for his university, and for a time occupied the Presidential Chair of the Royal Society. He devoted himself, inter alia, to optical work, and is perhaps best known by those researches which deal with the undulatory theory of light. It was on this subject that he delivered the Burnett Lectures in Aberdeen, 1883-1885. James McCullough, the son of a poor farmer, was born in Tyrone in 1809, died 1847. His early death, due to his own hand in a fit of insanity, cut short his work, but enough remains to permit him to rank amongst the great mathematicians of all time, his most important work being his memoir on surfaces of the second order. Humphrey Lloyd, born in Dublin 1800, died 1881, Fellow of the Royal Society. His father was Provost of Trinity College, Dublin, a position subsequently occupied also by the sun. Lloyd's work was chiefly concerned with optics and magnetism, and it was in connection with the former that he carried out what was probably the most important single piece of work of his life, namely, the experimental proof of the phenomenon of conical refraction which had been predicted by Sir William Hamilton. He was responsible for the erection of the Magnetic Observatory in Dublin, and the instruments used in it were constructed under his observation, and sometimes from his designs or modifications. He was also a meteorologist of distinction. George Salmon, born in Dublin 1819, died 1904, like the last mentioned subject, was, at the time of his death, Provost of Trinity College, Dublin. Besides theological writings, he contributed much to mathematical science, especially in the directions of conic sections, analytic geometry, higher plane curves, and the geometry of three dimensions. He was a Fellow of the Royal Society and received the Copley and Royal Medals, as well as distinctions from many universities and learned societies. John Casey, born Kilkenny, 1820, died 1891, Fellow of the Royal Society, was educated at a national school and became a teacher in one in later years. Entirely self-thought as a mathematician, he raised himself from the humble position which he occupied to be a university professor in the Catholic University of Ireland and afterwards in the Royal University, and earned the highest reputation as one of the greatest authorities on plane geometry. He was a correspondent of eminent mathematicians all over the world. Henry Hennessy, born in Cork, 1826, died 1901, Fellow of the Royal Society, was also a professor in the Catholic University of Ireland and afterwards in the Royal College of Science in Dublin. 
He was a writer on mathematics, terrestrial physics, and climatology. Benjamin Williamson, born in Cork, 1827, Fellow of the Royal Society, is a senior fellow of Trinity College, Dublin, and a distinguished writer on mathematical subjects, especially on the differential, integral, and infinitesimal calculuses. Sir Joseph Larmer, born in Antrim, 1857, Fellow of the Royal Society, was educated at Queen's College, Belfast, and in Cambridge, in which last place he has spent his life as a professor. He now represents the University in Parliament and is secretary to the Royal Society. He is well known for his writings on the ether and on other physical as well as mathematical subjects. Astronomers William Parsons, Earl of Rossi, born in York, 1800, died 1867, Fellow of the Royal Society, was a very distinguished astronomer who experimented in fluid lenses and made great improvements in casting specula for reflecting telescopes. From 1842 to 45, he was engaged upon the construction, in his park of Parsonstown, of his great reflecting telescope 58 feet long. This instrument, which cost £30,000, long remained the largest in the world. He was president of the Royal Society from 1848 to 1854. Sir Howard Grubb, born 1844, Fellow of the Royal Society, is known all over the world for his telescopes and for the remarkable advances which he has made in the construction of lenses for instruments of the largest size. Sir Robert Ball, born in Dublin 1840, died 1913, Fellow of the Royal Society. Originally Lord Rossi's astronomer at Parsonstown, he migrated as professor to Trinity College, Dublin, and subsequently became Laundian Professor of Astronomy at Cambridge. He was a great authority on the mathematical theory of screws, and his popular works on astronomy have made him known to a far wider circle of readers than those who can grapple with his purely scientific treatises. William Edward Wilson Born County Westmeath, 1851, died 1908, Fellow of the Royal Society. A man of independent means, he erected, with the help of his father, an astronomical observatory at his residence. In this well-equipped building he made many photographic researches, especially into the nature of nebulae. He also devoted himself to solar physics and wrote some remarkable papers on the sudden appearance in 1903 of the star Nova Perse. He was the first to call attention to the probability that radium plays a part in the maintenance of solar heat. In fact, the science of radioactivity was engaging his keenest interest at the time of his early death. A. A. Rambert, born Waterford, 1859, Fellow of the Royal Society, formerly Astronomer Royal for Ireland, and now Radcliffe Observer at Oxford, is one of the leading astronomers of the day. Physicists Lord Kelvin, better known as Sir William Thompson, born Belfast, 1824, died 1907, Fellow of the Royal Society. Amongst the greatest physicists who have ever lived, his name comes second only to that of Newton. He was educated at Cambridge, became Professor of Natural Philosophy in Glasgow University in 1846, and celebrated the jubilee of his appointment in 1896. To the public his greatest achievement was the electric cabling of the Atlantic Ocean, for which he was knighted in 1866. His electrometers and electric meters, his sounding apparatus and his mariner's compass are all well-known and highly valued instruments. To his scientific fellows, however, his greatest achievements were in the field of pure science, especially in connection with his thermodynamic researches, including the doctrine of the dissipation of degradation of energy. To this brief statement may be added mention of his work in connection with hydrodynamics and his magnetic and electric discoveries. His papers in connection with wave and vortex movements are also most remarkable. He was awarded the Royal and Copley Medals and was an original member of the Order of Merit. 
he received distinctions from many universities and learned societies. George Francis Fitzgerald, born Dublin, 1851, died 1901, Fellow of the Royal Society, was Fellow and Professor of Natural Philosophy in Trinity College, Dublin, where he was educated. He was the first person to call the attention of the world to the importance of Hertz's experiment. Perhaps his most important work, interrupted by his labours in connection with education and terminated by his early death, was that in connection with the nature of the ether. George Johnston Stoney, born King's County, 1826, died 1911, Fellow of the Royal Society. After being astronomer at Parsonstown and Professor of Natural Philosophy of Galway, became secretary to the Queen's University and occupied that position until the dissolution of the university in 1882. He wrote many papers on geometrical optics and on molecular physics, but his great claim to remembrance is that he first suggested, on the basis of Faraday's laws of electrolysis, that an absolute unit of quantity of electricity exists in that amount of it which attends each chemical bond or valency and gave the name, now generally adopted, of electron to this small quantity. He proposed the electronic theory of the origin of the complex ether vibrations which proceed from a molecule emitting light. John Tyndall, born Lethlin Bridge, County Carlow, 1820, died 1893, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor at the Royal Institution and a Fellow worker in many ways with Huxley, especially on the subject of glaciers. He wrote also on heat as a mode of motion and was the author of many scientific papers, but will, perhaps, be best remembered as the author of a presidential address to the British Association in Belfast, 1874, which was the high-water mark of the mid-Victorian materialism at its most triumphant moment. Chemists Richard Kerbin born Galway, 1733, died 1812, Fellow of the Royal Society. A man of independent means, he devoted himself to the study of chemistry and mineralogy and was awarded the Copley Medal of the Royal Society. He published works on mineralogy and on the analysis of mineral waters and was the first in Ireland to publish analyses of soils for agricultural purposes, a research which laid the foundation for scientific agriculture in Great Britain and Ireland. Maxwell Simpson, born Armagh, 1815, died 1902, Fellow of the Royal Society, held the chair of chemistry in Queen's College, Cork, for 20 years and published a number of papers in connection with his subject and especially with the behaviour of cyanides, with the study of which compounds his name is most associated. Cornelius O'Sullivan, born Brandon, 1841, died 1897, Fellow of the Royal Society, was for many years chemist to the great firm of Bass and Company, brewers of Burton-on-Trent, and in that capacity became one of the leading exponents of the chemistry of fermentation in the world. James Emerson Reynolds, born Dublin, 1844, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor of Chemistry, Trinity College, Dublin, for many years, discovered the primary thiocarbamide and a number of other chemical substances, including a new class of colloids and several groups of organic and other compounds of the element silicon. Among others, only the names of the following can be mentioned. Sir Robert Kane, born Dublin 1809, died 1890, Professor of Chemistry in Dublin and founder and first director of the Museum of Industry, now the National Museum. He was president of Queen's College, Cork, as was William K. Sullivan, born Cork 1822, died 1890, formerly Professor of Chemistry in the Catholic University. Sir William O'Shaughnessy Brooke, Fellow of the Royal Society, born Limerick, 1809, died 1889, Professor of Chemistry and Assay Master in Calcutta, is better known as the introducer of the telegraphic system into India and its first superintendent. 
Biologists William Henry Harvey, born Limerick, 1814, died 1866, Fellow of the Royal Society, was a botanist of very great distinction. During a lengthy residence in South Africa, he made a careful study of the flora of the Cape of Good Hope and published The Genera of South African Plants. After this, he was made keeper of the herbarium Trinity College, Dublin, but, obtaining leave of absence, travelled in North and South America, exploring the coast from Halifax to the Keys of Florida, in order to collect materials for his great work Nereis Boreali Americana, published by the Smithsonian Institution. Subsequently, he visited Ceylon, Australia, Tasmania, New Zealand, and the Friendly and Fiji Islands, collecting algae. The results were published in his Phycologia Australis. At the time of his death, he was engaged on his Flora Capensis and was generally considered the first authority on algae in the world. William Archer, born County Down, 1837, died 1897, Fellow of the Royal Society, devoted his life to the microscopic examination of freshwater organisms, especially desmids and diatoms. He attained a very prominent place in this branch of work among men of science. Perhaps his most remarkable discovery was that of Chlamydomyxa labyrintholoides in 1868, one of the most remarkable and enigmatical of all known microscopical organisms. George James Alman, born Cork, 1812, died 1898, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor of Botany in Trinity College, Dublin, and afterwards Regius Professor of Natural History in the University of Edinburgh, published many papers on botanical and zoological subjects, but his great work was that on the gymnoblastic hydrozoa, without doubt the most important systematic work dealing with the group of coelenterata that has ever been produced. Amongst eminent living members of the class under consideration may be mentioned Alexander McAllister, born Dublin 1844, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor of Anatomy, first in Dublin and now in Cambridge, an eminent morphologist and anthropologist, and Henry Horatio Dixon, born Dublin, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor of Botany in Trinity College, an authority on vegetable physiology, especially problems dealing with the sap. Geologists Samuel Horton, born Carlo, 1821, died 1897, Fellow of the Royal Society. After earning a considerable reputation as a mathematician and a geologist, and taking Anglican orders, determined to study medicine and entered the school of that subject in Trinity College. After graduating, he became the reformer, it might even be said, the re-founder of that school. He devoted ten years to the study of the mechanical principles of muscular action and published his Animal Mechanism, probably his greatest work. He will long be remembered as the introducer of the long drop as a method of capital execution. He might have been placed in several of the categories which have been dealt with, but that of geologist has been selected, since in the later part of his most versatile career he was Professor of Geology in Trinity College, Dublin. Valentine Ball, born Dublin 1843, died 1894, Fellow of the Royal Society, a brother of Sir Robert, joined the Geological Survey of India, and in that capacity became an authority not only on geology, but also on ornithology and anthropology. His best-known work is Jungle Life in India. In later life, he was director of the National Museum, Dublin. Medical Science very brief note can be taken of the many shining lights in Irish medical science. Robert James Graves, 1796 to 1853, Fellow of the Royal Society, after whom is named Graves' Disease, was one of the greatest of clinical physicians. His system of clinical medicine was a standard work and was extolled by Trousseau, the greatest physician that France has ever had, in the highest terms of appreciation.
William Stokes, 1804 to 1878, Regius Professor of Medicine in Trinity College, and the author of A Theory and Practice of Medicine, known all over the civilized world, was equally celebrated. To these must be added Sir Dominic Corrigan, 1802 to 1880, the first Catholic to occupy the position of President of the College of Physicians in Dublin, an authority on heart disease, and the first adequate describer of aortic patency, a form of ailment long called Corrigan's disease. Collis's fracture is a familiar term in the mouths of surgeons. It derives its name from Abraham Collis, 1773 to 1843, the first surgeon in the world to tie the innominate artery, as butcher's saw, a well-known implement, thus from another eminent surgeon. Richard Butcher, Regius Professor in Trinity College in the 70s of the last century. Sir Rupert Boyce, 1863-1911, to Fellow of the Royal Society, though born in London, had an Irish father and mother. Entering the medical profession, he was Assistant Professor of Pathology at University College London and subsequently Professor of Pathology in University College Liverpool, which he was largely instrumental in turning into the University of Liverpool. He was foremost in launching and directing the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, which has had such widespread results all over the world in elucidating the problems and checking the ravages of the diseases peculiar to hot countries. It was for his services in this direction that he was knighted in 1906. Sir Richard Quain, born Mallow, 1816, died 1898, Fellow of the Royal Society, spent most of his life in London, where he was for years the most prominent physician. He wrote on many subjects, but the Dictionary of Medicine, which he edited and which bears his name, has made itself and its editor known all over the world. Sir Almroth White, born 1861, Fellow of the Royal Society, is the greatest living authority on the important subject of vaccinotherapy, which indeed may be said to owe its origin to his researches, as do the methods for measuring the protective substances in the human blood. He was the discoverer of the anti-typhoid injection which has done so much to stay the ravages of that disease. Engineering Bindon Blood Stoney, 1828-1909, Fellow of the Royal Society, made his reputation first as an astronomer by discovering the spiral character of the great nebula in Andromeda. Turning to engineering, he was responsible for the construction of many important works, especially in connection with the port of Dublin. He was brother of G. J. Stoney. Sir Charles Parsons, born 1854, Fellow of the Royal Society, fourth son of the third Earl of Rossi, is the engineer who developed the steam turbine system and made it suitable for the generation of electricity and for the propulsion of war and mercantile vessels. If he has revolutionized traffic on the water, so on the land has John Boyd Dunlop, still living, who discovered the pneumatic tire with such widespread results for motor cars, bicycles, and such means of locomotion. Miscellaneous Admiral Sir Leopold MacClintock, born Dundalk, 1819, died 1907, Fellow of the Royal Society, was one of the great Arctic explorers, having spent eleven navigable seasons and six winters in those regions. He was the chief leader and organizer of the Franklin searches. From the scientific point of view, he made a valuable collection of Miocene fossils from Greenland and enabled Horton to prepare the geological map and memoir of the Perry Archipelago. John Ball, born Dublin 1818, died 1889, Fellow of the Royal Society, educated at Oscott, passed the examination for a high degree at Cambridge, but, being a Catholic, was excluded from the degree itself and any other honours which a Protestant might have attained to. He travelled widely and published many works on the natural history of Europe and South America, from Panama to Tierra del Fuego. He was the first to suggest the utilisation of the electric telegraph for meteorological purposes 
connected with storm warnings. Space ought to be found for a cursory mention of that strange person, Dionysus Lardner, 1793-1859, to who by his Lardner's Cyclopedia in 132 volumes, his Cabinet Library and his Museum of Science and Art did much to popularize science in an unscientific day. Law in Ireland by Lawrence Ginnell, B.L.M.P. A Distinction Ireland having been a self-ruled country for a stretch of some two thousand years, then violently brought under subjection to foreign rule, regaining legislative independence for a brief period, toward the close of the eighteenth century, then, by violence and corruption, deprived of that independence, and again brought under the same foreign rule, to which it is still subject, the expression, Law in Ireland, comprises the native and the foreign, the laws devised by the Irish nation for its own governance, and the laws imposed upon it from without. Two sets, codes, or systems, proper to two entirely distinct social structures, having no relation, and but little resemblance to each other. Whatever may be thought of either as law, the former is Irish in every sense, and vastly the more interesting historically, archaeologically, philologically, and in many other ways, the latter being English law in Ireland and not truly Irish in any sense. Origin and Character of Irish Law Shenecus Agus Phoenicus, Na Erin, is Hibernia Antiquitates a Sanctionis Legalis, the ancient laws and decisions of the Feni of Ireland. Shan, or Shan, that is, old, differs from most Gaelic adjectives in preceding the noun it qualifies. It also tends to coalesce and become a prefix. Shanicus, that is, ancient law, Phoenicus, that is, the law of the Feni, who were the Milesian farmers, free members of the clans, the most important class in the ancient Irish community. Their laws were composed in their contemporary language, the Berla Feni, a distinct form of Gaelic. Several nations of the Aryan race are known to have cast into meter or rhythmical prose their laws and other such knowledge as they desired to communicate, preserve, and transmit before writing came into use. The Irish went further, and for greater facility in committing to memory and retaining there, put their laws into a kind of rhymed verse, of which they may have been the inventors. By this device, aided by the isolated geographical position of Ireland, the sanctity of age, and the apprehension that any change of word or phrase might change the law itself, these archaic laws, when subsequently committed to writing, were largely preserved from the progressive changes to which all spoken language are subject, with the result that we have today embedded in the Gaelic text and commentaries of the Schenkes Moor, the Book of Asil, and other law works available in English translations, made under a royal commission appointed by government in 1852, and published, at intervals extending over forty years, in six volumes of ancient laws and institutions of Ireland, a mass of archaic words, phrases, law, literature, and information on the habits and manners of the people, not equaled in antiquity, quantity, or authenticity in any other Celtic source. In English, they are commonly called brain laws, from the genitive case singular of brethem, that is, judge, genitive brain, as Aaron is an oblique case of ire, and as Latin words are sometimes adopted in the genitive in modern languages, which themselves have no case distinctions. It is not to be inferred from this name that the laws are judge-made. They are rather case law, in parts possibly enacted by some of the various assemblies at which the laws were promulgated or rehearsed, but for the most part simple declarations of law, 
originating in custom and moral justice, and records of judgments based upon the precedents and commentaries. In the sort of cases common to agricultural communities of the time, many of the provisions being as inapplicable to modern life as modern laws would be to ancient life. A reader is impressed by the extraordinary number and variety of cases, with their still more numerous details and circumstances accumulated in the course of long ages. The manner in which the laws are inextricably interwoven with the interlocking clan system and the absence of scientific arrangement or guiding principle except those of moral justice, clemency, and the good of the community. This defect in arrangement is natural in writings intended, as these were, for the use of judges and professors, experts in the subjects with which they deal, but makes the task of presenting a concise statement of them difficult and uncertain. Society Law the law and the social system were inseparable parts of a complicated whole, mutually cause and consequence of each other. Thua, clan, kinel, kine, and finye were terms used to denote a tribe or set of relatives, in reality or by adoption, claiming descent from a common ancestor, forming a community occupying and owning a given territory. Thua, in course of time, came to be applied indifferently to the people and to their territory. Finye, sometimes designating a whole tribe, more frequently meant a part of it, occupying a distinct portion of the territory, a potential microcosm or nucleus of a clan, having limited autonomy in the conduct of its own immediate affairs. The constitution of this organism whether as contemplated by the law or in the less perfect actual practice, is alike elusive and underwent changes. For the purpose of illustration, the finye may be said to consist theoretically of the seventeen men frequently mentioned throughout the laws, namely the flafinye, that is, chief of the finye, the gelfinye, that is, his four full-grown sons or other nearest male relatives, the derfinye, Tarfinye and Infinye, each consisting of four heads of families in wider concentric circles of kinship, say, first, second, and third cousins of the Flafinye. The Finye was liable in measure determined by those circles, for contracts, fines, and damages incurred by any of its members, so far as his own property was insufficient, and was in the same degree entitled to share advantages of a like kind accruing. Intermarriage within this finye was prohibited. The modern term sept is applied sometimes to this group, and sometimes to a wider group united under a flaw, that is chief, elected by the flaw finyes, and provided for his public services, with free land proportionate to the area of the district and the number of clansmen in it. Clan might mean the whole Irish nation, or an intermediate homogeneous group of finyes, having for wider purposes a flaw or re thua, that is, king of one thua, elected by the flaws and flaw finyes, subject to elaborate qualifications as to person, character, and training, which limited their choice, and provided with a larger portion of free land. This was the lowest chief to whom the title re, re, that is, rex, or king, was applied. A group of these kinglets, connected by blood or territory or policy, and their flaws elected from a still narrower circle of specially trained men within their own rank, the Rimortua, kings of the territory so composed, to whose office a still larger area of free land was attached. In turn, kings of this class, with their respective sub-kings and flaws elected from among the Riochdauna, that is, materia principum, or king timber, a royal finye specially educated and trained, a requi supreme over five remorthuas, roughly a fourth of Ireland. These, with their respective principal supporters, elected the Ardre, supreme king of Ireland, who for ages held his court and national assemblies at Tara and enjoyed the kingdom of Mita for his Menza land. 
Usually the election was not direct to the kingship, but to the position of Tanista, second in authority, heir apparent to the kingship. This was also the rule in the learned professions and noble arts, which were similarly endowed with free land. The most competent among those specially trained, whether son or outsider, should succeed to the position in land. All such land was legally indivisible and inalienable, and descended in its entirety to the successor, who might, or might not, be a relative of the occupant. The beneficiaries were, however, free to retain any land that belonged to them as private individuals. Membership of the clan was an essential qualification for every position, but occasionally two clans amalgamated, or a small fine or desirable individual, was co-opted into the clan, in other words, naturalized. The rules of kinship determined enyakong, honor value, the assessed value of status with its correlative rights, obligations, and liabilities in connection with all matters civil and criminal, largely supplied the place of contract, endowed members of the clan with birthrights, and bound them into a compact social, political, and mutual insurance copartnership, self-controlled and self-reliant. Enyoklang rested on the twofold basis of kinship and property, expanding as a clansman by acquisition of property and affluxion of time progressed upward from one grade to another, diminishing if he sank, vanishing if for crime he was expelled from the clan. Fosterage To our minds one of the most curious customs prevalent among the ancient Irish was that of Irad, also called Altar, that is, fosterage, curious in itself and in the fact that in all the abundance of law and literature relating to it, no logically valid reason is given why wealthy parents normally put out their children from one year old to fifteen in the case of a daughter and to seventeen in the case of a son to be reared in another family, while perhaps receiving and rearing children of other parents sent to them. As modern life does not comprise either the custom or a reason for it, we may assume that fosterage was a consequence of the clan system, and that its practice strengthened the ties of kinship and sympathy. This conjecture is corroborated by the numerous instances in history and in story of fosterage affection proving, when tested, stronger than the natural affection of relatives by birth. What is more, long after the dissolution of the clans, fosterage has continued stealthily in certain districts in which the old race of chiefs and clansmen contrived to cling together to the old sod, and the affection generated by it has been demonstrated down to the middle of the nineteenth century. The present writer has heard it spoken of lovingly, in half-Irish, by simple old people whom to question would be cruel and irreverent. Land Law The entire territory was originally, and always continued to be, the absolute property of the entire clan. Not even the private residence of a clansman, with its mandigona, that is, little lawn, or precinct of sanctuary, within which himself and his family and property were inviolable, could be sold to an outsider. Private ownership, though rather favored in the administration of the law, was prevented from becoming general by the fundamental ownership of the clan and the birthright of every free-born clansman to a sufficiency of the land of his native territory for his subsistence. The land officially held as described was not, until the population became numerous, a serious encroachment upon this right. What remained outside this and the residential patches of private land was classified as cultivable and uncultivable. The former was the common property of the clansmen, but was held and used in severalty for the time being, subject to Gaul Kine, clan resumption and redistribution by authority of an assembly of the clan, or Finye, at intervals of from one to three years, according to local customs and circumstances for the purpose of satisfying the rights of young clansmen 
and dealing with any land left derelict by death or forfeiture, compensation being paid for any unexhausted improvements. The clansmen, being owners in this limited sense, and the only owners, had no rent to pay. They paid tribute for public purposes, such as the making of roads, to the flaw as a public officer, as they were bound to render, or had the privilege of rendering, according to how they regarded it, military service when required, not to the flaw as a feudal lord, which he was not, but to the clan, of which the flaw was head and representative. The uncultivable, unreclaimed forest, mountain, and bog land was common property in the wider sense that there was no several appropriation of it, even temporarily by individuals. It was used promiscuously by the clansmen for grazing stock, procuring fuel, pursuing game, or any other advantage yielded by it in its natural state. Kings and flaws were great stock owners, and were allowed to let for short terms portions of their official lands. What they more usually let to clansmen was cattle to graze either on private land or on a specified part of the official land, not measured, but calculated according to the number of beasts it was able to support. A flaw whose stock for letting ran short hired some from a king and sublet them to his own people. A fena etec or calye, as a farmer was generally called, might hire stock in one of two distinct ways. Ser, free, which was regulated by the law, left his status unimpaired, could not be terminated arbitrarily or unjustly, under which he paid one-third of the value of the stock yearly for seven years, at the end of which time what remained of the stock became his property and in any dispute relating to which he was competent to sue or defend even though the flaw gave evidence, or dare, bond, which was matter of bargain and not of law, was subject to onerous conditions and contingencies, including maintenance of kings, flaws, or brands, with their retinues on visitations of disbanded soldiers, etc., under which the stock always remained the property of the flaw, regarding which the Kelia, could not give evidence against that of the flaw, which degraded the Kelia and his finye, and impaired their status, a bargain, therefore, which could not be entered into without the sanction of the finye. This prohibition was rendered operative by the legal provision that, in case of default, the flaw could not recover from the finye unless their consent had been obtained. The letting of stock, especially of darstock, increased the flaw's power as a lender over borrowers, subject, however, to the check that his rank in Enyoklong depended on the number of independent clansmen in his district. Though workers in precious metals, as their ornaments show, the ancient Irish did not coin or use money. Sales were by barter. All payments tribute rent fulfillment of contract, fine, damages, wages, or however else arising, were made in kind. Horses, cows, store cattle, sheep, pigs, corn, meal, malt, bacon, salt beef, geese, butter, honey, wool, flax, yarn, cloth, dye plants, leather, manufactured articles of use or ornament, gold and silver, whatever one party could spare and the other find a use for. Tributes and rent, being alike paid in kind and to the same person, were easily confused. This tempted the flaw, as the system relaxed, to extend his official power in the direction of ownership, but never to the extent of enabling him to evict a clansman. For a crime, a clansman might be expelled from clan and territory, but, apart from crime, the idea of eviction from one's homestead was inconceivable, not even when a darkelia, or unfree peasant, failed to make the stipulated payments, could the flaw do more than sue as for any other debt, and, if successful, he was bound, in seizing, to leave the family food material and implements necessary for living and recovering. Law of Distraining Aguil, that is, distress, was a universal legal mode of obtaining anything due, or justice or redress in any matter whether civil or criminal, contract or tort, 
Every command or prohibition of the law, if not obeyed, was enforced by Aguil. The Brayans reduced all liabilities of whatsoever origin to material value to be recovered by this means. Hence its great importance, the vast amount of space devoted to it in the laws, and the fact that the law of distress deals incidentally with every other branch of law and reveals best the customs, habits, and character of the people. A claimant in a civil case might either summon his debtor before a brayan, get a judgment, and seize the amount adjudged, or, by distraining first at his own risk, force the defendant either to pay or stop the seizure, by submitting the matter in dispute to trial before a brayan, whom he then could choose. There was no officer corresponding to a sheriff to distrain, and realize the amount adjudged. The person entitled had to do it himself, accompanied by a law agent and witnesses, after, in distress with time, elaborate notices at intervals of time sufficient to allow the defendant to consider his position and find means of satisfying the claim if he could. In a proper case his hands were strengthened by very explicit provisions of the law. If a man who is sued evades justice, knowing the debt to be due of him, double the debt is payable by him. In urgent cases, immediate distress was allowed. In either case, the property seized, usually cattle, was not taken to the plaintiff's home, but put into a pound, and by similar easy stages became his property to the amount of the debt. The costs were paid out of what remained, and any ultimate remainder was returned. On a fujur, that is, serf or other unfree person resident in the territory, incurring liability to a clansman, the latter might proceed against the flaw on whose land the defendant lived, or might seize immediately any property the defendant owned, and if he owned none, might seize him and make him work off the debt in slavery. Seizure of property of a person of higher rank than the plaintiff had to be preceded by trusca, that is, fasting upon him. This consisted in waiting at the door of the defendant's residence without food until the debt was paid or a pledge given. The laws contained no process more strongly enforced than this. A defendant who allowed a plaintiff properly fasting to die of hunger was held by law and by public opinion guilty of murder and completely lost his inoculum. Both text and commentary declare that whoever refuses to cede a just demand when fasted upon shall pay double that amount. If the faster, having accepted a pledge, did not in due course receive satisfaction of his claim, he forthwith distrained, taking and keeping double the amount of the debt. The law did not allow those whom it at first respected to trifle with justice. Trusca is believed to have been of druidical origin, and it retained throughout, even in Christian times, a sort of supernatural significance. Whoever disregarded it became an outcast, and incurred risks and dangers too grave to be lightly faced. Besides being a legal process, it was resorted to as a species of elaborate prayer, or curse, a kind of magic for achieving some difficult purpose. This mysterious character enhanced its value in a legal system deficient in executive power. Non-Citizens From what precedes it will be understood that there were in ancient Ireland, from prehistoric times, people not comprised in the clan organization, and therefore not enjoying its rights and advantages, or entitled to any of its land, some of whom were otherwise free within certain areas, while some were serfs and some slaves. Those outsiders are conjectured to have originated in the earlier colonists subdued by the Milesians and reduced to an inferior condition, but the distinction did not wholly follow racial lines. Persons of pre-Milesian race are known to have risen to eminence, while Milesians are known to have sunk from crime or other causes to the lowest rank of the unfree. Here and there, a dar dua, that is, bond community of an earlier race, held together down to the Middle Ages in districts in which conquest had left them and to which they were restricted. Beyond that restriction, exclusion from the clan and its power, some peculiarities of dialect, dress, and manners, 
and a tradition of inferiority such as still exists in certain parishes, they were not molested, provided they paid tribute, which may have been heavy. There were also bothocks, that is, cotiers, and chancletes, that is, old adherents of a flaw, accustomed to serve him and obtain benefits from him, if they had resided in the territory for three generations, and been industrious, thrifty, and orderly, on a few of them joining their property together to the number of one hundred head of cattle, they could emancipate themselves by appointing a flaw finier and getting admitted to the clan. Till this was done they could neither sue nor defend nor inherit, and the flaw was answerable for their conduct. There being no prisons or convict settlements, any person of whatever race convicted of grave crime, or of cowardice on the field of battle, and unable to pay the fines imposed, captives taken in foreign wars, fugitives from other clans, and tramps, fell into the lowest ranks of the fooder, serfs. It was as a captive that St. Patrick was brought in his youth to Ireland. The law allowed, rather than entitled, a flaw to keep unfree people for servile occupations, and the performance of unskilled labor for the public benefit. In reality, they worked for his personal profit, oftentimes at the expense of the clan. They lived on his land, and he was responsible for their conduct. By analogy, the distinctions, ser and der, were recognized among them, according to origin, character, and means. Where these elements continued to be favorable for three generations, progress upward was made, and ultimately a number of them could club together, appoint a flaw finier, and apply to be admitted to the clan. A mog was a slave in the strict sense, usually purchased as such from abroad, and legally and socially lower than the lowest fooder. Duraldus Cambrensis, writing towards the close of the twelfth century, tells us that English parents then frequently sold their surplus children and other persons to the Irish as slaves. The church repeatedly intervened for the release of captives and mitigation of their condition. The whole institution of slavery was strongly condemned as unchristian by the synod held in Armagh in 1171. Criminal Law Though there are numerous laws relating to crime to be found chiefly in the Book of Asil, criminal law in the sense of a code of punishment, there was none. The law took cognizance of crime and wrong of every description against person, character, and property, and its function was to prevent and restrict crime, and when committed to determine, according to the facts of the case, and the respective ranks of the parties, the value of the compensation or reparation that should be made. It treated crime as a mode of incurring liability, entitled the sufferer, or, if he was murdered, his finier, to bring the matter before a brayan, who, on hearing the case, made the complicated calculations and adjustments rendered necessary by the facts proved and by the grades to which the respective parties belonged, arrived at and gave judgment for the amount of the compensation, armed with which judgment, the plaintiff could immediately distrain for that amount the property of the criminal, and, in his default, that of his finye. The finye could escape part of its liability by arresting and giving up the convict, or by expelling him and giving substantial security against his future misdeeds. From the number of elements that entered into the calculation of a fine, it necessarily resulted that like fines by no means followed like crimes. Fines, like all other payments, were adjudged and paid in kind, being in some cases of the destruction of property, generic, a quantity of that kind of property. Large fines were usually adjudged to be paid in three species, one-third in each, the plaintiff taking care to inform correctly the brayan of the kinds of property the defendant possessed, because he could seize only that named, and if the defendant did not possess it, the judgment was a blind nut. Crime against the state or community, such as willful disturbance of an assembly, was punished severely. These were the only cases to which the law attached a sentence of death or other corporal punishment for nothing whatsoever between parties did the law recognize 
any duty of revenge, retaliation, or the infliction of personal punishment, but only the payment of compensation. Personal punishment was regarded as the commission of a second crime on account of a first. There was no duty to do this, but the right to do it was tacitly recognized if a criminal resisted or evaded payment of an adjudged compensation. Criminal were distinguished from civil cases only by the moral element, the sufferer's right in all cases to choose a brayon, the loss of an auclon, partial or whole according to the magnitude of the crime, the elements used in calculating the amount of the fine, and the technical terms employed. The jire was a general name for a fine, and there were specific names for classes of fines. Eric, that is, reparation, redemption, was the fine for killing a human being, the amount being affected by the distinction between murder and manslaughter, and by other circumstances, but in no case was a violent death, however innocent, allowed to pass without reparation being made. A fine was awarded out of the property of the convict, or of his finye, to the finye of the person slain, in the proportions in which they were entitled to inherit his property, that being also according to their degrees of kinship, and the degrees in which they were really sufferers. This gave every clan and every clansman, in addition to their moral interest, a direct monetary interest in the prevention and suppression of crime. Hence the whole public feeling of the country was entirely in support of the law, the honor and interest of community, and individual being involved in its maintenance. The injured person, or finye, if unable to recover the fine, might, in capital cases, seize and enslave or even kill the convict probably restrained by the fact that, there being no officers of criminal law, they had to inflict punishment themselves, they sometimes imprisoned a convict in a small island, or sent him adrift on the sea in a crock or boat of hide. Law supported by public opinion, powerful because so inspired, powerful because unanimous, was difficult to evade or resist. It so strongly armed an injured person, and so utterly paralyzed a criminal, that escape from justice was hardly possible. The only way in which it was possible was by flight, leaving all one's property behind, and sinking into slavery in a strange place, and this, in effect, was a severe punishment, rather than an escape. Foreign Law The Danes and other Norsemen were the buccaneers of northwestern Europe from the 8th to the 11th century. They conquered and settled permanently in Neustria, from them called Normandy, and conquered and ruled for a considerable time England and part of Scotland and the Isles. In Ireland they were little more than marauders, having permanent colonies only round the coast, always subject, nominally at least, to the Ardre or to the local chief, paying him tribute when he was strong, raiding his territory when he was weak and fomenting recurrent disorder highly prejudicial to law, religion, and civilization. They never made any pretense of extending their laws to Ireland, and their attempt to conquer the country was finally frustrated at Clontarf in 1014. The Anglo-Norman invaders also seized the seaports. The earlier of them who went inland partially adopted in the second generation the Gaelic language, laws, and customs, as many non-Celtic lowlanders of Scotland about the same period adopted the Gaelic language, laws, and customs of the Highlanders. Hence, they did not make much impression on the Gaelic system, beyond the disintegrating effect of their imperfect adoption of it. Into the eastern parts of Ireland, however, a fresh stream of English adventurers continued to flow, as aggressive and covetous as their means and prudence permitted calling so much of the country as they were able to wrench from the Irish, the English pale, which fluctuated in extent with their fortunes, and, when compelled to pay tribute to Irish chiefs, calling it black rent, to indicate how they regarded it. Their greatest difficulty was to counteract the tendency of the earlier colonists to become hibernicized, a most unwilling tribute to the superiority of the Irish race. They, and still more those in England who supported them, knew nothing of the Irish language, laws, and institutions, but that they should all be impartially hated, uprooted, 
and supplanted by English people and everything English as soon as means enabled this to be done. This was the amiable purpose of the pompously named Statute of Kilkenny, passed by about a score of these colonists in 1367. Presuming to speak in the name of Ireland, the statute prohibited the English colonists from becoming Irish in the numerous ways they were accustomed to do, and excluded all Irish priests from preferment in the church, partly because their superior virtue would by contrast amount to a censure. The purpose was not completely successful, even within the pale. Outside that precinct, the mass of the Irish were wholly unconscious of the existence of the Statute of Kilkenny. But expressing, as the Statute did correctly, the views of fresh adventurers, it became, in arrogance, and in the pretension to speak for the whole of Ireland, a model for their future legislation and policy. Under King Henry the Sixth of England, Richard, Duke of York, being Lord Deputy, the Parliament of the Pale, assembled in Dublin, repudiated the authority of the English Parliament in Ireland, established a mint, and assumed an attitude of almost complete independence. On the other hand, in 1494, under Henry the Seventh, the Parliament of the Pale, assembled at Drogheda, passed Poynings Act, extending all English laws to Ireland, and subjecting all laws passed in Ireland to revision by the English Council. This, extended to the whole of Ireland as English power extended, remained in force until 1782. Henry VIII was the first English sovereign to take practical measures for the Pacific and diplomatic conquest of the whole of Ireland and the substitution of English for Irish institutions and methods. His daughter, Queen Elizabeth, continued and completed the conquest, but it was by drenching the country in blood by more than decimating the Irish people, and by reducing the remnant to something like the condition of the ancient feudor. Her policy prepared the ground for her successor, James I, to exterminate the Irish from large tracts in which he planted Englishmen and Scotchmen, and to extend all English laws to Ireland, and abolish all other laws. James's English Attorney General in Ireland, Sir John Davies, in his work, a discovery of the true causes, etc., says. For there is no nation of people under the sun that doth love equal and indifferent, that is, impartial justice better than the Irish, or will rest better satisfied with the execution thereof, although it be against themselves, so as they may have the protection and benefit of the law, when upon just cause they do desire it. The ancient Irish loved their laws and took pride in obeying and enforcing them. The different attitude of the modern Irish towards foreign laws and administration is amply explained by the morally indefensible character of those laws and that administration, to be read in English statutes and ordinances and in the history of English rule in Ireland, a subject too vast and harrowing, and in every sense foreign to what has gone before, to be entered upon here. Though the Parliament of 1782 to 1800 was little more than a pale Parliament, in which the mass of the Irish people had no representation whatsoever, one of its acts, to its credit be it said, was an attempt to mitigate the penal laws and emancipate the oppressed Gaelic and Catholic population of Ireland. With the partial exception of that brief interval, law in Ireland has, during the last 360 years, meant English laws, specially enacted for the destruction of any Irish trade or industry that entered into competition with a corresponding English trade or industry. In later times, those crude barbarities have been gradually superseded by the more defensible laws now in force in Ireland, all of which can be studied in statutes passed by the Parliament since the Union with Scotland, called British. Irish Music by W. H. Gretan Flood, Muse D. M. R. I. A. K. S. G. Perhaps nothing so strikingly brings home the association of Ireland with music as the fact that the harp is emblazoned on the national arms. Ireland, the mother of sweet singers, as Pope writes, Ireland, where, according to St. Columcille, the clerics sing like the birds. 
Ireland can proudly point to a musical history of over 2,000 years. The Milesians, the De Danans, and other pre-Christian colonists were musical. Hecateus, B.C. 540-475, describes the Celts of Ireland as singing songs to the harp in praise of Apollo, and Ethicus of Istria, a Christian philosopher of the early 4th century, describes the culture of the Irish. Certainly it is that, even before the coming of St. Patrick, the Irish were a highly cultured nation, and the national apostle utilized music and song in his work of conversion. In the early lives of the Irish saints, musical references abound, and the Irish school of music attracted foreign scholars from the 6th to the 9th century. Hymnologists are familiar with the hymns written by early Irish saints and legs, e.g. St. Sessional, St. Columcio, St. Moles, St. Cochigne, St. Columbanus, St. Alton, St. Coleman, St. Comain, St. Angus, Dongo, Sedulius, Mongo, and others. Who has not heard of the great music school of St. Gallen, founded by St. Gaul, the wonder and delight of Europe, with a flock German students, one of the Irish monks, Tilthal, Tutilo, composed numerous sacred pieces, including the famous forest Kyrie, Fons Bonititatis, Fons Bonititatis, included in the Vatican edition of the Kyrie, 1906. Not alone did Irish monks propagate sacred and secular music throughout France, Italy, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, and the far north, but they made their influence felt in Lindisfarne, Malmesbury, Glastonbury, and other cities in England, as also in Scotland, St. Aldheim, one of the pupils of St. Maldo, tells us that at the close of the 7th century, Ireland, synonymous with learning, literally blazed like the stars of the firmament with the glory of her scholars. During the ninth century, we meet with twelve different forms of instruments in use by the Irish, namely the crook and clairsage, small and large harp, timpan, rota or bowed crook, wen, oboe or bassoon, benbulbal, and corn, horn, quisianum, and piar, bagpipes, fiera flute or fife, gothwain, bass horn, stock and sternum, trumpet, pepe, single and double pipes, crab keel and crown keel, cymbalum, kinama, castanet, and fiddle, fiddle. The so-called Brian Burroughs harp really dates from the 13th century and is now in Trinity College, Dublin but there are numerous sculptured harps of the ninth and 10th centuries on the crosses at Grey, Ullard, Clonmacnoise, Duro, and Monaster Boys. Donchad, an Irish bishop of the ninth century, who died as abbot of St. Remigius, wrote a commentary of Martianus Capella, a well-known musical textbook. Towering above all his fellows, John Scotus Aragina, in 1867, wrote a tract, De Divisione de Division Naturae, in which he expounds organum, or discant, nearly a hundred years before the appearance of the Scalia Incariades, Incariades, and the Musica Incariades. He also wrote a commentary on Martianus Capella, now in a Paris manuscript of the ninth century. The eulogy of Geraldus Cambrensis, or Gerald Barry, who came to Ireland in 1183 on Irish harpers and minstrels is too well known to be repeated. But Brompton and John of Salisbury are equally enthusiastic. Round bass or pedal point and singing in parts 
as well as bands of harpers and pipers were in vogue in Ireland before the coming of the English. Dante, quoted by Galilei, testifies to the fact that Italy received the harp from Ireland, and, it may be added, the Irish harp suggested the pianoforte. In the Anglo-Norman ballad, The Entrenchment of New Ross, in 1265, allusion is made to pipes and flutes, and carols and dancing. Another poem, dating from about 1320, refers to Irish dances in a flattering manner. John Garland, 1190-1264, wrote a treatise on organum, and outlined a scheme of dividing the interval, which developed into ornamentation, passing notes and grace notes. The Dublin troper of the 13th century has a number of forest curies and glorias, also a collection of sequences. A Dublin processional of the 14th century contains the most elaborate form of the officium sepulchre, with musical notation on a four-line stave, the foundation of the miracle play of the resurrection. Another Dublin troper dates from 1360 and was used in St. Patrick's Cathedral. It contains the hymn Angelus ad Virginum, alluded to by Chaucer. The Christ Church Psaltery, about 1370, has musical notation and is exquisitely illuminated. Lionel Power, an Anglo-Irishman, wrote the first English treatise on music in 1395. Exactly a century later, in 1495, a music school was founded in Christchurch Cathedral, Dublin. The Irish annals of the 13th to the 15th century have numerous references to distinguished harpers and singers, and there are still sung many beautiful airs of this period, including the Cullen and Aibling Aruin. John Lawless was a famous Irish organ builder of the second half of the 15th century, and his successor, James Dempsey, built many fine organs between the years 1530 and 1565. Notwithstanding the many penal en enactments against Irish minstrels, all the great Anglo-Irish nobles of the Pale retained an Irish harper and piper in their service. Under date of 1480, we find Chief Justice Birmingham having an Irish harper to teach his family, as also to harp and to dance. A century later, Lyne Cruz, the harper, Richard Cruz, composed a lamentation song on the fall of the Baron of Slang, the air of which is still popular. It is to the credit of the Irishman, William Bath, who subsequently became a Jesuit, that he wrote the first printed English treatise on music, published in 1584, thus antedating by thirteen years Morley's work. Bath wrote a second musical treatise in 1587, and he was the first to call measures by the name of bars. He also formulated methods of transposition and sight-reading that may still be studied with profit. Thomas Campion, the poet and composer, was born in Dublin in 1567, but spent nearly all his life in England. Other Irish composers, to mention only the most distinguished, were William Costello, Madrigalis, Richard Gilly, Edward Shergold, and Walter Kennedy. Strange as it may seem, Queen Elizabeth retained in her service an Irish harper, Cormac McDermott, from 1591 to 1603, and on the death of the Queen, he was given an annual pension of 46 pounds, 10 shillings, 10 d, nearly 500 pounds a year of our present money. Shakespeare refers to eleven Irish tunes, of which the famous Palais of Astur Me is still fresh. Irish dances were extremely popular at the English court from 1600 to 1603 and were introduced into the masks. Shakespeare's intrinsic friend, John Dowland of Dublin, was one of the greatest lutenists in Europe from 1590 to 1626. In the dedication of a song to my loving countryman, 
Mr. John Foster the Younger, merchant of Dublin in Ireland. Dowland sufficiently indicates his nationality, and his compositions betray all the charm and grace of Irish melody. It is of interest to add that the earliest printed Irish dance is in Porthenia in Violata, of which work, published in 1613-14, to 14, there is only one copy known, now in the New York Public Library. From 1600 to 1602, Charles O'Reilly was harpist to the court of Denmark at $200 a year. His successor was Donald Dub, the Black, O'Cahill, 1602 to 1610, who followed Anne of Denmark to the English court. Walter Quinn of Dublin was music master to King James' eldest son, Prince Henry, from 1608 to 1611. Other noted harpers of the first half of the 17th century are Rory Dahl, the Blind, O'Cahan, Nicholas Dahl Pierce, Tuck McCrory, John Rory and Henry Scott, Owen McKeenan, Owen McDermott, Tuck O'Coffey, and Father Robert Nugent. S.J. Darby Scott was harper to the Danish court from 1621 till his death at Copenhagen, on December 19, 1634. Pierce Ferreter, a gentleman harper, was executed at Killarney in 1652. Miles O'Reilly and the two Connellans were famous harpers between the years 1660 and 1680. Evelyn, the English diarist, in 1668, praises the excellent performances on the harp of Sir Edward Sutton, who, in the following year, was granted by King Charles II the lands of Comfort, County Kildare. Two beautiful harps of this period are still preserved, the Fitzgerald harp and the Fogarty harp. There are many exquisite airs of the 17th century, some of which have been incorporated in Moore's Irish melodies. The titles of several airs of this epoch are of historical interest, e.g., Sarsfield's Lament, Lament for Owen Rowe O'Neill, MacAllistrum's March, Net of the Hill, The Breach of Ogram, Limerick's Lamentation, Lily Berlero, Balenna Mona, The Boyne Water, and The Wild Geese. Irish tunes abound in the various editions of Playford's Country Dances from 1651 to 1720. Turlock O'Carolan, 1670 to 1738, who has been styled the last of the Irish bards, wrote and composed innumerable songs, also Plexties, Pleuracas, and Lamentations. It is here merely necessary to note that 26 of O'Carolan's airs are included in Moore's Irish melodies, although his claim to them has only recently been proved by the present writer. Goldsmith's eulogy of O'Carolan is well known. The Jacobite period from 1710 to 1750 considerably influenced Irish minstrelsy, and some of the most delightful airs were adapted to Jacobite lyrics. Sigan Budi, An Sean, Dwin, Lament for Kilcash, Armand's Lament, Morin ni Chilenen, All the Way to Galway, The Air of Yankee Doodle, Caitlin ni Hulahan, Balance a Straw, The Wearing of the Green, St. Patrick's Day, Plankham Perby, are amongst the tunes in vogue at this period. As early as 1685, the Hibernian Catch Club was established and still flourishes. Sicilian celebrations were held from 1727 to 1732, and a Dublin Academy of Music was founded in 1728. The charitable and musical society, founded in 1723, built the Fishamble Street Music Hall in 1741 and assisted at the first performance of The Messiah, conducted by Handel himself, on 13th April, 1742. Kitty Clive, Peg Woffington, and Daniel Sullivan were noted Irish singers of this epoch. 
while John Clegg, Dr. Murphy, and Burke Thomas were famous instrumentalists. In 1741, Richard Pokrich invented the musical glasses, for which Gluck wrote some pieces. It was afterwards improved by Benjamin Franklin. On the continent, Henry Madden was music director of the Chapel Royal at Versailles in 1744, in succession to Canberra, and was also canon of St. Quentin. In 1764, the Earl of Mornington, Muse D., was appointed first professor of music in Dublin University. A few years later, Charles Claggett invented the valve horn. Michael Kelly of Dublin was specially selected by Mozart to create the parts of Basilio and Don Curcio at the first performance of the opera of Figaro on May 1, 1786. Kane O'Hara, Samuel Lee, Owenson, Neil, Baron Dillon, Dr. Doyle, T.A. Geary, Mann, and the Earl of Westmeath were distinguished musicians, while the fame of Carter, Mountain, Moorhead, and Dr. Cogan was not confined to Ireland. Among native minstrels, Jerome Duganon, Dominic Mongan, Dennis Hempson, Charles Byrne, James Duncan, Arthur Victory, and Arthur O'Neill were celebrated as harpers. The Belfast meeting of 1792 revived the vogue of the national instrument. Nor was the bagpipe neglected. Even in America in 1778, Lord Rawdon had a band of pipers with Barney Thompson as pipe major. At home, Sterling Jackson, Macdonald, Moorhead, Kennedy, and Macklin sustained the reputation of this ancient instrument. Ere the close of the 18th century, John Field of Dublin was a distinguished pianist. He subsequently, 1814, invented, invented the nocturne, developed by Chopin. Sir John Stevenson, the arranger of the Irish melodies, Tom Cook, William Southwell, inventor of the damper action for pianofortes, Henry Mountain, Andrew Ashe, Flautist, Barton, Rook, and Bunting were world-famed. Among the Irish musicians of the last century, the following names are typical. Thomas Moore, J. A. Wade, Ball, Bohemian Girl, Wallace, Maritana, Osborne, Sir Frederick Osler, Stetson Clark, Howard Glover, Corncastle, J. W. Glover, Sir Robert Stewart, Augusta Holmes, R. M. Levy, Joseph Robinson, Ford, Glover, Hearns, Allen, Barker, Torrance, Malloy, Guernsey, Gilmore, Thunder, Harvey, Goodman, Sir Arthur Sullivan, Pennefor, Mikado, Miss Davis, Halliday, inventor of the Kent Bugle, Latham, Dugan, Gaskin, Lacey, Pontet, Piccolomini, Hudson, Pickett, Horan, Marx, and W.C. Levy. Famous vocalists like Catherine Hayes, Mrs. Scott Fennell, Senior Foley, Foley, Barton McGuckin, Dennis O'Sullivan, and William Ludwig deserve inclusion. In our own day, it is only necessary to mention composers like Sir Charles Villiers Stanford, Dr. C. Woods, Victor Herbert, Mrs. Needham, Dr. Sinclair, Norman O'Neill, and Arthur O'Leary. Singers like Egan, Burke, Plunkett Green, John McCormick, Pete O'Shea, Charles Manners, and Joseph O'Mara. Violinists like Maud McCarthy, Emily Keady, Arthur Darling, and Patrick Delaney. Organists like Dr. Charles Marchant, Brendan Rogers, Dr. Josette, and Professor Buck. Writers like Mrs. Kerwin, Dr. Annie Patterson. Mrs. Milligan Fox, Professor Mahaffey, A. P. Graves, Dr. Collison, and G. B. Shaw, and conductors like Hamilton Hardy and James Glover. Irish Metalwork by Dermot Goffey From the earliest times in the history of Western Europe, Ireland has been renowned for her work in metal. The first metal used was copper. 
and copper weapons are found in Ireland dating from 2000 BC or even earlier. The beautiful designs of which show that the early inhabitants of the country were skilled workers in metal. Fields of copper exist all along the southern seaboard of Ireland. Numbers of flat copper celts, or axes, have been found modeled on the still earlier stone implements. By degrees, the influence of the early stone axe disappears and axes of a true metal type are developed. Primitive copper knives and awls are also abundant. The fineness of the early Irish copper work is seen at its best in the numerous copper halberd blades found in Ireland. These blades, varying from 9 to 16 inches in length, were fastened at right angles by rivets into wooden shafts. The blades show a slight sickle-like curve and are of the highest workmanship. Halberds somewhat similar in type have been found in Spain, North Germany, and Scandinavia. Between the years 2000 and 1800 BC, the primitive metalworkers discovered that bronze, a mixture of tin and copper, was a more suitable metal than pure copper for the manufacture of weapons. And the first period of the Bronze Age may be dated from 1800 to 1500 BC. The bronze celts at first differed little from those made of copper. But gradually the type developed from the plain wedge-shaped celt to the beautiful socketed celt, which appears on the scene in the last or fifth division of the Bronze Age, 1900 to 350 BC. It was during the Age of Bronze that spears came into general use, as did the sword and rapier. The early spearheads were simply knife-shaped bronze weapons riveted to the ends of shafts. But by degrees, the graceful socketed spearheads of the late Bronze Age were developed. Stone molds for casting the early forms of weapons have been found. But as the art of metalworking became perfected, the use of sand molds was discovered, with the result that there are no extant examples of molds for casting the more developed forms of weapons. The bronze weapons, celts, swords, and spearheads are often highly decorated. In these decorations can be traced the connection between the early Irish civilization and that of the Eastern Mediterranean. The Bronze Age civilization in Europe spread westward from the Eastern Mediterranean either by the southern route of Italy, Spain, France, and thence to Ireland, or, as seems more probable, up the River Danube than down the Elbe. And so to Scandinavia, whence traders by the north of Scotland introduced the motives and patterns of the Aegean into Ireland. Whichever way the Eastern civilization penetrated into Ireland, it left England practically untouched in her primitive barbarity. Of gold work, for which Ireland is especially famous, the principal feature in the Bronze Age was the lanula, a crescent-shaped flat gold ornament generally decorated at the ends of the crescent. These lunulae are found in profusion all over Ireland. A few have been found in Cornwall and Brittany and a few in Scotland and Denmark. One has been found in Luxembourg and one in Hanover. Gold collars are numerous in Ireland and also date from the Bronze Age. The earliest form of collar is the torque of twisted gold. Another type, later in date than the torque, is the gold ring-shaped collar. Two splendid examples of this latter type were found at Clonmasnoy, the decoration of which in La Tene, or Trumpet, pattern shows the connection between the Irish and the continental designs. A find of prehistoric gold ornaments in County Clare should be mentioned. An immense number was there discovered in 1854, hidden together in a cyst, the value of the whole being estimated over 3,000 lira. After the Bronze Age comes the Iron Age. The introduction of iron wrought a great change in metalworking, but as iron is a metal very subject to oxidization, Comparatively few iron remains are found. There are some swords of an early pattern in the National Museum at Dublin. It has been shown that the pre-Christian metalwork of Ireland is well worthy of attention, but it is to the early Christian metalworkers that Ireland owes her preeminent fame in this field. In early Christian Ireland, metalworking was brought to a pitch rarely equaled and never excelled. The remains found, such as the Tara Brooch, the Cross of Kong, and the Ardai Chalice are among the most beautiful metalwork in the world. The wonderful interlaced patterns, which are typically Celtic, bewildering in their intricacy, 
and fascinating in the freedom and boldness of their execution, lend themselves readily to metalwork. The connecting link between the metalwork of the late pagan period and that of early Christian times is cheaply exemplified by the penannular brooches, of which great numbers have been found in Ireland. Examples of this characteristically Celtic ornament may be seen in all Celtic countries. In its earliest form, this brooch is simply a ring with a gap in it, to which a pin is loosely attached by a smaller ring. Gradually, the open ends of the ring, which need some enlargement in order to prevent the pin slipping off, became larger and ornamented. In time, these became regular trumpet-shaped ends, generally ornamented with characteristic trumpet patterns. The next stage was to close the gap, leaving a ring with a crescent-shaped disc at one side. Space does not permit of the description of the numerous brooches found. It will be sufficient to describe the terra brooch, which is the crowning glory not only of the Irish, but of any metal worker's art. The terra brooch, whose only connection with terra is its name, was found near Drogheda. It is about 7 inches in diameter and the pin about 15 inches long. It is made of bronze covered with the most elaborate interlaced ornament in gold. The finesse of the interlaced work may be compared with, and is quite equal to, that of the best illuminated manuscripts. The freedom of its execution is amazing. Besides panels of ribbon ornament, which include spirals, plated work, human heads, and animal forms, the front of the brooch is decorated with enamel and settings of amber and colored glass. The back of the brooch is, as is often the case in Irish work, decorated in a bolder manner than the front and the trumpet pattern is there very marked. The head of the pin is also elaborately decorated. The minute and intricate style of the work is strikingly shown by the fact that, even after prolonged study, some patterns escaped notice and have only lately been discovered. Further, each of the gold lines is made of tiny gold balls, so small as only to be seen by means of a magnifying glass. With the introduction of Christianity, the attention of artificers, was turned to the manufacture of church vessels and shrines. Of these, perhaps the most beautiful are the Arg Chalice and the Cross of Kong and the Shrine of St. Patrick's Bell. Though great numbers are other sacred ornaments, such as the Shrine at St. Lecton's Arm and the numerous Bell Shrines, are also fine examples of the work of an unsurpassed school of metal workers. The date of the Tower of Brooch is not easy to determine, but it may probably be placed in the 8th century of our era. The Arde Chalice belongs probably to about the same date. It was found in a rath at Arde, County Limerick, in 1868. It measures 7 inches in height and 9.5 inches diameter. Around the cup is a band of fine filigree interlaced ornament in the form of panels divided by half beads of enamel. Below this are the names of the twelve apostles in faint Celtic lettering. The two handles are beautifully decorated with panels of interwoven ornament, and on the sides are two circular discs divided into ornamented panels. The underside of the foot of the chalice is also very beautifully decorated. The shrines of the bells of the Irish saints are interesting examples of Irish metalwork. As is fitting, the finest of these is the shrine of St. Patrick's Bell. This was made by order of King Domnall O'Loughlin between the years 1091 and 1,105 to contain St. Patrick's Bell, a square iron bell made of two plates of sheet iron riveted together. The shrine is made of bronze plates, to which gold filigree work and stones are riveted. The top of the shrine, curved to receive the handle of the bell, is of silver, elaborately decorated. The back is overlaid with a plate of silver cut in cruciform pattern. Around the margin of the back is engraved the following inscription in Irish. A prayer for Domnall Yulachlan, by whom this bell, shrine, was made, and for Domnall, successor of Patrick, by whom it was made, and for Cathalin, U Malakalin, the keeper of the bell, and for Kudeligs, U Imanon, with his sons who fashioned it. The whole is executed in a very fine manner and is the most beautiful object of its kind in existence. Another beautiful shrine, known as the Cross of Kong, made to enshrine a piece of the true cross presented by the Pope in 1123, was made for King Turlough O'Connor at about that date. 
It is two feet six inches high and one foot six and three quarter inches wide. It is made of oak cased with copper and enriched with ornaments of gilded bronze. The ornamentation is of the typical Irish type, as on the Arda, Chalice, and the Shrine of St. Patrick's Bell. A quartz crystal set in the center of the front of the cross probably held the relic. It is clear from the succession of beautiful work executed from the 8th to the 12th century that there must have existed in Ireland during that period a school of workers in metal such as has seldom been equaled by any individual worker or guild before or since, and never excelled. The examples described are only of the more famous of the remains of, I of early Irish Christian art in metal, but they are surrounded by numerous examples of pins, brooches, and shrines, each worthy to rank with the finest productions of the metal worker. The shrine of St. Modic, date uncertain, ought perhaps to be mentioned. On it are found several figures, including three nuns, men with books, scepters, and swords, and a lifelike figure of a harper. Besides articles of ornament, articles of use, such as bits for horses and household utensils, have been found, which show that the Irish smiths were as well able to produce articles for everyday use as the artificers were to create works of art in metal. With the landing of the English in 1169, the arts and sciences in Ireland declined. Indeed, from that time on and for long afterwards, almost the only metal workers needed were makers of arms and weapons of offense and defense. Irish Manuscripts by Lewis Eli O'Carroll, B.A., B.L. In the dark ages of Europe, whilst new civilizations were in the making and all was unrest, art and religion, like the lamp of the sanctuary, burned brightly and steadily in Ireland, and their rays penetrated the outer gloom. Scattered through the libraries of Europe are the priceless manuscripts limbed by Irish scribes. The earliest missionaries to the continent, disciples of St. Columbanus and St. Gall, doubtless brought with them into exile beautiful books, which they or their brothers of the parent monastery had wrought in a labor of love, or mayhap many a monk crossed the seas, bearing the treasured volumes into hiding from the spoiling hands of the Dane. Yet, fortunately, in the island home where their beauty was born, the most superb volumes still remain. From almost prehistoric times, the Irish were skilled artificers in gold and bronze, and, at the advent of Christianity, had already evolved and perfected that unique system of geometrical ornament which is known as Celtic design. The original and essential features of this system consisted in the use of spirals and interlacing strap work. But later on, this type was developed by transforming the geometrical fret into a scheme of imaginary or nondescript animals, portions of which, such as the tails and ears, were prolonged and woven in exquisite fancy through the border. The artistic features of Celtic book decoration consist chiefly of initial letters of this nature embellished with color. Amongst the ancient Irish, there was a keen knowledge of color and an exceptional appreciation of color values. Thus it was that in the early centuries of Christian Ireland, the learned monks, transcribing the Gospels and longing to make the book beautiful, were able to bring to their task an artistic skill which was hereditary and almost instinctive. The colors which they used were mostly derived from mineral substances, and the black was carbon, made, it is conjectured, from charred fish bones. But with them was combined some gummy material, which made them cling softly to the vellum, and has held for us their luster for more than a thousand years. It is noteworthy that neither gold nor silver was used for book decoration, and this would appear to be a deliberate avoidance of the glitter and glare which distinguish Eastern art. The Book of Duro, 
in the library of Trinity College, Dublin, is the oldest specimen of Celtic illumination and, if not the work of St. Columcill, is certainly of as early a date. Each of the Gospels opens with a beautiful initial, succeeded by letters of gradually diminishing size, and there are full-page decorations embodying such subjects as the symbols of the evangelists. The colors are rich and vivid, and all the designs are of the purest and most Celtic character. The Gospels of MacRegal, now in the Bodleian Library, Oxford, is the work of an abbot of Burr, who died A.D. 820. It is a volume of unusually large size, copiously ornamented with masterly designs and containing illuminated portraits of Saints Mark, Luke, and John. The first part of the book with the portrait of St. Matthew is missing. The Book of Kells, in the library of TCD, is the all-surpassing masterpiece of Celtic illuminative art and is acknowledged to be the most beautiful book in the world. This copy of the Four Gospels was long deemed to have been made by the saintly hands of Columcill though it probably belongs to the 8th century. Into its pages are woven such a wealth of ornament, such an ecstasy of art, and such a miracle of design that the book is today not only one of Ireland's greatest glories, but one of the world's wonders. After twelve centuries, the ink is as black and lustrous, and the colors are as fresh and soft as though but the work of yesterday. The whole range of colors is there, green, blue, crimson, scarlet, yellow, purple, violet, and the same color is at times varied in tone and depth and shade, thereby achieving a more exquisite combination and effect. In addition to the numerous decorative pages and marvelous initials, there are portraits of the evangelists and full-page miniatures of the temptation of Christ his seizure by the Jews, and the Madonna and child surrounded by angels with censers. Exceptionally beautiful are these angels and other angelic figures throughout the book, their wings shining with glowing colors amid woven patterns of graceful design. The portraits and miniatures and the numerous faces centered in initial letters are not to be adjudged by the standard of anatomical drawing and delineation of the human figure, but rather by their effect as part of a scheme of ornamentation. For the Celtic illuminator was imaginative rather than realistic, and aimed altogether at achieving beauty by means of color and design. The Book of Kells is the mecca of the illuminative artist, but it is the despair of the copyist. The patience and skill of the olden scribe have baffled the imitator, for, on an examination with a magnifying glass, it has been found that, in a space of a quarter of an inch, there are no fewer than a hundred and fifty-eight interlacements of a ribbon pattern of white lines edged by black ones on a black ground. Surely this is the manuscript which was shown to Geraldus Cambrensis towards the close of the twelfth century, and of whose illuminations he speaks with glowing enthusiasm. They were, he says, supposed to have been produced by the direction of an angel at the prayer of St. Bridget. The Gospels of Macdernan, now in the Archbishop's Library at Lambeth, is a small and beautiful volume which was executed by an abbot of Armagh, who died in the year 891. A full-page picture of the evangelist precedes each gospel, and a composite border frames each miniature in a bewildering pattern of intertwining strapwork and wonderful designs of imaginary beasts. Ornamental capitals and rich borders give a special beauty to the initial pages of the Gospels. The Book of Armagh, in the library of TCD, was carefully guarded and specially venerated through the ages in the erroneous belief that it was, in part, the handiwork of St. Patrick. It was written about the year 800 
and would appear to have been copied from documents actually written by the patron saint of Ireland. The book is exceptionally interesting by reason of the fact that it contains St. Patrick's Confession, that beautiful story of how he found his mission, how the captive grew to love his captors, and how, after his escape, he came back to them bearing the lamp of holy faith. Although the ornamentation of the manuscript is infrequent, there are occasional beautiful examples which compare in richness with those in the Book of Kells. The Liber Hymnorum, in the Franciscan Monastery, Dublin, contains a number of hymns associated with the names of Irish saints. The ornamentation consists of colored initials, designed with a striking use of fanciful animal figures, interlaced and twined with delightful freedom around the main structural body. The Garland of Howth and the Stowe Missal, both in Trinity College Library, belong to the 8th century and are beautiful examples of early illuminative art. The former, which is very incomplete, has only two ornamental pages left, each containing figure representations inserted in the decorative work. The Gospels of St. Chad, in the Cathedral Library at Litchfield, and the Gospels of Lindisfarne, which are the glory of the British Museum, form striking examples of the influence of Celtic art. St. Chad was educated in Ireland in the school of St. Finian, where he acquired his training in book decoration. The Gospels of Lindisfarne were produced by the monks of Iona, where St. Columcill founded his great school of religion, art, and learning. This latter manuscript is second only to the Book of Kells in its glory of illuminative design, and from its distinctive scheme of colors, the tones of which are light and bright and gay, it forms a contrast to the quieter shades and the solemn dignity of the more famous volume. The Book of the Dun Cow, the Book of Leinster, and the other great manuscripts of the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries are interesting as literature rather than as art, for they tell the history of ancient Erin and have garnered her olden legends and romantic tales. It is only the Gospels and other manuscripts of religious subjects that are illuminated. In the apparel of the ancient Irish, the number of colors marked the social rank. The king might wear seven colors, poets and learned men six. Five colors were permitted in the clothes of chieftains, and thus grading down to the servant who might wear but one. All this the scribe knew well. We can picture the humble servant of God, clad in a coarse robe of a single color, deep in his chosen labor of recording the life and teachings of his master, and striving to endow this record with the glory of the seven colors which were rightly due to a king alone. As we gaze on his work today, its beauty is instinct with life, and the patient love that gave it birth seems to cling to it still. The white magic of the artist's holy hands has bridged the span of a thousand years. The Ruins of Ireland by Francis Joseph Bigger, M.R.I.A. The Ruins of Ireland are her proudest monuments. They stand as a lasting revelation to all mankind a distinct and definite proclamation that the Irish people, century after century, were able to raise and adorn some of the finest buildings in stone that Western civilization has seen or known. It is recognized the world over that Irish art has a beauty and distinction all its own, in its own Irish setting unrivaled, throned in its own land in its own natural surroundings. The shrines and gospels, the reliquaries and missals, the crosses and bells that are still existent, many in Ireland, others in every country in the world, attest beyond any dispute that Irish art workers held a preeminent place in the early Middle Ages and that works of Irish art are still treasured as unique in their day and time. 
No country has been plundered and desolated, as Ireland has been. Dane, Norman, English, each in turn swept across the fair face of Ireland, carrying destruction in their train. Yet with all Ireland has her art treasures, and her ruins, that bear favorable comparison with those of other civilizations. In Dublin, and in many private Irish collections, can be found handwritten books of parchment, illuminated with glowing colors that time has scarce affected, or the years caused to fade. On one page alone of the Book of Kells, ornament and writing can be seen penned and painted in lines too numerous even to count. They are there by the thousand. A magnifying glass is required to reveal even a fragment of them. Ireland produced these in endless number. Every great library or collection in Europe possesses one or more examples. As with books, so with reliquaries, crosses, and bells. When the island of saints and scholars could produce books, it could make shrines, and everything necessary to stimulate and hand down the piety and the patient skill of a people steeped in art craft and religious feeling. What they could do on parchment, like the Book of Kells and Duro, what they could produce in bronze and precious metals, like the Cross of Kong, the Shrine of St. Patrick's Bell, the Tara Brooch, and the Chalice of Arda, not to write of the numberless bronze and gold articles of an age centuries long preceding their production. They could certainly vie with in stone. Of this earlier work a word must go down. In Ireland, still at the present day, after all the years of plunder she has undergone, more ancient gold art treasures remain than in any other country, museum, or collection, most of them pre-Christian, and what the other countries do possess are largely Irish or of Celtic origin. We must have this borne into the minds of every one of Irish birth or origin, that this great treasure was battered into shape by Irish hands on Irish anvils designed in Irish studios, ornamented with Irish skill for Irish use. With such workmen having such instincts and training, what of the housing and surroundings to contain them and give them a fit and suitable setting? The earliest stone structures in Ireland still remaining are the great stone castles or circular walls enclosing large spaces walls of great thickness, unmortared, in which there are vast quantities of masonry. Around their summits a chariot might be driven, inside their spaces horse races might be run. As a few examples, there are Stagg and Kerry, Dun Angus and Arran, off Galway, Aelach above the walls of Derry. Of the earliest churches, Cyclopean in construction and primitive in character, built of stone, with thick sloping walls from foundation to ridge, Gallera still remains, and the Skelligs, those wondrous sea-girt rocks, preserve both church and cell almost perfect. There are many other examples, some of a later date, such as Temple Cronin and Megara and Banagher in Derry, St. Finnan's Oratory in County Cork, St. Fashines at Four, and St. Malay's at Devonish. From the 7th, 8th, and ninth centuries, there are innumerable examples of oratories, some with stone roofs, others with roofs not so permanent, but all having the common features of an altar window facing the east, through which the sun fell at the beginning of the day, to tell the early missioner that his hour of devotion had arrived and a west door, through which the rays of the declining sun fell across the altar steps, speaking of a day that was closing. A south window was added close to the east end, and it, too, was a sundial. It told the hour of Angelus, the midday, when the bell was rung and a calm reverence fell on all within its hearing. Such churches can still be seen at Erin and Innismurray, on the islands of Lac Derg, Lac Ree, and in many other places. 
A few years later, these oratories were too small for the growing faith, and larger churches were built, some using the older structure as chancels. Where the west door was built, a circular arch was made, and the new and old united. This can well be seen at Innes Nagoyle and Lac Corrib, on the Aran Islands off Galway, at Glendalac, at Innes Claron in Lac Ree, at Clonmacnoy at Innes Cultra, and on many another island and promontory of the south and west. During this time and after, we find the most elaborate carvings on door and arch and window, equal in skill to what is found in book or metalwork. It must have been at this time that the Gauls, or strangers, first invaded Ireland, bearing havoc in their train, for then it was that the clock take, or round towers, were built. It is now admitted by all Irish authorities of any repute, and that beyond dispute, that the round towers, the glory of Ireland, were built by Irish people as Christian monuments from which the bells might be rung, and as places of strength for the preservation of the valued articles used in Christian worship. Here they might be safely stored. They were also used for the preservation of life in case of sudden attack and onslaught by unexpected enemies. All the towers are on ecclesiastical sites. Many are incorporated in church buildings, such as those of Glendalach, Kenwicklow, and Clonmacnoy on the Shannon. The records of the construction of some of them in the 10th and 11th centuries are still extant, and this is conclusive. There are today about 70 round towers in Ireland, and many have been destroyed. The pillar towers of Ireland, how wondrously they stand, by the lakes and rushing rivers, through the valleys of our land. In mystic file through the isle they lift their heads sublime, these grey old pillar temples, these conquerors of time. Here was placed the holy chalice that held the sacred wine, and the gold cross from the altar, and the relics from the shrine, and the meter shining brighter with its diamonds than the east, and the crozier of the pontiff, and the vestments of the priest. D. F. McCarthy this was the time when the high crosses of Ireland were carved and set up. They vie with the round towers in interest and in the display of skill. What the towers have in perfection, masonry and construction, the crosses have in artistic carving and symbolic design. No two crosses are alike. They are as varied as the clouds in an Irish sky, or the pebbles on the beach, or the flowers in a garden. They were carved in reverence by those who knew and esteemed their art, and lavished all their skill and knowledge on what they most valued and treasured. They were not set up as grave marks merely. Theirs was a higher and loftier mission. They were raised in places where some great event or period was to be commemorated. They were erected where some early disciple of the cross could stand beside one of them, and from any panel could tell the foundation of the faith, for there in stone was story after story, from the Old Testament and the New, that gave him his text, and so, as at the cross of the scriptures at Clonmacnoy, a missioner could preach on every recurring holy day from Christmas to Christmas, with ever his text in stone before him. Many a broken and mutilated cross has been set up in Ireland in recent years, proving that the heart of the Gael, no matter how rent and broken, is still inclined to bind up the broken wounds of her past glories. With the religious orders there came to Ireland a widespread desire to add something to the older sanctuaries of the Gael, to widen their borders and strengthen their cords, and so the abbeys were founded. Here and there we find them still, by winding rivers, on rich meadows, in glens and glades, by the sea margin, or on the slopes of the rugged mountain. Their crumbling walls and broken windows can still be traced. Their towers are still to be seen over treetops and in the centre of many a slumbering town. By the shores of Donegal Bay, the old Franciscan house, 
where the four masters compiled what is perhaps the most remarkable record possessed by any nation, is still clothed in ivy. At Kilconnell, in Galway, their old place is almost as they left it, but roofless, with the tears of the friars upon the altar steps. Clare Galway has a tower worth travelling half a continent to see, by the Boniette River at Drumahair, on the banks of Loch Gill are the mason marks of the cloister builders, and the figure of St. Francis talking to the birds is still there. The abbey is roofless and empty, and so the birds of the air are his constant companions. Space forbids, or endless abbeys might be described, the black abbey at Kilkenny, with its long row of butler effigies, or the cathedral of St. Canis, still perfect, with its soaring round tower beside it, or the mystical seven-light window of the Franciscan friary by the Nore, with the old mill wares running free to this day. How long could we ponder by the east window of Kilcooley, with tracery like a spider's web, and listen to the mystical bells, or gaze at the beautiful oriel at Fina, or stand at Jerpoint, with its spacious cloisters and stone groin choir, with St. Christopher and Irish marble beside us. Cashel, one of the wonders of the world, grows up suddenly into sight on a high rock rising from level land crowned with buildings. A great abbey dominates. Beside it clings that carved gem of a stone-roofed church, Cormac's Chapel. Round tower and cross are there, and many a sculptured tomb. Not far from Cashel is the Abbey of Holy Cross, with its lovely metered windows, shadowed in the river passing at its feet. The circular pillars and arches of Boyle Abbey are splendidly proportioned, whilst the cloisters of Sligo display in their long shadowy recesses and ornamented pillars great dignity and beauty. The windows and monuments of Ennis Friary, founded by the O'Briens, are of unusual interest, the carving of figure subjects being equal to the best of their age. We have Thomas Town and Callan, Dunbrody and Tintern, all having an individual charm and interest that not only dim the eye and make the blood course freely in every one of Irish stock when he looks upon what is and thinks of what was, but even in the coldest light give food for thought to every one desirous of knowing something of the growth and civilization of a great people. Of the many castles and stout Irish strongholds, it is hard to write in such a short paper as this. Those on the Boyne, such as Trim, for strong building and extent, excel in many ways. Carlingford, Carrickfergus, and Dunluce have by their size and picturesque situations ever appealed to visitors. They are each built on rocks, jutting into the sea, Dunluce on a great perpendicular height, the Atlantic dashing below. Dunamace near Maryborough, in the O'More country, appears like Cashel, but is entirely military. The famed walled cities of Kells in Kilkenny and Four in Westmeath are remarkable. Each has an abbey, many towers, gates, and stout bastions. The great keeps of the Midland Lords, the towers of Grenal on the west coast, and the traders' towers on the east coast, especially those of Down, afford ample material for a study of the early colonizing efforts of different invaders as well as providing incidents of heroism and romance. These square battlemented towers can be seen here and there in every district. Every portion of Ireland has its ruins, earthworks, stone forts, prehistoric monuments, circular stone huts, early churches, abbeys, crosses, round towers, castles of every size and shape are to be found in every county, some one in every parish, all over Ireland. It is almost invidious to name any in particular, where the number is so great. Modern Irish Art by D. J. O'Donoghue 
Librarian, University College, Dublin. It would be difficult to dispute, in view of her innumerable and excellent artists, that there has always been, in modern times, an art consciousness in Ireland, but it is impossible to assert that there has been any artistic unity in her people. She has produced no school, but merely a great number of brilliant painters, sculptors, and engravers, chiefly for export. With all our acknowledged artistic capacity, we have not, except in one notable instance, produced a cumulative art effect. The history of Irish art is almost uniformly a depressing narrative. During a comparatively brief period in the eighteenth century, significantly enough, it was while the country enjoyed a short spell of national life. There was something like a national patronage of the artist, and the result is visible in the noble public buildings and beautiful houses of the Irish capital, with their universally admired mantelpieces, doors, ceilings, fanlights, ironwork, and carvings. In short, while Ireland had even a partly unfettered control of her own concerns, the arts were generously encouraged by her government and by the wealthy individual. When other European capitals were mere congeries of rookeries, Dublin, the centre of Irish political life, possessed splendid streets, grandly planned, but there was little solidarity among the artistic fraternity. Various associations of artists were formed, which held together fairly well, until the flight of the resident town gentry after the Union, and many admirable artists were trained in the schools of the Royal Dublin Society. But, since the opening of the nineteenth century, there has been almost no visible art effort in Dublin. True, there have been many fine artists who have made a struggle to fix themselves in Dublin, but, as with the Royal Hibernian Academy, of which the best of them were members, the struggle has been a painful agony. Usually the artists migrated to London to join the large group of Irishmen working there. A few others went to America and obtained an honoured place in her art annals. Those who went to England secured in many cases the highest rewards of the profession. Several, like Barry, Hone, Barrett, and Coates, were founders or early members of the Royal Academy. One, Sir Martin Shee, became its president. Nevertheless, many distinguished artists remained in Dublin, where the arts of portrait painting and engraving were carried to a high pitch of excellence. This record must necessarily be of a chronological character, and can only take note of those whose works have actual value and interest, historical or other. Edward Luttrell, 1650-1710, did some excellent work in Cran or Pastel, while Garrett Murphy, flourished 1650-1716, Stephen Slaughter, died 1765, Francis Bindon died 1765, and James Latham, 1696 to 1747, have each left us notable portraits of the great Irish personages of their day. To fellow countrymen in London, Charles Jervis, 1675 to 1739, Thomas Hickey died 1816, and Francis Coates, R.A., 1725-1770. We owe presentments of other famous people. George Barrett, R.A., 1728-1784, one of the greatest landscapists of his time. Nathaniel Hone, R.A., 1718-1784 an eccentric but gifted painter, with an individuality displayed in all his portraits. James Barry, R.A., 1741-1806, still more eccentric, 
with grand conceptions imperfectly carried out in his great historical and allegorical pictures. These, with Henry Tresham, R.A., 1749 to 1814, and Matthew Peters, R.A., 1742 to 1814, historical painters of considerable merit, upheld the Irish claim to a high place in English 18th century art. A little later, miniaturists such as Horace Hone, A.R.A., 1756 to 1825, George Tinnery, 1774 to 1852, and Adam Buck, 1759 to 1844, also worked with remarkable success in London. Among resident Irish artists, the highest praise can be given to the miniature painters, John Comerford, 1770 to 1832, and Charles Robertson, 1760 to 1821 and to the portrait painters, Robert Hunter, flourished 1750 to 1803, and especially Hugh Douglas Hamilton, 1739 to 1808, of whose work Ireland possesses many distinguished examples. Some day Hamilton's pictures will appeal to a far wider public than his countrymen can provide. One must omit the names of many clever Irish artists, like the Wests, Francis and Robert, who were the most successful teachers of perhaps any time in Ireland, and come at once to that branch of art in which Ireland stands second to none, mezzotint engraving. One of the earliest engravers in this style was Edward Luttrell, already named as a painter, but it was John Brooks, flourished 1730 to 1756, who was justly considered the real founder of that remarkable group of Irish engravers, whose work may be more correctly described as belonging to a school than any other of the period. For many years in Dublin, and afterwards in London, a succession of first-rate artists of Irish birth produced work which remains and always must remain one of the glories of Ireland. Limits of space allow only the bare mention of the names of James McArdle, 1728 to 1765, Charles Spooner, died 1767, Thomas Beard, flourished 1728, Thomas Fry, 1710 to 1762, Edward Fisher, 1722 to 1785, Michael Ford, died 1765, John Dixon, 1740 to 1811, Richard Purcell, flourished 1746 to 1766, Richard Houston, 1721 to 1775, John Murphy, 1748 to 1820, Thomas Burke, 1749 to 1815, Charles Eckshaw, flourished 1747 to 1771, and Luke Sullivan, 1705 to 1771, artists of whom any country might be proud, and whose works have in most cases outlasted the remembrance of the persons whose likenesses they sought to reproduce. Separate monographs might be justifiably written on most of the gifted artists here enumerated, and one can only regret not being able, in short space, to compare and estimate their various qualities. Thomas Chambers, A.R.A., 1724-1784, William Nelson Gardner, 1766-1814, James Egan, 1799 to 1842, and William Humphreys, 1794 to 1865, are other Irish engravers who cannot be overlooked in a survey of the art of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Contemporaneously, with the remarkable development of the art of engraving, arose a group of Irish architects. Rather earlier in point of time, was Sir Edward Lovat Pierce, died 1733, who was one of the chief architects of the Irish Parliament House, 
and Thomas Berg died 1730, to whom we owe the library of Trinity College, Dublin. But Thomas Cooley, 1740 to 1784, designer of the handsome royal exchange of that city. Richard Castle died 1751, a foreigner who settled in Ireland and built a number of beautiful Irish residences. Francis Johnston, 1761 to 1829, an excellent architect whose chief claim to remembrance, however, is as founder of the Royal Hibernian Academy. And, above all, James Gandon, 1743 to 1823, whose superb custom house, four courts, and part of the Irish Parliament House will perpetuate his name in Dublin while that city lasts. Each helped to make the capital, even in its decay, one of the most interesting in Europe. Nor should we forget Thomas Ivory, died 1786, whose foundling hospital is another of Dublin's many graceful edifices, nor Sir Richard Morrison, 1767 to 1849, and his son William, 1794 to 1838, much of whose work remains to testify to their skill and ingenuity. Ecclesiastical architecture in Ireland is indebted to Patrick Byrne, flourished 1840. James J. McCarthy, died 1882. J. B. Keane, died 1859. And James Murray, 1831 to 1863, for many well-designed churches and chapels throughout Ireland. But the great names in modern Irish architecture are those of Benjamin Woodward, 1815 to 1861, whose premature death was a serious loss to Irish art. Sir Thomas Dean, 1792 to 1871, and his son, Sir Thomas Newenham Dean, 1828 to 1899. The elder Dean was, with Woodward, the architect of the Oxford Museum and of the splendid engineering hall of Trinity College, Dublin, buildings which have elicited enthusiastic praise from John Ruskin and other eminent critics. Deserving of respectful mention, too, to come down to our own days, are Sir Thomas Drew, 1838-1910, and William H. Lynn, who is still living. In sculpture, again, Ireland has done memorable work. In the 18th century she gave us admirable craftsmen, like Edward Smith, 1749-1812, John Hickey, 1756 to 1795, and Christopher Hewitson, flourished 1772 to 1794, whose dignified monument of Bishop Baldwin is one of the most distinguished pieces of sculpture in Trinity College, Dublin. But it was not till the appearance of a later group of sculptors, including John Hogan, 1800 to 1858, John Edward Carew, 1785 to 1868, John Henry Foley, R.A., 1818 to 1874, and Patrick McDowell, R.A., 1799 to 1870, that Irish sculpture obtained more than local renown. Fortunately, most of the best work of Hogan and Foley remains in Ireland. That of Carew and McDowell is chiefly to be found in the Houses of Parliament and other institutions in London. The incomparable Goldsmith, Burke, Grattan, and other statues by Foley, together with an almost complete collection of casts of his other works, are in his native country. Hogan is represented in Dublin by his Thomas Davis and his Dead Christ, to name but two of his principal works. The names, at least, of James Heffernan, 1785 to 1847, of John Edward Jones, 1806 to 1872, of Terence Farrell, 1798 to 1876, of Samuel F. Lynn, 1834 to 1876, and perhaps of Christopher Moore, 1790 to 1863, an excellent sculptor of busts, may be set down here. Sir Thomas Farrell, 1827 to 1900, and the living sculptors, John Hughes, Oliver Shepherd, 
and Albert Bruce Joy are responsible for some of the more admirable of the public monuments of Dublin. It is much to be deplored that of the work of one of the greatest of Dublin-born artists, Augustus St. Gaudens, we have only one example, the statue of Parnell. Ireland may surely claim him as one of her most gifted sons, and perhaps a word might be said in this place of some of the other Irishmen who made their home in America, of Hoban the architect, who designed the White House at Washington, modeling it after Leinster House in Dublin, of painters like Charles Ingham, W. G. Wall, William McGrath, the Morans, James Hamilton, and Thomas Hovenden, and of sculptors like John Donahue, John Flanagan, Andrew O'Connor, John F. Kelly, Jerome Connor, John J. Boyle, and Martin Milmore, but they belong rather to the history of American art than to that of Ireland. Before leaving the subject of Irish sculpture, the work of the medalists, an allied branch of the art in which Irishmen did much valued work, should not be overlooked. The medals of William Mossop, 1751 to 1805, of his son, William Stephen Mossop, 1788 to 1827, and of John Woodhouse, 1835 to 1892, to mention only three of its chief representatives in Ireland, are greatly prized by collectors. Most modern Irish art of high importance has been largely produced out of Ireland, which has been perforce abandoned by those artists who have learned how little encouragement is to be met with at home. One can blame neither the artist nor the Irish public for this unfortunate result. There is sufficient reason in the political and economic condition of Ireland since the Union to explain the fact but for this cause men like Daniel MacLeese, R.A., 1806-1870, William Mulready, R.A., 1786-1863, Francis Danby, A.R.A., 1793-1861, and Alfred Elmore, R.A., 1815-1881, might have endeavored to emulate the spirit of James O'Connor, 1792 to 1841, the landscapist, Richard Rothwell, 1800 to 1868, a charming subject painter, and Sir Frederick W. Burton, 1816 to 1900, one of the most distinguished artists of his time, who at least spent some of their active working career in their native land. The same words apply to artists who succeeded in other branches of the profession, men like John Doyle, 1797-1868, a caricaturist, with all the power without the coarseness of his predecessors, his son, Richard Doyle, 1824-1883, a refined and delicate artist, John Leach, 1817-1864, the humorist, a member of an Irish Catholic family, Paul Gray, 1842 to 1866, who died before his powers had fully matured, and Matthew James Lawless, 1837 to 1864, who also died too early. William Collins, R.A., 1788 to 1847, and Clarkston Stanfield, R.A., 1793 to 1867, both eminent representatives of English art, though of Irish extraction, more properly belong to England than to Ireland. Not discouraged by the melancholy history of many gifted Irish artists, Ireland still produces men who are not unworthy of association with the best who have gone before. Our most recent losses have been heavy, notably those of Walter F. Osborne, 1859-1903, to and Patrick Vincent Duffy, 1832 to 1909, but we still have artists of genius in the persons of Nathaniel Hone, a direct descendant of his famous namesake, John Butler Yeats, John Lavery, A.R.A., and William Orpin, A.R.A. Many other names might be given, but already this attempt at a survey suffers by its enumeration of artists 
who, however, could hardly be neglected in such a record. Crowded as the list may be, it is a careful selection, and it demonstrates that, notwithstanding all the disadvantages under which Ireland suffers, the country has an almost unlimited capacity for fine achievement, and that, with prosperity and contentment, she may be expected to rival the most illustrious of art centers. It is only within living memory that any attempt has been made to direct the known artistic skill of the Irish people to industrial effort, but the remarkable success achieved in the modern designs for Irish lace in the English art competitions is an instance of what might be done generally in the applied art though they are in their infancy the new carpet and stained glass industries in ireland also hold out considerable hope for the future but one can only barely indicate what has been and might be done in the furtherance of irish art if we only had under one roof a judiciously made collection of all the best work done by Irish artists of all styles and periods, it would more eloquently justify our claim than endless columns of praise. Ireland at Play by Thomas E. Healy, Editor of Sport, Dublin On the face of the earth there is no nation in which the love of clean and wholesome sport is more strongly developed than in the Irish. Against us it cannot be urged that we take our pleasures sadly. We enter into them with entire self-abandon, wholehearted enthusiasm, and genuine exuberance of spirit. There is nothing counterfeit about the Irishman in his play. His one keen desire is to win, be the contest what it may, and towards the achievement of that end he will strain nerve and muscle even to the point of utter exhaustion. And how the onlookers applaud at the spectacle of a desperately contested race, whether between horses, men, motor cars, bicycles, or boats, or of a match between football, hurling, or cricket teams. It matters not which horse, man, car, cycle, boat, or team is successful. The sport is the thing that counts. The strenuousness of the contest is what stimulates and evokes the rapturous applause. At such a moment it is good to be alive. Scenes similar to those hinted at may be witnessed on any sports field or racetrack in our dear little emerald isle almost any day of the year. All is good fellowship. All is the cause of sport. No one can question that in some departments of horse racing, Ireland is today supreme. The Irish devotion to the horse is of no recent growth. Everybody knows how, in the dim and distant days when King Connor, Magnessa, ruled at Emen, the war steeds of the Oltonians neighed loudly in their stalls on the first dramatic appearance of Cuchulain, Myrthamne, at the northern court. Cuchulain's own two steeds, Leoth Macha, the Roan of Macha, and Dub Sanglan, Black Sanglan, are celebrated in story and song. Never hoofs like them shall ring, rapid as the winds of spring. To read of the performances of Cuchulain, and his war horses, and his charioteer, and friend, Leg Macriangara, at the famous battle of Rosnari, and again at the last fight, between the Red Branch Knights and the forces of Queen Meta of Connacht, thus truly, in the words used by Sir Philip Sidney in another connection, stir the heart like the sound of a trumpet. As time went on, the Irish war horse became more and more famous, and always carried his rider in gallant style. Stout was the steed that best ridden by Godfrey O'Donnell at the Battle of Credan Kill, withstood the shock of lord maurice fitzgerald's desperate onslaught and by his steadiness enabled the tyrconnell chieftain to strike senseless and unhorse his fierce norman foe more celebrated still was the high-spirited animal which art mcmurrow rode in thirteen ninety nine to his ineffectual parley with king richard the second's representative 
the Earl of Gloucester. The French chronicler, who was a witness of that historic scene, tells us that a horse more exquisitely beautiful, more marvelously fleet, he had never seen. In coming down, he says, it galloped so hard that, in my opinion, I never saw a hare, deer, sheep, or any other animal. I declare to you, for a certainty, run with such speed as it did. Edmund Spencer, the poet of the Fairy Queen, writing in 1596, bears this striking testimony to the Irish horse soldier, and inferentially to the Irish horse. I have heard some great warriors say that, in all the services which they had seen abroad in foreign countries, they never saw a more comely horseman than the Irish man, nor that cometh on more bravely in his charge. The feats performed at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690 by the Irish horse soldiers under Hamilton and Berwick were really wonderful and well-nigh turned disaster into victory on that memorable day which decided the fate of nations as well as of dynasties. And surely those were fleet and stout-hearted steeds that, on August 12, 1690, carried Sarsfield and his chosen five hundred on their daredevil midnight ride from the Keeper Hills to Balaniti, where in the dim morning twilight they captured and destroyed William of Orange's wonderful siege train, and thereby heartened the defenders of beleaguered Limerick. Writing in 1809, Lawrence, in his history and delineation of the horse, said, From Ireland alone we import into England many saddle horses, as many perhaps as fifteen hundred in a year, upwards in some years. The Irish are the highest and steadiest leapers in the world. Ireland has bred some good racers, and the generality of Irish horses are, it appears, warmer tempered than our own, and to use the expression, sharper and more frigate built. It is not to be wondered at, therefore, if in such a country there developed an ardent love of the noble sport of horse racing. The Curragh of Kildare, the long-standing headquarters of the Irish Turf Club, was celebrated far back in the 18th century as the venue of some great equine contest, and to this day, with its five important fixtures every year, it still holds pride of place. There are numerous other racecourses all over the country, from Punch's Town, Leopard's Town, Phoenix Park, and Baldwell in the east to Galway in the west, and from the Maze in the north to Rebel Cork in the south. Horse racing has not inappropriately been termed the national pastime of Ireland. The number of people now giving their attention to it has called for a notable increase in the number of race meetings, and stake money is being put up on a more generous scale than at any previous time in the history of the sport. For example, the Irish Derby, run at the Carra, was in 1914 worth 2,500 pounds, and there are besides several stakes of 1,500 pounds and 1,000 pounds. The result of this forward policy is that increasing numbers come to our race meetings, and that the turf has never been more popular than it is today. Men and women of wealth and position find in the national pastime a pleasant method of employing their leisure, and in expending their surplus wealth in its pursuit, and in the raising of horses of the highest class they realize that they confer a real benefit on the country. It is, of course, now universally known that Ireland has an international reputation as a country eminently fitted for horse breeding. If proof were needed, it would be found in the extensive purchases effected by English, French, Italian, German, Russian, and American buyers at the Great Dublin Horse Show, held in August every year. Horses bought in Ireland have seldom failed to realize their promise. The English classic races and many of the principal handicaps uh, on the flat have been often won by Irish bred horses such as Galtimore, Ard Patrick, Horby, Kilwarlan, Barkledine, Umpire, Master Kildare, Kilsalagan, 
Mendigo, Philomel, The Rejected, Comedy, Winkfield's Pride, Belden, Royal Flush, Victor Wilde, Bachelor's Button, Irish Ivy, and Hackler's Pride. If only a few of the star performers are here set down, it is not from lack of means to continue, but merely from a desire to avoid the compilation of a mere string of names. In France, too, the Irish racer has made his mark. It is, however, in the four and a half miles Liverpool Grand National Steeplechase, the greatest cross-country race in the world, the supreme test of the leaper, galloper, and stayer that Irish red horses have made, perhaps, the most wonderful record. The list of winners of that great event demonstrates in an unmistakable manner that we are second to none in the art of breeding steeplechase horses. Among many other noted Irish bred winners of this race, there stand boldly forth the names of The Lamb, Empress, Woodbrook, Frigate, Come Away, Cloister, Wild Man from Borneo, and Manifesto. In fact, it is the exception when another than an Irish bred horse annexes the blue ribbon of steeplechasing. Closely allied to horse racing is fox hunting, and fox hunting, as well as the hunting of the stag and of the hare, has flourished exceedingly in Ireland for a long time past. A great deal of needed employment is one of the results. Dogs are specially bred and trained for each of these branches of sport. Irish foxhounds, staghounds, harriers, and beagles have a high reputation. More native to the soil, and so interwoven with the history of the country that is often used as one of its symbols, is the Irish wolfhound. This is probably the animal to which Aurelius Simancus, a Roman consul in Britain, referred when, writing to his brother in Ireland in A.D. 391, he acknowledged the receipt of seven Irish hounds. The wolfhound played a sinister part in the Irish history of the 18th century. For, as Davis says in his poem, The Penal Days, their dogs were taught alike to run upon the scent of wolf and friar. The Irish wolfhound is now very scarce, and a genuine specimen is a valued and highly coveted possession. The greyhound, too, figures prominently in present-day sport, and in many parts of the country are held coursing meetings, which frequently result in several spirited contests. A famous Irish greyhound was Lord Lurgan's black-and-white dog, Master McGrath. Master McGrath achieved the rare distinction of winning the Waterloo Cup three times, in 1868, 1869, and 1871. When it is remembered that the Waterloo Cup is to coursing what the Liverpool Grand National is to steeplechasing, or the Epsom Derby to flat racing, the merit of this triple performance will at once be apparent. Compared with the sports in which horse and hound participate, all other outdoor pastimes in Ireland take rather a minor place. Still, the Irishman's love of sport is diversified. Few there are who have not many inclinations, and as a nation, our taste in sport is Catholic. We take part in nearly every pastime, in many we excel. The prize ring has fallen from its high estate, nor is the intention here to try to cast any glamour over it. The subject is introduced in a passing way for the sole purpose of showing that, in what at least used to be the manly art of self-defense, Ireland in days gone by as well as at the present time has more than held her own. The most conspicuous of the representatives of her race in this department are perhaps Heenan, Ryan, Sullivan, Corbett, Marr, McAuliffe, McFarland, and McGorty. There is one other prize fighter, Dan Donnelly by name, who became a sort of national hero, of whom all Irishmen of his day were not a little proud, because he laid the English champion low, and whose performance, now haloed, by the antiquity of more than a hundred years, we may with equanimity, as without offense, contemplate, with perhaps a sigh for the good old times. The famous encounter between Donnelly and Cooper 
took place on the Kurok, and after eleven rounds of scientific boxing, Donnelly knocked his opponent over the ropes and won the world's championship for the Emerald Isle. The spot where the battle came off has ever since been known as Donnelly's Hollow, and a neat monument there erected commemorates the Dublin man's pluck and skill. A ballad recounting the incidents of the fight, and as ballads go, not badly composed, had a wonderful vogue, and was sung at fair and market and other meeting place within the memory of men who are not now more than middle-aged. A search in other domains of sport will be by no means barren of results. Take running, for instance. Who has not heard of the wondrous little Thomas Conniff from the short grass county of Kildare? Who does not know of his brilliant performances on the track? We in Ireland, who had seen him defeat Carter, the great Canadian, over the four-mile course at Ballsbridge one summer's eve, now nearly twenty golden years ago, knew his worth before he crossed the broad Atlantic to show to thousands of admiring spectators in America that Ireland was the breeder of fleet-footed sons, who lacked neither the courage nor the thews and, and sinews, nor the staying power to carry them at high speed over any distance of ground. May the earth lie light on Conniff, for in a small body he had a great heart. Then there was the mighty runner James J. Daly, a true hero from Galway, the idol of the crowd in his native land as well as in the United States. Daly was the champion long-distance cross-country runner of his day at home, and he showed before various nationalities in the greater Ireland beyond the seas that he could successfully compete with the best from all countries. In high jumping, Patrick Davin, Pete Lay, and Peter O'Connor were for long in the foremost rank. Daniel Ahern was famous for his hop, step, and jump performance. Morris Davin, Matthew McGrath, and Patrick Ryan have each, in his own day, thrown the 16-pound hammer to record distance. In shot putting, there are Sheridan, Horgan, John Flanagan, and others bearing true Irish names, who are right in front. And before their time, we had a redoubted champion in W.J. M. Barry. All previous performances in the shot putting line have, however, been recently eclipsed by Patrick J. MacDonald of the Irish American Club, who at Celtic Park, Long Island, on May 30, 1914, made a new world's record by putting the 18 pound shot 46 feet two and three-fourths inches. The climax of achievement was reached when T.F. Keeley won the all-round championship of the world at New York. The distinguished part taken by Irishmen or sons of Irishmen in all departments of the Olympic Games is so recent and so well known as to call for no comment. Ireland is far indeed from being degenerate in her athletes. In international strife, with England, Scotland, Wales, and France at rugby football, Ireland has likewise won her spurs. She has never been beaten by the representatives of Gaul, and though for long enough she had invariably to succumb in competition with the other three countries, such is not the case nowadays, nor has it been for many years past. The Irish team has ever to be reckoned with in association football, too. Ireland is coming into her own. This branch of the game has developed enormously within a comparatively few seasons. The people flock in their thousands to witness matches for the principal league contests or cup ties, but the greatest crowds of all go to see Gaelic football, the national game, and to hurling, also distinctively Irish. They foregather in serried masses. Since the Gaelic Athletic Association was founded. Both football and hurling have prospered exceedingly. They are essentially popular forms of sport, and the muscular manhood of city and country finds in them a natural outlet for their characteristic Celtic vigor. The Gaelic Association has fostered and developed these sports, and has organized them on so sound a basis that interest in them is not confined to any particular district. 
but it spreads throughout the length and breadth of Ireland. When the America Cup was to be challenged for, into the breach stepped the Earl of Dunraven and flung his gage to the holders of the trophy. This distinguished Irish nobleman furnished a contender in his Valkyrie too, in the fall of 1893, and his patriotic spirit in doing so stirred the sport-loving Irish nation to the greatest enthusiasm. His lordship was not successful, but he was not disheartened. He tried again with Valkyrie III, but again he was only second best, for, though his yacht sailed to victory in home waters, she proved unequal to the task of lifting the cup. No Englishman was prepared to tempt fortune, but not so that sterling Irishman Sir Thomas Lipton, who, win or lose, would not have it laid to the charge of Ireland that an attempt should not be made. His shamrock, shamrock two and shamrock three, surely a deep sense of patriotism prompted nomenclature such as that. Each in succession went down to defeat, but Sir Thomas has not done yet. Like King Bruce, he is going to try again, and Shamrock Four is to do battle with the best that America can range against her. All honor to Lord Dunraven and to Sir Thomas Lipton for their persistent efforts to engage in generous rivalry with the yachtsmen across the sea. Lawn tennis, cricket, and golf we play, and play well to rowing. Many of us are enthusiastically devoted, and at handball our young men, and some not so young, are signally expert. The champion handball player has always been of Irish blood. Baseball we invented, and called it rounders. It is significant that the great American ball game is still played according to a code which is scarcely modified from that which may be seen in force any summer day on an Irish school field or village green. Perhaps something of hereditary instinct is to be traced in the fact that many of the best exponents of American baseball are the bearers of fine old Irish names. This brief and cursory review of Ireland at play must now conclude. It is scarcely more than a glossary, and not a complete one at that. It may, however, serve to show that Ireland's record in sport like her record in so many other things set forth in this book, is great and glorious enough to warrant the insertion of this short chapter among those which tell of old achievements and feats of high and prize. The Fighting Race by Joseph I. C. Clarke, President, American Irish Historical Society The Fighting Race at Home War was the ruling passion of this people, says McGeoghegan, meaning the Milesians who were the last of the peoples that overran ancient Ireland up to the coming of Christ. How many races had preceded them remains an enigma of history, not profitable to examine here. But whoever they were, or in what succession they arrived, they must, like all migrating people, have been prepared to establish themselves at the point of the spear and the edge of the sword. Two races certainly were mingled in the ancient Irish, the fair or auburn-haired with blue eyes, and the dark-haired with eyes of grey or brown. The Milesians appear to have reached Ireland through Spain. They came swiftly to power, more than a thousand years before our Lord, and divided the country into four provinces or kingdoms, with an Audrey, or high king, ruling all in a loose way as to service, taxes, and allegiance. The economic life was almost entirely pastoral. Riches were counted in herds of cattle. Robustness of frame, vehemence of passion, elevated imagination, Dr. Leland says, signalized this people. Robust, they became athletic and vigorous, and excelled in the use of deadly weapons. Passionate, they easily went from litigation to blows. Imaginative, they leaned toward poetry and song, and were strong for whatever religion they practiced. The latter was a polytheism, brought close to the people through the Druids. Some stone weapons were doubtless still used. 
They had also brazen or bronze swords, and spears, axes, and maces of various alloys of copper and tin. Socially they remained tribal. Heads of tribes were petty kings, each with his stronghold of a primitive character, each with his tribal warriors, bards, harpers, and druids, and the whole male population, more or less, ready to take part in war. The great heroes whose names have come down to us, such as Finn, son of Kual, and Kukulin, were reared in a school of arms. Bravery was the sign of true manhood. A law of chivalry moderated the excess of combat. A trained militia, the Fianna, gave character to an era. The Knights of the Red Branch were the distinguishing order of chevaliers. The songs of the bards were songs of battle. The great Irish epic of antiquity was the Tain Bokilga, or Cooley Cattle Raid and it is full of combats and feats of strength and prowess. High character meant high pride, always ready to give account of itself and strike for its ideals. Irritable and bold, as one historian has it, they were jealous and quick to anger, but light-hearted laughter came easily to the lips of the ancient Irish. They worked cheerfully, prayed fervently to their gods, loved their women and children devotedly, clung passionately to their clan, and fought at the call with alacrity. Nothing, it will be seen, could be further from the minds of such a people than submission to what they deemed injustice. The habit of a proud freedom was ingrained. Their little island of thirty-two thousand square miles in the Atlantic Ocean, the outpost of Europe, lay isolated save for occasional forays to and from the coasts of Scotland and England. The Roman invasions of Western Europe never reached it. England, the Romans overran, but never Scotland or Ireland. Self-contained, Ireland developed a civilization peculiarly its own, the product of an intense imaginative fighting race. War was not constant among them by any means, and occupied only small portions of the island at a time. But since the bard's best work was war songs and war histories, with much braggadocio doubtless intermixed, a different impression might prevail. Half of their kings may have been killed in broil or battle, and yet great wars were few. It is undoubted that Scotic, that is, Irish, invasion and immigration peopled the western shores of Scotland and gave a name to the country. In the first centuries of the Christian era, they were the men who with the Picts fought the Romans at the Wall of Severus. The Britons, it will be remembered, enervated by Roman dominance, had failed to defend their border when Rome first withdrew her legions. At this time, too, began the first appearance of Ireland as a power on the sea. In the fourth century, the high king, Neil of the Hostages, commanding a large fleet of war galleys, invaded Scotland, ravished the English coasts, and conquered Armorica, Brittany, penetrating as far as the banks of the Loire, where, according to the legend, he was slain by an arrow shot by one of his own men. One of the captives he brought from abroad on one of his early expeditions was a youth named Patrick, afterwards to be the Apostle of Ireland. Neil's nephew, Dahi, also Ardry, was a great sea king. He invaded England, crossed to Gaul, and marched as far as the Alps, where he was killed by lightning. He was the last pagan king of Ireland. In perhaps a score of years after the death of Dahi, all Ireland had been converted to Christianity, and its old religion of a thousand years buried so deep that scholars find the greatest difficulty in recovering anything about it. This conservative, obstinate, jealous people overturned its pagan altars in a night, and ever since has never put into anything else 
the devotion, soul, and body of its sacrifices for religion. Christianity profoundly modified Irish life, softened manners, and stimulated learning. Not that the fighting propensities were obliterated. There were, indeed, many long and peaceful reigns, but the historians record neat little wars, seductive forays, and hostings, to use the new old word, to the heart's content. The Irish character remained fixed in its essentials, but under the influence of religious enthusiasm, Ireland progressed and prospered in the arts of peace. It would undoubtedly have shared the full progress of Western Europe from this time on, but for its insularity. Hitherto its protection, it was now to be its downfall. A hostile power was growing, of which it knew nothing. The Norsemen, the hardy Vikings of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, had become a nation of pirates. Undaunted fighters and able mariners, they built their shapely long ships and galleys of the northern pine and oak, and swept heartily down on the coasts of England, Ireland, France, Spain, and Italy, and the lands of the Levant, surprising, massacring, plundering. In France, Normandy, in England, and lastly in Ireland, they planted colonies. Their greatest success was in England, which they conquered, Canute becoming king. Their greatest battles and final defeat were in Ireland. From the end of the 8th century to the beginning of the 11th, the four shores of Erin were attacked in turn, and sometimes all together, by successive fleets of the Norsemen. The waters that had been Ireland's protection now became the high roads of the invaders. By the River Shannon they pushed their conquests into the heart of the country, Dublin Bay, Waterford Harbour, Belfast Lock, and the Cove of Cork offered shelter to their vessels. They established themselves in Dublin and raided the country around. Churches and monasteries were sacked and burned. To the end these Norsemen were robbers rather than settlers. To these onslaughts by the myriad wasps of the northern seas, again and again renewed, the Irish responded manfully. In 812 they drove off the invaders with great slaughter, only to find fresh hordes descending a year or two later. In the tenth century, Turgesius, the Danish leader, called himself Monarch of Ireland, but he was driven out by the Irish king, Malachi. The great effort which really broke the Danish power forever in Ireland was at the Battle of Clontarf on Dublin Bay, Good Friday, 1014, when King Brian Boru, at the head of 30,000 men, utterly defeated the Danes of Dublin and the Danes of Oversea. Fragments of the Northmen remained all over Ireland, but henceforth they gradually merged with the Irish people, adding a notable element to its blood. One of the most grievous chapters of Irish history, the period of Norse invasion, literally shines with Irish valor and tenacity, undimmed through six fighting generations. As Plowden says, Ireland stands conspicuous among the nations of the universe, a solitary instance in which neither the destructive hand of time nor the devastating arm of oppression nor the widest variety of changes in the political system of government could alter or subdue, much less wholly extinguish, the national genius, spirit, and character of its inhabitants. This is true not only of the Danish wars which ended nine hundred years ago, but of many a dreadful century since, and to this very day. Now followed a troubled period, Ireland weakened by loss of blood and treasure, its government failing of authority through the defects of its virtues. It was inevitable, sooner or later, that England, as it became consolidated, after its conquest by William the Norman, should turn greedy eyes on the fair land across the Irish Sea. 
It was in 1169 that Strongbow, Richard, Earl of Pembroke, came from England at the invitation of a discontented Irish chieftain and began the conquest of Ireland. Three years later came Henry II with more troops and a papal bull. After a campaign in Leinster, he set himself up as overlord of Ireland and then returned to London. It was the beginning only. An English lord deputy ruled the pale, or portion of Ireland, that England held more or less securely, and from that vantage ground made spasmodic war upon the rest of Ireland, and was forever warred on, in large attacks and small, by Irish chieftains. The Irish were the fighting race now if ever, without hope of outside assistance, facing a foe ever reinforced from a stronger, richer, more fully organized country, nothing but their stubborn character and their fighting genius kept them in the field, and century out and century in they stayed, holding back the foreign foe four hundred years. It is worthy of note that it was the Norman English, racial cousins as it were, of the Norsemen, who first wrought at the English conquest of Ireland, when some of these were seated in Irish places of pride, when a butler was made Earl of Ormond, and a Fitzgerald Earl of Kildare, it was soon seen that they were merging rapidly in the Irish mass, becoming, as it was said, more Irish than the Irish themselves. Many were the individual heroic efforts to strike down the English power. Here and there, small Irish chiefs accepted the English rule, offsetting the Norman Irish families, who at times were loyal and at times rebel. The state of war became continuous and internecine, but three-fourths of Ireland remained unconquered. The idea of a united Ireland against England had, however, been lost, except in a few exalted and a few desperate breasts. A gleam of hope came in 1316, when, two years after the great defeat of England by the Scotch under Robert the Bruce at Bannockburn, Edward, the victor king's brother, came at the invitation of the Northern Irish to Ireland with six thousand Scots landing near Carrickfergus. He was proclaimed King of Ireland by the Irish who joined him. Battle after battle was won by the Allies. Edward was a brilliant soldier, lacking, however, the prudence of his great brother, Robert. The story of his two years of fighting ravaging and slaying is hard at this distance to reconcile with intelligible strategy. In the end, in 1318, the gallant Scot fell in battle near Dundalk, losing at the same time two-thirds of his army. For two years, Scot and Irish had fought victoriously side by side. That is the fact of moment that comes out of this dark period. The following century, like that which had gone before, was full of fighting. In 1399, on Richard II's second visit to Ireland, he met fierce opposition from the Irish Seps, MacMorrow fighting, harassing the king's army from the shelter of the Wicklow Woods, fairly drove the king to Dublin. The sanguinary Wars of the Roses, that thirty years' struggle for the crown of England between the royal houses of York and Lancaster, 1455 to 1485, gave Ireland a long opportunity, which, however, she was too weak to turn to advantage. But fighting between Irish and English went on just the same, now in one province, now in another. In the reign of Henry the Eighth. A revolt against England started within the Pale itself, when Lord Thomas Fitzgerald, known as Silken Thomas, went before the council in Dublin and publicly renounced his allegiance. He took the field, a brave, striking figure, in protest against the king's bad faith in dealing with his father, the Earl of Kildare. At one time it looked as if the rebellion, 
it was the first real Irish rebellion, would prosper. Lord Thomas made combinations with Irish chieftains in the north and west, and was victor in several engagements. He finally surrendered with assurances of pardon, but, as in many similar cases, was treacherously sent a prisoner to London, where he was executed. Queen Mary's reign was one of comparative quiet in Ireland. Her policy towards the Catholics was held to be of good augury for Ireland. The English garrison was reduced with impunity to five hundred foot and a few horse, but another and darker day came with Elizabeth. Her coming to the throne, together with her fanatic devotion to the Reformation and an equal hatred of the old religion and all who clung to it, ushered in for Ireland two and a half centuries of almost unbroken misfortune. You cannot make people over. Some may take their opinions with their interest, others prefer to die rather than surrender theirs, and glory in the sacrifice. The proclamations of Elizabeth had no persuasion in them for the Irish. Her proscriptions were only another English sword at Ireland's throat. The disdain of the Irish maddened her. During her long reign, one campaign after another was launched against them. Always fresh soldier hordes came pouring in under able commanders and marched forth from the pale, generally to return shattered and worn down by constant harrying, sometimes utterly defeated with great slaughter. So of Henry Sidney's campaign, and so of the ill-fated Essex. Ulster, the stronghold of the O'Neills and the O'Donnells, remained unconquered down to the last years of Elizabeth's reign, although most of the greater battles were fought there. In Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, and Red Hugh O'Donnell, Prince of Tyrconnell, Ireland had two really great soldiers on her side. The bravery, generalship, prudence, and strategy of O'Neill were worthy of all praise, and Red Hugh fell little short of his great compatriot. In battle after battle for twenty years, they defeated the English with slaughter. Ireland, if more and more devastated by campaigns and forays, became the grave of tens of thousands of English soldiers and scores of high reputations. Writing from Cork, the Earl of Essex, after a disastrous march through Leinster and Munster, says, I am confined in Cork but still I have been unsuccessful. My undertakings have been attended with misfortune. The Irish are stronger, and handle their arms with more skill than our people. They differ from us also in point of discipline. They likewise avoid pitched battles where order must be observed, and prefer skirmishes and petty warfare, and are obstinately opposed to the English government." They did not like attacking or defending fortified places, he also believed. It was only his experience. The campaigns of Shane O'Neill, a bold but ill-balanced warrior, were full of such attacks, but one potent cause for Irish reluctance to make sieges a strong point of their strategy was that the strongest fortresses were on the sea. An inexhaustible, powerful enemy who held the sea was not, in the end, to be denied on sea or land, but the Irish, in stubborn despair or supreme indifference to fate, fought on. Religious rancor was added to racial hate. Most of the English settlers, or garrison, as they came to be called, had become Protestants at the royal order. Ruin perched upon Ireland's hills and made a wilderness of her fertile valleys. The Irish chieftains, with their faithful followers, moved from place to place in woods and hollows of the hills. English colonists were settled on confiscated lands and were harried by those who had been driven from their homes. It was war among graves. At last, O'Neill made composition with the government when all was lost in the field, but the passionate Irish resolve never to submit still stalked like a ghost, as if it could not perish. When Elizabeth died, 
It was thought that better things were coming to Ireland with James I, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. Nothing of the kind. That curiously-minded creature at once made an ingenuous proclamation. Whereas his majesty was informed that his subjects of Ireland had been deceived by a false report that his majesty was disposed to allow them liberty of conscience and the free choice of religion now, etc. Fresh transplanting of English and Scotch settlers on the lands of the Irish was the gist of his answer to the false reports. So again, the war of surprise ambush, raid, and foray went on in a hundred places at once, but the result was that the English power was even more firmly seated than before. In the time of Charles I, there were terrible slaughters, both of Protestants and Catholics. Patriotism and loyalty as moving causes had disappeared, but religion fiercely took their place. With Cromwell, the religious persecution took on an apocalyptic note of massacre, but the Irish were still showing that they were there with arms in their hands. The names of Owen Roe O'Neill and his splendid victory in 1646 at Benburb over the English and Scotch, where he slew more than three thousand men, and of another Hugh O'Neill, who made such a brilliant defence at Clonmel against Cromwell, shine brightly out of the darkness. But Ireland, parcelled out among the victors, was always the weaker after every campaign. Waves of war swept over her. She became mixed up in the rivalries of the English royal families, religion playing the most important part in the differences. It had armed Henry and Elizabeth, James and Charles against her. It gave edge to Cromwell's sword, and it led her into a great effort on behalf of James the Second. When William of Orange crossed the Boyne, all that followed for a century was symbolized. Athlone, Algram, Limerick, all places of great and fierce contests, were decided against her. French support of a kind had James, but not enough. Bravery and enthusiasm may win battles, but they do not carry through great campaigns. Once again, God marched with the heaviest, best-fed, best-armed battalions. The great Tyrone dying in exile at Rome, Red Hugh O'Donnell perishing in Spain in the early days of the seventeenth century, were to prefigure the fighting and dying of half a million Irish warriors on continental soil for a hundred years after the fall of Limerick, as the seventeenth century neared its close. During that period, the scattered bands of the Rapparees, half patriots, half robbers, hiding in mountain fastnesses, dispersing, reassembling, descending on the English estates for rapine or the killing of objectionables, represented the only armed resistance of the Irish. It was generally feudal, though picturesque. After the close of the Revolutionary War in America, Ireland received a new stimulation. The success of the patriots of the Irish Parliament under Grattan, backed as they were by 100,000 volunteers and 130 pieces of cannon, in freeing Irish industry and commerce from their trammels, evoked the utmost malignity in England. Ireland almost at once sprang to prosperity, but it was destined to be short-lived. A great conspiracy, which did not at first show above the surface, was set on foot to destroy the Irish Parliament. This is not the place to follow the sinister machinations of the English, save to note that they forced both the Presbyterians and the Catholics of the North into preparations for revolt. The Society of United Irishmen was formed, and drew many of the brightest and most cultivated men in Ireland into its councils. It numbered over 70,000 adherents in Ulster alone. The government was alarmed, and began a systematic persecution of the peasantry all over Ireland. English regiments were put at free quarters, that is, 
they forced themselves under order into the houses and cabins of the people with demands for bed and board. The hapless people were driven to fury. Brutal murders and barbarous tortures of men and women by the soldiers, savage revenges by the peasantry, and every form of violent crime all at once prevailed in the lately peaceful valleys. Prosecutions of united Irishmen and executions were many. It was all done deliberately to provoke revolt. In 1798, the revolt came. In the greater part of Ulster and Munster, the uprising failed, but a great insurrection of the peasantry of Wexford shocked the country. Poorly armed, utterly undisciplined, without munitions of war, but forty thousand strong, they literally flung themselves pike in hand on the English regiments, sweeping everything before them for a time. Father John Murphy, a priest and patriot, was one of their leaders, but Bouchon Beganel Harvey was soon their commander-in-chief. At one time the rebels dominated the entire county, save for a fort in the harbor, and a small town or two, but it was natural that the commissariat should soon be in difficulties and their ammunition give out. The British general, Lake, with an army of twenty thousand men and a moving column of thirteen thousand, attacked the rebels on Vinegar Hill, and although the fight was heroic and bloody while it lasted, it was soon over and the British army was victorious. The rest was retreat, dispersal, and widespread cruelties and burnings, and a long succession of murders. The boys of Wexford, under great difficulties, had given a great account of themselves. Dark as was that page of history, it has been a glowing lamp to Irish disaffection ever since. It is the soul of the effort that counts, and the disasters do not discredit ninety-eight in Irish eyes. Voltaire, in his century of Louis the Fourteenth, made his reflection on the Irish soldier out of his limited knowledge of the Williamite War in Ireland. He says, The Irish, whom we have seen such good soldiers in France and Spain, have always fought poorly at home. They had not fought poorly at home. It took four hundred years of English effort to complete, merely on its face, the conquest of Ireland, and all of that long sweep of the sword of time was a time of battle. The Irish were fought with every appliance of war, backed by the riches of a prospering, strongly organized country, and impelled persistently by the greed of land and love of mastery. But there was not a mountain pass in Ireland, not a square mile of plain, not a river ford, scarce a hill, that had not been piled high with English dead in that four hundred years at the hands of the Irish wielders of sword and spear and pike. The Irish had not made their environment or their natures, and no power on earth could change them. Over greater England had swept the Romans, the Jutes, the Saxons, the Anglos, the Norsemen, and the Normans. All found lodgment, and all went to the making of England. Well, one might say, it had been for Ireland if she had developed that assimilating power which made her successive conquerors in process of time the feeders of her greatness. But the Irish would not and could not. Instead, they developed the pride of race that no momentary defeat could down. They became inured to battle, and dreamt of battle when the peace of an hour was given them. When the four kings of Ireland were feasted in Dublin by King Richard II of England, an English chronicler remarked, Never were men of ruder manners. But neither the silken array and golden glitter of Richard's peripatetic court, nor the brave display of his thousand knights and thirty thousand archers, filled them with longing for the one or fear of the other. They went back to their Irish hills and plains and fastnesses as obstinately Irish as ever. They fought well at home, if unfortunately. 
the wonder being that they continued to fight. The heavens and the earth seemed combined against them. The Fighting Race Abroad We next see Irish soldiers fighting abroad, the blood they had shed so freely for the Stuarts at the Boyne, at Athlone, at Ogram, at Limerick, was in vain. The King of France, if he sent armies to Ireland, demanded Irish troops in return. The transports that brought the French regiments over in May 1690 took back over 5,000 officers and men from Ireland who formed the 1st Irish Brigade in the service of France. This, remember, was before the Battle of the Boyne. The men were formed on their arrival in France into three regiments, those of Mount Cashel, O'Brien, and Dillon, named after their commanders, and were sent to Savoy. The French aid to James in Ireland helped best in giving confidence to the raw Irish levies, but it was more than offset by the German troops brought over by William. The weakness, indecision, or worse, of James before Derry, his chicken-hearted failure to overwhelm Schomburg when he lay at his mercy before the arrival of William, ruined his chances. Remember that the Irish army, if defeated at the Boyne, was not broken, and was strong enough, when pursued by William, to repulse him with five hundred killed and one thousand wounded, and to compel him to raise the siege of Limerick. The dash and skill of Patrick Sarsfield, Earl of Lucan, backed by Irish desperation, won the day. The French troops sailed home after William's retreat. In the next year's campaign occurred the crowning disasters of the war, but in any other country, or with any other people than the English, the terms of capitulation at Limerick, which were formulated by Ginkle, and showed a soldier's respect for a brave and still powerful foe, would have ushered in an era of peace. The Irish soldier's distrust of the conquerors was shown in the fact that, since the stipulations allowed the free departure of the garrison with honors of war, 19,000 Fifty-nine officers and men took service with France and sailed in October 1691 on the French fleet, which, by the irony of fate, had arrived in the Shannon too late, on the very day after the signing of the Treaty of Limerick. Never in the whole course of the history of nations has more hideous treachery been shown than in the immediate breaking of that treaty and dearly has England paid for it ever since, although, for the hundred years that followed, Ireland sank to the very depths under the penal laws, with her trade ruined, her land stolen, her religion persecuted, and all education and enlightenment forbidden by abominable, drastic laws. If, as has been computed, 450,000 Irish fought and died in the service of France between 1690 and 1745, a further 30,000 are to be added down to 1793. A French writer estimates the whole Irish contingent at 750,000, but for a roster of seekers of glory from an impoverished people, the more reasonable half-million should surely suffice. Long would be the story to follow the fighting fortunes of the Irish brigades. Officered by Irish gentlemen and drilled to perfection, they soon came to hold in the French service the esteem that later was given to Irish regiments in the service of England. King Louis welcomed them heartily and paid them a higher wage than his native soldiers. No duty was too arduous or too dangerous for the Irish brigades. Seldom were they left to rust in idleness. Europe was a cauldron of wars of high ambitions. The Irish regiments fought through the war in Flanders. At Landen, July 29, 1693, 
the French under the Duke of Luxembourg defeated the English under William the Third with a slaughter of ten thousand four hundred seventy three men, losing eight thousand men themselves. In the retreat, Ginkle, William's general in the Irish campaign, was almost drowned in the river Greet. The Irish Royal Regiment of Foot Guards, that of Dorrington, was the first corps to break through the English entrenchments, its gallant leader, Colonel Barrett, falling as he headed the charge. Here also was stricken Lieutenant Colonel Nugent of Sheldon's Irish Regiment. Here also fell, saddest loss of all, Patrick Sarsfield, Earl of Lucan, brave, resourceful, a true, unfaltering soldier and a lover of his country. The legend of his life-blood, flowing before his eyes and his utterance, would it had been shed for Ireland, may and should be true, although he lived three days after the battle. Would, indeed, it had been shed for Ireland after such a day. It was in 1703 that the celebrated defense of Cremona lifted Irish renown to great heights throughout Europe. There were but six hundred Irish troopers all told in that long day's work, and from the break of day till nightfall they held at bay Prince Eugene's army of ten thousand men. The two battalions of Bork and Dillon were surprised at early morn to learn that the Austrians, and there were Irish officers among them, were in the town. Major O'Mahony and his men ran from their beds to the gates, and neither the foes without nor the foes within could make them budge. Terribly they suffered under concentrated attacks, but a withering fire from the Irish met every assault. It was nightfall before relief came, and then the sons of Ireland, who had held Cremona for the French, were acclaimed by all. But of their six hundred, they had lost nearly three hundred fifty. Small wonder that the honor list that day was long. In Bork's battalion, the specially distinguished were Captains Washup, Plunkett, Donnellan, McAuliffe, Curran, Power, Nugent, and Ivers. In Dillon's, Major O'Mahony, Captains Dillon, Lynch, McDonough, and McGee, and Lieutenants Dillon and Gibbon, John Bork, and Thomas Dillon. Major O'Mahony was sent to Paris to carry the news of the victory to the king, who presented him with a purse of one thousand louis d'or, a pension of one thousand livres, and the brevet of colonel. So the history proceeds, the Irish regiments lost in the array of the French forces, but showing here and there a glint of charging bayonets, captured trenches, and gushes of Irish blood. In 1703, the brigade regiments fought in Italy and Germany under the Duc de Vendôme. We hear of the regiments of Berwick, Bork, Dillon, Galmoy, and Fitzgerald, vigorously engaged. In Germany, the story is of Sheldon's horse and two battalions of the regiments of Dorrington and Clare. At the First Battle of Blenheim, September 20th, 1703, the regiment of Clare, lost one of its colors, rallied, charged with the bayonet, and recovered it, taking two colors from the enemy. This was a French victory. Not so the great Battle of Blenheim, August 1704, when Marlborough and Prince Eugene severely defeated the French and Bavarians. Three Irish battalions shared in the disaster. In 1705, at Cassano in Italy, an Irish regiment, finding itself badly galled by artillery fire from the opposite bank of the Adda, declared they could stand it no longer, and thereupon jumped in, swam the river, and captured the battery. In 1705, Colonel O. Mahoney of Cremona fame distinguished himself in Spain. In the next year, at the Battle of Ramillies, in which Marlborough, with the Dutch, defeated the French under Villeroy, Lord Clare's regiment, captured the colors of the English Churchill regiment, 
and of the Scottish Regiment in the Dutch service. In the same year and the next, the Irish Brigade fought many battles in Spain. One cannot pursue the details of the engagements. Regiments ever decimated were ever recruited by the wild geese from Ireland, the adventurous Catholic youth of the country who sought congenial outlet for their love of adventure and glory. Many Irish also joined the French army after deserting from the English forces in Flanders. It was, however, at Fontenoy, May 11, 1745, that the Irish Brigade rendered their most signal service to France. The English, under the Duke of Cumberland, son of George II, with 55,000 men, including a large German and Dutch auxiliary, met the French under Marshal Saxe, and in the presence of the French king, Louis XV, near Tournay in Belgium. Saxe had 40,000 men in action, and 24,000 around Tournay, which town was the objective of the English advance. Among the troops on the field were the six Irish regiments of Clare, Dillon, Bulkley, Roth, Berwick, and Lawley, all under Charles O'Brien, Viscount Clare, afterwards Marshal Thomond of France. After fierce cannonading on both sides, and a check to the Allies on their right and left, a great column of English veterans advanced on the French centre, breaking through with sheer force. They had thus reached high ground when some cannonading halted them. It was at this moment of gravest peril to the French that the Irish regiments, with unshotted guns, charged headlong up the slope on their ancient enemies, crying, Remember Limerick and British faith! The great English column, already roughly handled by the cannon, broke and fled in wild disorder before that irresistible onslaught, and France had won a priceless victory, but the six Irish regiments lost one-third of their gallant men by a single volley as they followed their steel into the English lines. When Charles Edward, the Stuart Pretender, landed in Scotland in 1745, he was followed by a small French force, including five hundred Irishmen from the brigade. Colonel John O'Sullivan was much relied on by the prince in his extraordinary campaign. Sir Thomas Sheridan also distinguished himself. There were 475 Irish at the Battle of Culloden, that foredoomed defeat of the Stuart cause, and two days later a score of Irish officers were among those who surrendered at Inverness. In Spain, at the beginning of the 18th century, there were hundreds of Irish officers in the military service, and eight Irish regiments. Among the officers were thirteen Kellys, thirteen Burks, and four Shays. It seemed that Ireland had soldiers for the world. Don Patricio, Don Miguel, Don Carlos, Don Tadeo took the place of Patrick, Michael, Charles, and Thaddeus. O'Hart gives a list of sixty descendants of the wild geese in places of honor in Spain. General Prim was a descendant of the princes of Innesnage and Kilkenny, and O'Donnell was Duke of Tetuan and Field Marshal of Spain. Ambrose O'Higgins, born in County Meath, Ireland, was the foremost Spanish soldier in Chile and Peru. Admiral Patricia Lynch was one of its most distinguished sailors, and James McKenna its greatest military engineer. The son of O'Higgins was foremost among those who fought for Chilean independence and gained it, and one of his ablest lieutenants was Colonel Charles Patrick O'Madden of Maryland. In Austria, the Irish soldiers were particularly welcome. They count forty-one field marshals, major generals, generals of cavalry, and masters of ordnance of Irish birth in the Austrian service. O'Callaghan relates that, on March 17, 1766, His Excellency Count Mahoney, son of the O'Mahony of Cremona, ambassador from Spain to the court of Vienna, 
gave a grand entertainment in honor of St. Patrick, to which he invited all persons of condition who were of Irish descent. Among many others there were present Count Lacey, President of the Council at War, the Generals O'Donnell, McGuire, O'Kelly, Brown, Plunkett, and McGillagut, four chiefs of the Grand Cross, two governors, several knights military, six staff officers, and four privy councillors, with the principal officers of state. All wore Patrick's crosses in honor of the Irish nation, as did the whole court that day. Emperor Francis I said, The more Irish officers in the Austrian service, the better. The bravery will not be wanting. Our troops will always be well disciplined. The Austrian O'Reillys and Toffs were famous. It was the Dragoon Regiment of Count O'Reilly that by a splendid charge saved the remnant of the Austrian army at Austerlitz. In the American War of the Revolution, General Charles Gagahan of the Irish Brigade made the campaigns of Rochambeau and Lafayette. He received the Order of the Cincinnati from Washington and was ever proud of it. Lieutenant General O'Moran also served in America. He was afterwards executed in the French Revolution, for the brigade remained royalist to the end. General Arthur Dillon, who served in the brigade, was also guillotined in 1794, crying Vive le Roy. At the foot of the scaffold, a woman, probably Madame Hebert, also condemned, stood beside him. The executioner told her to mount the steps. Oh, Monsieur Dillon, she said, pray go first. Anything to oblige a lady, he answered gaily, and so faced his God. Lord Macaulay, commenting upon these things and deploring the policies that brought them about, says with great significance. There were Irish Catholics of great ability, but they were to be found everywhere except in Ireland, at Versailles, at St. Ildefonso, in the armies of Frederick, in the armies of Maria Theresa. One exile, Lord Clare, became a Marshal of France, another, General Wall, became Prime Minister of Spain. Scattered all over Europe were to be found brave Irish generals, dexterous Irish diplomatists, Irish counts, Irish barons, Irish knights of St. Louis and St. Leopold, of the White Eagle and of the Golden Fleece, who, if they remained in the house of bondage, could not have been ensigns of marching regiments or freemen of petty corporations. The old Irish brigades ended with the French monarchy. Battalions of the regiments of Dillon and Walsh, were with the French fleet in the West Indies at Grenada and St. Eustache, also at Savannah, and under Rochambeau at Yorktown. But, except as to the officers, the surviving regiments of Berwick, Dillon, and Walsh were largely French. With the better times under Grattan's Parliament in Ireland, the soldier emigration to France had all but ceased. The Irish volunteers of 1782 numbered 100,000 men, of whom an appreciable proportion were Catholics. Many Irish went into the English army and navy, but there was another stream of fighting emigrants, that which flocked to the standard of revolt against England in America, of which much was to be heard thereafter. In the American colonies before the Revolution, there were thousands of descendants of the Catholic Irish who had settled in Maryland and Pennsylvania during the 17th century, as well as hardy Irish Presbyterians from Ulster who came in great multitudes during the first half of the 18th century. They had suffered persecution in Ireland for conscience sake from their fellow Protestants, in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and the Carolinas, they constituted entire communities. The emigration of the Catholic or purely Celtic Irish to America in the 17th and 18th centuries was often compulsory. At any rate, after the middle of the 18th century, it was large and became continuous, a true drift. Catholics and Presbyterians alike 
brought hostility to the English government with them, and their voices fed the storm of discontent. The Irish schoolmasters, of whom there were hundreds, were especially efficient in this. They came in every ship to the colonies. They had no love for England, for they had experienced in Ireland the tyranny of English law, and they would be more than human if they did not imbue the minds of the American children under their care with their own hatred of oppression and wrong and English domination. The log schoolhouse of the Irish teacher became the nursery of revolution. They were a very important factor, therefore, in the making of the revolution, and many of them took an active part as soldiers in the field. The Irish, both Catholics and Protestants, poured into the Patriot ranks once the standard of revolt was raised in 1775. The Pennsylvania line, which General Lee called the Line of Ireland, was almost entirely Irish, and the rosters of several of the Maryland and Virginia regiments contain a remarkably large proportion of Irish names, in some cases running as high as sixty per cent. It is computed that the Irish furnished not less than a third of the whole American forces. A common cause blotted out all old religious prejudices between Irishmen in the American service. It was John Sullivan of New Hampshire, son of a Limerick schoolmaster, who began the revolt by seizing the fort of William and Mary and its storehouses filled with that powder which charged the guns at Bunker Hill in the following year. It was Captain Jeremiah O'Brien, with his brothers, who made the first sea attack on the British off Machias, Maine, in May 1775, an engagement which Fenimore Cooper calls the Lexington of the Seas. There were fifteen Celtic Irish names among the Minutemen at the Battle of Lexington. Colonel Barrett, who commanded at Concord, was Irish. There were 258 Celtic Irish names on the rosters of the American forces at the Battle of Bunker Hill. John Sullivan had been made a major general, thereafter to be a notable figure in the war at Princeton, Trenton, Newport, and in his Indian campaign. The Connecticut line was thick with Irish names. Around Washington himself was a circle of brilliant Irishmen. Adjutant General Edward Hand leading his rifles, Stephen Moylan his dragoons, General Henry Knox and Colonel Proctor at the head of his artillery, John Dunlop his bodyguard, Andrew Lewis his brigadier general, Ephraim Elaine his quartermaster, all of Irish birth or ancestry. Commodore John Barry, born in Wexford in 1739 and bred to the sea, was a ship captain in his early twenties, trading from Philadelphia. When the Continental Congress met, he at once volunteered, and was given command of the Lexington, the first American ship to capture a British war vessel. Later, after gallant fighting on sea and land, he was given command of the U.S. frigate Alliance, in which he crossed the Atlantic to France, and fought and captured in a rattling battle two British warships, the Atlanta and the Trepasse. He was the father of the American Navy, holding Captain's Certificate Number 1, signed by Washington himself, the highest rank then issued. General Richard Montgomery, the brave and able soldier who fell at Quebec as he charged the heights, was an Irishman. General George Clinton, son of an Irishman, was a brigadier general, governor of New York, and twice vice president of the United States. Fifty-seven officers of New York regiments in the Revolution were Irish, and a large number of the officers in the southern regiments of the line, as well as of the militia, were native Irish or of Irish descent. The rosters of the enlisted Irishmen of the New York regiments run into the thousands. Hundreds of Irish soldiers suffered in the prison ships of New York, the horrors of which served so conspicuously to stimulate American determination to carry the war to the only rightful conclusion. Washington always recognized America's debt to the Irish. St. Patrick, 
he made the watchword in the Patriot lines the night before the English evacuated Boston forever on the memorable 17th of March, 1776. After the war he was made, with his own consent, an honorary member of the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick. Major General Richard Butler and his four brothers, all officers, and Brigadier Generals John Armstrong, William Irvine, William Thompson, James Smith, and Griffith Rutherford, all fought with distinction. All of these officers were Irish-born. It was in truth an Irish war, so far as Irish sentiment and whole-hearted service could make it. The record of Irish soldiers' names alone would fill volumes. The thirst of the Irish race for the glory of war is shown in the large enlistments in the last quarter of the eighteenth century, and since in the English army and navy. Grattan, in pleading for Ireland, claimed that a large percentage of the British forces were Irish. Wolfe Tone avers that there were 210 Irishmen out of 220 in the crew of a British frigate that overhauled his ship on its way to America. Bonaparte had in his armies an Irish legion that did good service in Holland, Spain, Portugal, and Germany. Marshal Clark, Duke of Felter, French Minister of War in 1809, was Irish. Up and down the Spanish peninsula, Irish blood was shed in abundance in the armies of Wellington. Never was more brilliant fighting done than that which stands to Irish credit, from the lines of Torres Vedras to Badajoz and Toulouse. Of the Waterloo campaign, volumes have been written in praise of Irish valor. As Maxwell says in his Tales of Waterloo, the victors of Marengo and Austerlitz reeled before the charge of the Connaught Rangers. Wellington himself was Irish, as in the later wars of England, Lord Gough, Lord Wolseley, Lord Roberts, Lord Kitchener, and General French came from Ireland. The Irish soldiers in the English service, by a pitiful irony of fate, helped materially to fasten the chains of English domination on the peoples of India in a long series of wars. In America, the War of 1812 once more gave opportunity to the fighting race. The commanding figure of the war, which opened so inauspiciously for the United States, was General Andrew Jackson, the hero of the Battle of New Orleans, and afterwards twice elected President of the United States. Old Hickory, as he came to be lovingly called, was proud of his Irish father, and sympathized with the national longings of the Irish people. He was a splendid soldier, and his defeat of the English general, Pakenham, on January 8, 1815, which meant the control of the mouths of the Mississippi, as well as safeguarding the city of New Orleans, reflected the highest credit on his skill and unflagging energy. The English had superior numbers, between 8,000 and 9,000 men, against a scant 6,000 under Jackson and their force was made up of veterans of the European wars. In command of the left of his line, Jackson placed the gallant general William Carroll, born in Philadelphia, but of Irish blood, who was afterwards twice governor of Tennessee. The British general made the mistake of despising the soldier value of his enemy, yet before evening of that day, he saw his artillery silenced and his lines broken as he died of a wound on the field. The battle was actually fought after the signing of the Treaty of Peace at Ghent. It annihilated British pretensions in this part of the world anyway. After Commodore Perry, the victor in the Battle of Lake Erie, and himself the son of an Irish mother, the northern naval glory of the War of 1812 falls to Lieutenant Thomas Macdonough, of Irish descent, whose victory on Lake Champlain over the British squadron was almost as important as Perry's. Admiral Charles L. Stewart, Old Ironsides, who commanded the frigate Constitution when she captured the Cyane and the Levant, fighting them by moonlight, was a great and renowned figure. His parents came from Ireland, and Charles Stewart Parnell's mother was the great sea fighter's daughter. 
Lieutenant Stephen Casson commanded the Ticonderoga and fought her well. Captain Johnston Blakely, who was born in Ireland, captured in the Wasp of eighteen guns the much larger British reindeer of twenty guns and one hundred seventy-five men in a splendid fight, and later sank the Avon, an eighteen-gun brig. After capturing a great prize which he sent to Savannah, he sailed for the Spanish main and was never heard of more. Captain Boyle, in the privateer Comet of Baltimore, fought the Hibernia of eighteen guns, and later in the Chaucer, known as the Phantom Ship, so fast she sailed, took eighty prizes on the high seas. General A. E. Macomb, who commanded victoriously at Plattsburgh, was of Irish descent, and Colonel Robert Carr, who distinguished himself in the same campaign, was born in Ireland. Major George Crogan, of Kentucky, the hero of Fort Stevenson, was the son of an Irish father, who had been a soldier in the Revolution. Colonel Hugh Brady, of the 22nd Infantry, commanded at Niagara. He remained in the army and fought in Mexico. William McCree, of Irish descent, was General Brown's chief engineer in laying out the military works of the American army at Niagara. Let it not be forgotten that in this memorable company, brave Mrs. Doyle has a place. Her husband, Patrick Doyle, an Irish artilleryman, had been taken prisoner by the British in the affair at Queenston and had been refused a parole. Accordingly, when the guns were trained on the English lines before Fort Niagara, Mary, emulating the example of her countrywoman, Molly Pitcher, at Monmouth, determined to take her husband's place, and regardless of flying British balls, tended a blacksmith's bellows all day, providing red-hot shot for the American gun battery, and sending a prayer with every shot into the British lines. After the Queenston affair, it is well to note, the English doctrine of perpetual allegiance was abated. Twenty-three Irish-born men were among the captives of the English in that engagement. They were manacled to be sent to Ireland to be tried for treason, not as enemies taken in the field. Winfield Scott, then lieutenant colonel, was also a prisoner with them. He protested loudly against this infamous course. Upon his release, he laid aside twenty-three British prisoners to be treated like the Irishmen, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. As a result, the Irish prisoners were exchanged. Colonel John Allen, who fell at the head of the 1st Regiment of Kentucky Riflemen at the Battle of the River Raisin on January 21, 1813, was one of the Irish Allens of Kentucky. His father and mother were natives of Ireland. The Mexican War, 1846-48, again showed Irish valor at the front. It was not a great war, though brilliantly fought and rich in territorial accessions. The campaigning comprised the work of two main expeditions and a subsidiary movement in California. One column, under General Zachary Taylor, penetrated northern Mexico and fought the battles of Matamoros, Palo Alto, and Resaca de la Palma in May 1846, with a force of 2,200 men, forced the evacuation of Monterey in September, his army swelled to 5,000, and defeated Santa Ana at Buena Vista in February 1847. General Winfield Scott, with a naval expedition, attacked Veracruz from the sea in March 1847 and took up the march, 13,000 strong, to Mexico City, fighting the battles of Cerro Gordo, Contreras, Churubusco, Molina del Rey, and Chapultepec, and entered Mexico City on September 14. General James Shields, born in Tyrone, Ireland, in 1810, was in command with his brigade under Scott, a brilliant soldier. He was severely wounded at Cerro Gordo and again at Chapultepec. He served as United States Senator after the war and again took the field in the Civil War, his forces defeating Stonewall Jackson 
at the First Battle of Winchester in 1862. The glamour of chivalry lights the name of Phil Kearney. Here was a born soldier. He was a volunteer with the French in Algiers in 1839-40. to He also commanded under Scott with brilliant bravery and was breveted major on the field for gallant and meritorious conduct at the battles of Contreras and Churubusco. In the French war with Austria in 1859-60, to Kearney fought with the French, distinguishing himself at the decisive and bloody battle of Solferino. In the Civil War, he was Brigadier General of New Jersey troops in 1861 and Major General in 1863, taking distinguished part in the battles of the Peninsula and Second Bull Run, and was killed while reconnoitering at Chantilly. General Stephen W. Kearney, with the Army of the West, by dint of long marches, secured California among the fruits of the war. General Bennett Riley, born in Maryland of Irish ancestry, commanded a brigade at Contreras, making a wonderful charge, and also fought brilliantly at Cerro Gordo and Churubusco, and was breveted brigadier general. He attained the Army rank in 1858. Major General William O. Butler, under Zachary Taylor, was one of the heroes of Monterey. Born in Kentucky, son of Percival Butler of Kilkenny, who was one of the famous five Butler brothers of the Revolutionary War, whom Washington once toasted as the Butlers and their five sons. General Butler succeeded General Scott in command of the entire American army in Mexico in February 1848. Another of clear Irish descent who fought under Zachary Taylor was Major General George Crogan, whose father, born in Sligo, Ireland, had fought in the Revolution. He himself took part, as we have seen, in the War of 1812, and now was at the front before Monterey. Once, when a Tennessee regiment wavered under a hot converging fire, Crogan rushed to the front, and taking off his hat, shouted, Men of Tennessee, your fathers conquered with Jackson at New Orleans, come, follow me and they followed in a successful assault. Major General Robert Patterson, who was born at Strabane, Ireland, and was the son of a 98 man, saw service in 1812, and became Major General of Militia in Pennsylvania, whence he went to the Mexican War. He also lived to serve in the War of the States. Among Irish-named officers mentioned honorably in official despatches are Major Edward H. Fitzgerald, Major Patrick J. O'Brien, Captain Casey, chosen to lead the first storming party at Chapultepec, Captains Hogan, Byrne, Kane, McElvin, McGill, Burke, Barney, O'Sullivan, McCarthy, McGarry, and McKeon. Captain Maine Reed, the novelist, a native of Ireland, was in the storming of Chapultepec. Theodore O'Hara, the poet, served with the Kentucky troops, and was breveted major for gallantry at Contreras and Churubusco while on the staff of General Franklin Pierce, afterwards President of the United States. O'Hara's magnificent poem, The Bivouac of the Dead, has made his name immortal. It was written on the occasion of the interment at Frankfort, Kentucky, of the Kentucky dead of the Mexican War, where glory guards with solemn round the bivouac of the dead. Erwin C. McDowell, who was breveted captain at Buena Vista, commanded a corps in the Civil War. George A. McCall, breveted lieutenant colonel at Palo Alto, was a major general in the Civil War. Francis T. Bryan was a hero of Buena Vista. Lieutenant Colonel Thomas P. Moore and Captain James Hogan both won fame in the Third Dragoons. Lieutenant Thomas Claiborne of the Mounted Rifles became a colonel in the Confederate Army. Lieutenant Colonel J. W. Geary fought brilliantly and was to be heard from later with renown. Colonel John F. Reynolds of the Third Artillery lived to be Major General in the Civil War and to fall gloriously at Gettysburg. Nor must we forget Major Foliot Lolly's bravery at Cerro Gordo, Second Lieutenant Thomas W. Sweeney, a Brigadier General of the Civil War, 
and the planner of the Fenian invasion of Canada in 1866, Lieutenant Henry B. Kelly of the 2nd Infantry, afterwards a Confederate colonel, Captain Martin Burke of the 1st Artillery, killed at Churubusco, nor Lieutenant William F. Barry of the 2nd Artillery, a Brigadier General in the Civil War. There were scores of other Irish named officers, and the whole American force of 30,000 engaged, the Irish-born and Irish-descended troops of all arms were numbered by thousands. It was, however, in the Civil War that the flood of Irish valor and loyalty to the American Republic was at its height. The 2,800,000 enlistments on the northern side stood probably for 1,800,000 individual soldiers serving during the four years of the war. Not less than 40% of these were Irish-born or of Irish descent. Of the 337,800 men furnished by the state of New York, 51,206 were natives of Ireland out of the total of 134,178 foreign-born, or 38% of the latter, while not less than 80,000 of Irish descent figured among the 203,600 native-born soldiers. Of the 2,261 engagements in the war, few there were that saw no Irishmen in arms, and certainly, in every one of the 519 engagements that made Virginia a great graveyard, the Irish figured largely. Of the 1,516,000 mustered out in 1865, not less than 150,000 were natives of Ireland, while those of Irish descent numbered hundreds of thousands. They fought well everywhere, and it would require volumes to give the names and deeds of those who distinguished themselves more than their fellows. One name, however, shines with a great blaze above them all, the name of Philip H. Sheridan, one of the three supreme soldiers of the Union, Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman being the others. Had Ireland furnished only Sheridan to the Union cause, her service would be beyond reward. He was born in Albany, New York, in March 1831, the year after his parents, John and Mary Sheridan, arrived there from the county cavern in Ireland. The family moved to Somerset, Perry County, Iowa, the following year. There Philip began village life. How he gained the beginning of an education? worked in a grocery store, became a bookkeeper, longed for a West Point nomination and got it, how he worked through the academy in 1853, served as lieutenant on the frontier in Texas, California, and Oregon until the outbreak of the Civil War, when he was promoted captain and ordered east, can be quickly told. His history under the fall of the Confederacy would need many long chapters. His military genius included all the requirements of a great captain, and his opportunities of exhibiting all his qualities in action came in rapid succession. In every service from quartermaster to army commander, his talents shone. His tremendous vigor, incredible mental alertness, and genius for detail added to his skill and outreach, continually set him forward. He stood five feet five inches high, but somehow looked taller, owing to his erect, splendid bearing. There was something in the full chest, the thick muscular neck, the heavy head, the dark blazing eyes, and the quick bodily movements that arrested attention. His name has come down to this generation mainly as a great cavalry leader but he was a natural commander of all arms, a great tactician, a born strategist. His campaign of the Shenandoah Valley was a whirlwind of success. His great battles around Richmond were wonderful. General Grant's opinion of Sheridan, given thirteen years after the war, sums up the man. It is here quoted from J. R. Young's book, Around the World with General Grant. It runs in part as follows. As a soldier, 
As a commander of troops, as a man capable of doing all that is possible with any number of men, there is no man living greater than Sheraton. He belongs to the very first rank of soldiers, not only of our country, but of the world. I rank Sheridan with Napoleon and Frederick and the great commanders in history. No man ever had such a faculty of finding things out as Sheridan, of knowing all about the enemy. He was always the best informed of his command as to the enemy. Then he had that magnetic quality of swaying men, which I wish I had, a rare quality in a general. I don't think anyone can give Sheridan too high praise. Praise from U.S. Grant is praise indeed. A peculiar feature of the Civil War was the growth of the generals, Grant, Sherman, Sheridan, Thomas, Meade, all conspicuously experienced it. With Sheridan, however, one point is notable, namely that he triumphed in every branch in each successive extension of the field of his duties, and he went from captain to major general in three years of the regular army. His care for his men was constant. His troops were always the best fed, best clothed, best rested, in the armies on either side, but on no troops was there more constant call for endeavor, and they were never found to fail him. In action he is described as severe, peremptory, dominating, but his determinations were mighty things, not to be interfered with. He wanted things done, and done at once. His men of all grades soon conceded that he knew best what to do, and set about doing it accordingly. Out of action he was joyous of spirit, but, in fight or out of it, his alertness and his lightning-like decisions marked him apart from every other commander. His career in the Tennessee campaign was meteoric. Of his score and more of great conflicts, the most picturesque was his wonderful battle at Cedar Creek, to fight which he rode at breakneck speed from Winchester twenty miles away, through the dust and debris of a broken army to the extreme front, rallying the scattered regiments and turning a defeat into a crushing victory, which recovered all that had been lost, taking twenty-five cannon and one thousand two hundred prisoners, and driving for miles the lately victorious enemy under Early. Captain P. J. O'Keefe was one of the two who made the ride beside him. The battles of Waynesboro, Five Forks, and Sailor's Creek showed the same brilliant generalship on the part of Sheridan. His hold on the affection of the army and the admiration of the people continued to the day of his death, August 5, 1888, when he held the headship of the United States Army as general in succession to the great Sherman. General Sheridan, towards the end of the war, had a soldier's difference with Major General George G. Meade, commander of the Army of the Potomac, but that did not blind little Phil to the real merit of the victor in the tremendous three days' battle of Gettysburg, handling an army new to his hands against Robert E. Lee. The Meade family is of Irish descent. George Meade, the grandfather, came from Dublin, and was a patriot in the American Revolutionary War. General Meade commanded a division of Antietam and a corps at Fredericksburg, and held command of the Army of the Potomac to the end of the war. He was a fine soldier and gentleman. Of quiet manners at most times, he was most irascible in the hour of battle, but his temper did not becloud his judgment. General James Shields and General Irwin McDowell both fine Irish soldiers, have already been mentioned. It would be hard to compass in a brief article even the names of the general officers of Irish blood in the Civil War. General John Logan, who fought with the Western armies, is worthy of high and honorable mention, as is General Thomas Francis Meagher, a patriot in Ireland, a prisoner in Australia, a soldier of dash in the Civil War. Meagher's Irish brigade left a record of valor unsurpassed. Their charge at Fredericksburg, up Mary's Heights alone, should give them full meed of fame. General Michael Corcoran, a native of Ireland, 
commanded the Holy Irish 69th Regiment when it departed for the war in 1861, and after his exchange from a Confederate prison raised and organized the Corcoran Legion. Major General McDowell McCook commanded brilliantly in the Western campaigns. Who has not heard of the fighting McCooks, a family of splendid men and hardy warriors? Brigadier General Thomas C. Devon was a superb cavalry commander who led the 1st Division of Sheridan's Shenandoah Army through all its great operations. General James Mulligan of Illinois was of the true fighting breed. Colonel Timothy O'Mara led his superb Irish Legion from Illinois up Missionary Ridge. Brigadier General C. C. Sullivan, of Western Army fame, was one of the five generals, headed by Rosecrans, who recommended Phil Sheridan for promotion to Brigadier General after the Battle of Boonville as worth his weight in gold. General Brannan was a gallant division commander in the Middle Tennessee Campaign. Colonel William P. Carlin made a name at Stone River. General James T. Boyle, of the Army of the Ohio under Buell, was the brave man whose promotion to division commander left a vacancy for little Phil that was to be an immediate stepping stone to higher opportunity. Brigadier General McMillan, who commanded the 2nd Brigade at Cedar Creek, Colonel Thomas W. Cahill, 9th Connecticut, Lieutenant Colonel Alfred Neefy of the 156th New York, Captain Charles McCarthy of the 175th New York, Lieutenant Colonel Alex J. Kenny of the 8th Indiana, Lieutenant Terence Riley of the Horse Artillery, all won distinction in the Shenandoah Valley. Such splendid fighters as General James R. O'Byrne, Colonel Guinea, Colonel Cavanaugh, Colonel John P. Byron, Colonel Patrick Gleason, General Dennis F. Burke, wrote their names red over a score of battlefields, but one cannot hope to cover more than a fraction of the brilliant men of Irish blood who led and bled in the long, hard, and strenuous struggle. The 69th New York Regiment was the mother of a dozen Irish regiments, including the Irish Brigade of Meagher and the Corcoran Legion. The 9th, 28th, and 29th Regiments of Massachusetts were all Irish. A gallant Irishman born at Fermoy was Brigadier General Thomas Smith, who made a name and died in the battles around Richmond. There was not a regiment from the Middle Western and Western states that did not hold its quota of Irishmen and sons of the Irish. After the names of Porter and Farragut in the Navy stands next highest in honor, that of Vice Admiral Stephen C. Rowan, born in Dublin, of the famous family that produced Hamilton Rowan, one of the foremost of the United Irishmen. It was the son of the Vice Admiral, a lieutenant in the Army, who carried the message to Garcia from the United States War Department to the Cuban commander in the eastern jungle of Cuba before the outbreak of the war with Spain, and did it so well and bravely through such difficulties and dangers that his name will stand for the faithful messenger forever. As a consequence of their stand with the American people in the Civil War, the position of the whole mass of the Irish and Irish-American people was vastly uplifted in American eyes. The unlettered poverty of scores of thousands of Irish immigrants who came in multitudes from 1846 on had made an unfavorable and false impression. Their red blood on the battlefield washed it out. On the southern side as well, Irish valor shone, while the great flood of the mid-century Irish immigration had spread itself mainly north, east, and west, the larger cities of the south also received a share. The slave system precluded the entry of free labor into the cotton, corn, lumber, and sugar lands of the south, but such cities as New Orleans, Mobile, Charleston, Savannah, Vicksburg, and Richmond gave varied employment to many of the Irish who made their homes in the Southland, and so they came to furnish thousands of recruits to the local Confederate levies. The Louisiana Tigers, who fought so valiantly at Gettysburg on the southern side, included many Irish. The Georgia Brigade, that held the Confederate line atop of Mary's Heights at Fredericksburg, 
up which the Irish brigade so heroically charged, had whole companies of Irish. There were scores of Irish in many of the regiments that made Pickett's memorable charge at Gettysburg. All through the Confederate armies were valiant descendants of the earlier Irish immigration that settled the uplands of the Carolinas and Virginia and the bluegrass region of Kentucky. Most famous, most glorious of these was Stonewall Jackson, Lieutenant General Thomas Jonathan Jackson, next to Robert E. Lee, the greatest soldier on the southern side. No more splendid soldier figure rises out of the contest. Educated at West Point, serving in Mexico, then a professor of philosophy and artillery, next a volunteer with his state when Virginia took arms against the Union, his long and brilliant service included a large share in the victories at Bull Run, Gaines Mill, Malvern Hill, Cedar Mountain, Harper's Ferry, Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Chancellorsville, where he was accidentally wounded by his own men. He was once defeated by General Shields, as has been noted. The piety and purity of his life belie the supposed necessity for the coarser traits that are thought to go with the terrible trade. General Patrick R. Cleburne was born in 1828, near Cork, Ireland. He was in the English army three years, and coming to the United States became a lawyer at Helena, Arkansas. He enlisted in the Confederate Army as a private, rose rapidly to the command of a brigade, and made a great name at Shiloh. As Major General, he led divisions at Murfreesboro and Chickamauga, and was thanked by the Confederate Congress. He fell at the Battle of Franklin, a soldier of commanding presence, skill, and daring, beloved by the whole Army of the West. The gallant Colonel Thomas Claiborne was a striking cavalryman. It was Lieutenant Thomas A. Claiborne of the 1st South Carolina, who, with Colonel B. Brannan, lashed the broken flagstaff on Fort Sumter in June 1864, when, under a withering fire, the flag of the Confederacy had been shot away. The fighting of Major General Gary of South Carolina around Richmond was desperate. He was the last to leave the city when it fell, as told by Captain Sullivan. He galloped at night through the burning city, and at the bridge over the James cried out, We are the rear guard, it is all over, blow the bridge to hell, and went on into the night. The story of the Civil War is a mine of honor to the Irish, and Irishmen should set it forth at length. Here it can be merely glanced at. The War of 1898 with Spain, that great patriotic efflorescence, was brief in its campaigning. Immediately provoked by the blowing up of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor on February 15th, war was declared on April 19th. Admiral Dewey sank the Spanish fleet in Manila Harbor May 1st. The first troops landed on Cuban soil June 1st. The first and last real land battle before Santiago occurred on July 1st through 2nd, with 13,500 troops on the American side against an available Spanish force, somewhat less in number, but holding strongly fortified and entrenched positions around the town. The advance and charges uphill necessary to capture El Caney and the steep heights of San Juan called for desperate courage. It was there, however, and the Irish in the army exhibited dash and persistence as duty demanded. In the second day's fighting, the Spanish assaults on the American positions were repelled, and the land fighting was over. The Americans in the two days lost over ten percent killed and wounded. The destruction of Cervera's fleet on its attempt to escape from Santiago on July 3rd ended the struggle. With the regiment of rough riders, under Theodore Roosevelt, who says he reckons an O'Brien, a Redmond, and a man from Ulster, among his forebears were many gallant Irishmen, Kellys, Murphys, Burks, and Doyles, for instance. His favorite captain, Bucky O'Neill of Arizona, fell at the foot of San Juan. The white regiments of the regular army had their quota of Irish, as had most of the volunteers. 
The Ninth Massachusetts was all Irish. The Sixty Ninth New York, all Irish, never reached the front in the war, but shared the fate of the one hundred fifty thousand troops cantoned through the southern states, their only effective enemies being dysentery, typhoid, and malaria. A little splash of Irish blood came with the Fenian dash into Canada on June 1st, 1866. There had been active preparations for a real invasion by some 50,000 Irish-born or Irish-fathered soldiers who had served in the Civil War. The American government, using its army force, intervened to prevent the bellicose movement, not, however, before Colonel John O'Neill, who had served in the cavalry with Sherman on his march to the sea, with Captain Starr, one of Kilpatrick's cavalry, Captain O'Brien, and about seven hundred well-armed men, all Civil War veterans, had slipped across the Niagara River at Fort Erie. They made short work of all in sight, threw out a couple of hundred men who burned a bridge and tore up the railroad tracks. Their scouts fired on a small British detachment, which ran. On the morning of June 2nd, news came of a larger Canadian force advancing, and O'Neill went out to meet them. Deploying his men in a field near the high road at a place called Ridgeway, he sent his pickets forward. They found heavy ground in front, and about three-quarters of a mile away, some one thousand four hundred men of the Queen's Own of Toronto and the Hamilton Volunteers advancing rapidly in line. O'Neill, after a few rounds, withdrew his pickets, and the Canadians, taking the movement for flight, came briskly on. As soon as they were clear of cover, O'Neill, firing a volley, gave orders for a charge. At it they went with a cheer, and the whole Canadian line gave way. They ran as fast as their legs could carry them, leaving some fifty killed and wounded. After chasing them for two miles, O'Neill halted his men and brought them back to Fort Erie, where they entrenched. The Canadians did not stop until they reached Colburn, eighteen miles away. The Fenian loss was twenty-five. In the night, O'Neill learned that no help was coming from the United States side, while news reached him that a force of five thousand Canadian and British regulars was advancing on Fort Erie. Accordingly, at 2 a.m. on June 3rd, he surrendered to the United States forces with 400 of his men, who were detained for a few days on the USS Michigan, and then let go. The balance of his force, about 250 men, escaped in groups across the river. There was another little victorious skirmish with the Canadians lower down under Captain Spear, who also slipped back over the border unpursued. What fighting took place was workmanlike and creditable. There was a flicker of Irish fighting spirit in the Boer War. Many thousands, no doubt, were in the English army of 250,000 men brought against the 30,000 Boers but there was a small Irish brigade that fought on the Boer side and was notably engaged at Spion Cop, where the English were driven so sweepingly from their position by desperate charges. In the War of 1870, between France and Prussia, the good wishes of the Irish went with France for the sake of the old friendship, largely helped, no doubt, by the fact that at the summit of army command was Marshal McMahon, a descendant of a warrior of the old Irish brigade. His service in Algiers, his skill and daring in the Crimean War before Sebastopol, where he led the division which stormed the Malakoff, his victories in the Italian War of 1859 against Austria, including the Great Battle of Magenta, all made him a striking, romantic figure. He failed in 1870 against the Prussians at Worth, and was made prisoner with his army at Sedan, 
but he suppressed the commune after the war and was president of france from eighteen hundred seventy three to eighteen hundred seventy nine the device by which three hundred irishmen took part on the french side in the war with germany has grim humour they went as aides in an ambulance corps fitted out in dublin by subscription but once on french soil enlisted in the army maybe we can kill as well as we can cure said one of them the compagnie irlandaise as it was called did creditable work and was in the last combat with the prussians at mont billard their captain m w kerwin was offered a cross of the legion of honour but for some reason declined it dr constantine j mcguire who won the decoration for bravery before paris during the siege of the commune did however accept it receiving the cross from the hands of marshal mcmahon and hale and hardy wears the red ribbon on occasion in new york today even as this chronicle of daring deeds and daring doers is being penned in the ranks and as commanding officers on the side of the allies in the far-flung battle lines of the great european war are men of irish birth and let it not be forgotten not a few of the opposing side are the descendants of the irish military geniuses who in days gone by fought so gallantly across the continent from dunkirk to belgrade they are all every man of them bearing bravely as of yore their own part amid the dangers and chances of the fray if the inspiring story is of necessity here barely sketched in outline it nevertheless clearly indicates that as it has been for two thousand years of irish history so it will be to the end of the human chapter the irish race is the fighting race and willing even eager to risk life itself for vital issues the sorrows of ireland by john jerome rooney a m l l d the sorrows of ireland what a vision of woe the words conjure up the late goldwin smith himself an englishman and a unionist in his irish history and the irish question finds that of all histories the history of ireland is the saddest for nearly seven centuries it was a course of strife between races bloodshed massacre misgovernment civil war oppression and misery the first of the great scourges of erin was the coming of the danes the bloodthirsty and conquest-loving vikings of the north the worshippers of Thor and Odin, the gods of thunder and of strife. These warriors, in never-ending invasions, had for four hundred years overrun Britain and finally conquered the northern provinces of Gaul. Until the end of the eighth century, Ireland had been free from the Scandinavian scourge. About this time the invaders made lodgments along the coasts, passed inward through the island, burned and looted religious houses and schools of learning, levied tribute upon the inhabitants, and at length established themselves firmly at Limerick, Waterford, Dublin, Wexford, and Carlingford. Fortified towns were built, trading communications with Britain and the continent were set up and the Northmen, though not in actual possession of the interior of the island, was apparently in substantial control of its destinies. Brian Baruma, or Baru, brother of the King of Munster, of the Dalcasian race of O'Brien, refused to submit, roused his brother, fought the Danes of Limerick at Sulcoid, A.D. 968, and captured Limerick. Brian later succeeded his brother, became sovereign of all Ireland, A.D. 1001, and on Good Friday, 
A.D. 1014, joined battle with the Danes upon the famous field of Clontarf. Here the power of the Northmen was forever broken, Brian falling at the moment of victory, while in his tent, by the hand of a fugitive Dane. With the death of Brian, the united government dissolved. The provincial kings, or princes, resumed separate authority, and a struggle arose among them, with varying success, for the national sovereignty. The central government never had been strong, as the nation was organized on a tribal or family basis. In this weakened condition, Dermot McMurrow, king of Leinster, abducted the wife of O'Rourke, prince of Breffney, while the latter was on a pilgrimage. McMurrow was compelled to fly to England. He sought the protection of the Angevin English king, Henry Plantagenet. As a result of this appeal, a small expedition, headed by Strongbow, A.D. 1169, was sent to Ireland, and Waterford, Wexford, and Dublin were taken. Then came Henry himself, in 1171, with a fleet of 240 ships, 400 knights, and 4,000 men, landing at Waterford. This expedition was the beginning of the English attempted conquest of Ireland, a proceeding that, through all the ruin and bloodshed of 800 years, is not yet accomplished. Henry's first act was to introduce the feudal system into that southern half of the island which he controlled. He seized great tracts of land, which he in turn granted to his followers under feudal customs. He introduced the offices of the English feudal system and the English laws, and placed his followers in all the positions of power, holding their lands and authority under the feudal conditions of rendering him homage and military service. This was the root of the alien landlordism and foreign political control of future times which became the chief curses of Ireland, the prolific source of innumerable woes. The succeeding years to the reign of Henry VIII witnessed the extension and at times the decline of the Anglo-Norman rule. When Henry VII became King of England, the Anglo-Norman colony, or Pale, had shrunk to two counties and a half around Dublin, defended by a ditch. Many of the original Norman knights had become more Irish than the Irish themselves. Such was the great family of the Geraldines, or Fitzgerald, the most powerful, with the O'Neills of the North in Ireland. A united attack at this time would most certainly have driven out the invader, for it must be remembered that Dublin, the Pale, the castle government of later times, was the citadel of the English foreign power, and before a united nation would most certainly have succumbed. When Henry VIII ascended the throne of England, the policy of peace in Ireland was continued during the early portion of his reign. Then came Henry's break with the Pope over the royal divorce. The Irish beyond the Pale, and many within it, were loyal to the church of their fathers, to the faith of Patrick, the faith of the Roman See. To Henry and his daughter Elizabeth, the daughter of Anne Boleyn, who displaced Henry's lawful wife, this was treason. Henceforth, to the bitterness of race, hatred, and the pride of the conqueror, were to be added the blackest of religious feuds, the most cruel of religious persecutions in the history of the world. Again, let Goldwyn Smith, the English Unionist, describe the result. Of all the wars waged by a civilized, on a barbarous, seek and despised race, these wars waged by the English on the Irish seem to have been the most hideous. No quarter was given by the invader to man, woman, or child. The butchering of women and children is repeatedly and brutally avowed. Nothing can be more horrible than the cool satisfaction with which English commanders report their massacres." Famine was deliberately added to the other horrors, 
What was called law was more cruel than war. It was death without the opportunity for defense, and with the hypocrisy of the forms of justice added. Out of this situation came the infamous penal code, which, by the period of William the Third, about 1692, became a finished system. This is the Irish code, of which Lord Brougham said, it was so ingeniously contrived that an Irish Catholic could not lift his hand without breaking it. And Edmund Burke said, The wit of man never devised a machine to disgrace a realm or destroy a kingdom so perfect as this. Montesquieu, the great French jurist philosopher, the author of the epoch-making Spirit of the Laws, commented, it must have been contrived by devils. It ought to have been written in blood, and the only place to register it is in hell. Yet for two hundred years this code of death, national and individual, was the supreme law of Ireland. Wendell Phillips, the great American orator, in his lecture on Daniel O'Connell, summed up this penal code in words that will not soon be forgotten by the world. His reference to Mr. Frode is to James Anthony Frode, the English historian. He says, You know that, under it, an Irish Catholic could not sit in the House of Commons. He could not hold any commission from the Crown, either civil or military. He could be a common soldier, nothing more. He could neither vote, nor sit on a jury, nor stand on a witness stand, nor bring a suit, nor be a doctor, nor be a lawyer, nor travel five miles from his own home without a permit from a justice of the peace. The nearest approach that ever was made to him was a South Carolina Negro before the war. He had no rights that a Protestant needed to respect. If he was a landholder, if all his children were Catholics, he was obliged to divide the land equally between them. This was the English plan for eliminating the Catholic tenure of the land and letting it slip out of their hands. Then, if any of the children, during their father's life, concluded to become Protestants, in such case they took the whole estate, or indeed they might compel the father to put his estate in trust for their benefit. So if the Catholic wife would not go to an Episcopalian church once a month, which she deemed it a sin to do, she forfeited her dower. But if she went regularly, she could have all the estate. If a Catholic had a lease, and it rose one quarter in value, any Protestant could take it from him by bringing that fact to the notice of a justice of the peace. Three justices of the peace might summon any Catholic before them and oblige him to give up his faith or quit the realm. Four justices could oblige him to abjure his faith or sell his estates. If a Protestant paid one dollar tax, the Catholic paid two. If a Protestant lost a ship, when at war with the Catholic power, and at the time there was only one Protestant power in Europe, besides Great Britain, that was Holland, so that the chances were nine to one that, in case of war, Great Britain would be at war with the Catholic power. In such a case, if a Protestant lost a ship, he went home and assessed the value on his Catholic neighbors, and was reimbursed. So, of education— we fret a great deal on account of a class of Irishmen who come to our shores and are lacking in education, in culture, and refinement. But you must remember the bad laws. You must remember the malignant legislation that sentenced them to a life of ignorance and made education a felony in Catholic Ireland. If an Irishman sent his child to a Protestant schoolmaster, all right, but if a parent would not do so and sent him to a Catholic school, the father was fined ten pounds a week, and the schoolmaster was fined five pounds a week, and for the third offense he was hung. But if the father determined that his child should be educated and sent him across the channel to France— the boy forfeited his citizenship and became an alien, 
and if discovered, the father was fined one hundred pounds, and anybody except the father who harbored him forfeited all civil rights. That is, he could not sue in a court of law, nor could he vote. Indeed, a Catholic could not marry. If he married a Protestant, the marriage was void, the children were illegitimate, and if one Catholic married another, it required the presence of a priest, and if a priest landed in Ireland for twenty minutes, it was death. To this ferocious code, Sir Robert Peel, in our own day, added the climax, that no Catholic should quit his dwelling between the hours of sunset and sunrise, an exaggeration of the curfew law of William the Conqueror. Now you will hardly believe that this was enacted as a law. But Mr. Froude alludes to this code. Yes, he was very honest. He would paint England as black as she deserved. He said of Queen Elizabeth that she failed in her duty as a magistrate. She failed towards Ireland in her capability of being a great ruler. And then he proceeded, after passing sentence, to give us the history of her reign, and showed that, in very many cases, she could not have done any different. For instance, oh, it is the saddest, blackest, most horrible statement of all history. It makes you doubt the very possibility of human nature. When you read that Spencer, the poet, who had the most ardent, most perfect ideas in English poetry, Spencer sat at the council board that ordered the wholesale butchery of a Spanish regiment captured in Ireland, and to execute the order, he chose Sir Walter Raleigh, the scholar, the gentleman, the poet, the author, and the most splendid Englishman of his age. And Norris, a captain under Sidney, in whose veins flowed the blood of Sir Philip, writing home to Elizabeth, begs and persuades her to believe in O'Neill's crimes, and asks for leave to send a hired man to poison him, and the Virgin Queen makes no objection. Mr. Froude quotes a letter from Captain Norris, in which he states that he found himself in an island where five hundred Irish, all women and children, not a man among them, had taken refuge from the war, and he deliberately butchered every living soul. And Queen Elizabeth, in a letter still extant, answers by saying, Tell my good servant that I will not forget his good services. He tells us that the English nobility and gentry would take a gun as unhesitatingly as a fowler, and go out to shoot an Irishman as an Indian would a buffalo. Then he tells us with amazement that you never could make an Irishman respect an Englishman. He points to some unhappy Kildare, the sole relic of a noble house, whose four uncles were slaughtered in cold blood. That is the only word for this kind of execution, slaughtered. And he, left alone, a boy, grows up characterless and kills an archbishop. Every impetuous, impatient act is dragged before the prejudiced mind. But when Mr. Froude is painting Sir Walter and Spencer, blind no longer, he says, I regret. It is very sad to think that such things should ever have been. Such was the cup from which Ireland drank, even into the days of men now living. Nor was this all. The rise of English manufactures brought a new chapter of woes to Ireland. The Irish cattle trade had been killed by the act of Charles the Second for the benefit of English farmers. The Irish then took up the raising of wool and woolen manufactures. A flourishing trade grew up. An English law destroyed it. In succession, the same greed killed the cotton, the glove-making, the glass-making, and the brewing trades. These were reserved for the English maker and merchant. These crimes upon Irish industry surpassed a thousandfold the later English attempts upon the industries of the American colonies. Under the code, and through the extreme poverty produced thereby, substantially all the land of Ireland passed out of the hands of the people. They became mere serfs upon the soil. 
Their tribute was paid through a rapacious agent to a foreign landlord. The improvement of the land, by the labor of the tenant, brought increase of rent. There was no fixity of tenure of the land. It was held at the will of the agent, reflecting the rapacity of the non-resident landlord. Upon these holdings, the principal crop was the potato. A failure of this crop was a failure to pay rent, eviction on the roadside, and starvation. The results, after the enactment of the penal code, and during the greater part of the eighteenth century, are thus described by Goldwyn Smith. On such a scene of misery as the abodes of the Irish cotters, the sun has rarely looked down. Their homes were the most miserable hovels, chimneyless, filthy. Of decent clothing they were destitute. Their food was the potato. Sometimes they bled their cattle and mixed the blood with sorrel. The old and sick were everywhere dying by cold and hunger and rotting amidst filth and vermin. When the potato failed, as it often did, came famine, with disease in its train. Want and misery were in every face. The roads were spread with dead and dying. There was sometimes none to bear the dead to the grave, and they were buried in the fields and ditches where they perished. Fluxes and malignant fevers followed, laying these villages waste. I have seen says a contemporaneous witness, the laborer endeavoring to work at his spade, but fainting for want of food and forced to quit it. I have seen the helpless orphan exposed on the dunghill, and none to take him in for fear of infection, and I have seen the hungry infant sucking at the breast of the already expired parent. All these are not only the horrors of a hundred or two hundred years ago, they were repeated in ten thousand forms in the awful famine days of 1847. In 1841, the population of Ireland was 8,796,545 persons. In 1851, after four years of famine, the population was six million. 551,970, leaving 2,244,575 persons to be accounted for, and taking no account of the natural increase of the population during the ten years. Not less than a million and a half of these died of starvation and the fevers brought on by famine. The remainder emigrated to foreign lands. In this account of the sorrows of Ireland, nothing has been said of the vast emigrations. Thousands upon thousands of persons in the 17th and 18th centuries, leaving Ireland under forced deportations in a practical selling into slavery, the sum total of this loss to Ireland cannot be less than five million souls. The earlier deportations were carried out under the most atrocious circumstances. Families were broken up and scattered to distant and separate colonies, such as Barbados, the New England states, and later to the South Pacific. This is but a glance at some of the wrongs to Ireland's religious, intellectual, and material welfare, wrongs that have plunged her into an age-long poverty but one of the greatest of all her sorrows has been the denial of her national life, the attempt to strangle her rightful aspirations as a free people. Her autonomy was taken from her. Her smallest legislative act was the act of a stranger. In fine, every mark of political slavery was put upon her. A foreign soldiery was, and still is, quartered upon her soil. The control of her revenues, of the system of taxation, was wrested from her. These became the function of a hateful resident oligarchy, alien in everything to the Irish people, and of the English Parliament, to which she was not admitted until the days of Daniel O'Connell, 
and then she was admitted only through fear of revolution. The dawn has come. The dark night is almost past. The heroic struggle of Ireland is about to close in triumph. Her loyalty to her ideals of freedom and religion is to meet its reward. The epitaph of Robert Emmett will soon be written, for at last Ireland is certain of taking her place among the nations of the earth. Irish Leaders by Shane Leslie Irish leaders have proved far-famed but not long-lived. Their short and strenuous careers have burnt out in their prime, and their ends have been such as attend conflagrations. More often they have left a pall than a light in the heavens, for the most brilliant lives in Irish history have led to the most tragic deaths. The destiny which allotted them impossible tasks has given them immortality on the scenes of their glorious failure. They differ from leaders of other countries, who divide the average pittances of success or ill-success on the road to honored retirement. Few of the heroes among modern nations have left such vivid and lasting memory as the strong men of Ireland. During the 19th century, their lore and cult have traversed the whole world in the wake of the great emigrations. Whether they failed or succeeded in wresting the independence and ideals of Ireland for a while from the fell clutch of circumstance, they live with their race forever. Under Plantagenet and Tudor rule, the Irish leaders presented a sullen but armed resistance. A never-completed invasion was met by sporadic raids and successive risings. A race of military outlaws was fashioned, which accounts for much in Irish character today. Previously, the Irish, like all Celtic civilization, was founded on the arts, on speech, and on law, rather than on war and feudalism. Even Irish militancy was crushed in the Williamite Wars, and the race, deprived of its original subsistence, as well as of its acquired defense, sank into the stupor of penal times. Those who should have been leaders of Ireland became marshals of Austria and France. Gradually it was learnt that the pen is mightier than the sword, and the human voice more potent than the sound of cannon, and the constitutional struggle developed, not without relapse and reverse. To Dean Swift must be attributed the change in the national weapon, and the initiation of a leadership of resistance within the law, which has lasted into modern times. Accident made Swift an Irishman and a chance attempt to circulate debased coins in Ireland for the benefit of a debased but royal favourite made him a patriot. Swift drove out Wood's halfpence at the pen point. He shamed the government, he checked the all-powerful Walpole, and he roused the manhood of Ireland towards independence and legislation. He never realised what a position history would give him. To himself he seemed a gloomy failure to his contemporaries a popular pamphleteer, but to posterity he is the creator of public conscience in Ireland. He was the father of patriotic journalism, and the first to defend Ireland's rights through literature. Though his popularity was quenched in lunacy, his impress upon Irish politics remains as powerful and lasting as upon English literature. Within the so-called Irish Parliament, sprang forth the first of a long line of orators, Henry Flood. He was the first to study the Constitution for purposes of opposition. He attacked viceregal government in its own audit house. Pension and corruption he laid bare, and upon the people he breathed a spirit of independence. Unfortunately, he was not content with personal prominence. He accepted office, hoping thereby to benefit Ireland. His voice became lost to the higher cause, and another man rose in his stead, Henry Grattan. The American War tested the rival champions of liberty. Flood favored sending Irish troops, armed negotiators he called them, to deal with the revolted colonists. Grattan nobly reviled him for standing, quote, with a metaphor in his mouth and a bribe in his pocket, a champion against the rights of America the only hope of Ireland and the only refuge of the liberties of mankind. 
flood collapsed under his ignoble honors. He was not restored by returning to patriotic opposition. Grattan's leadership proved permanent politically and historically. His name connotes the high watermark of Irish statesmanship. The parliament which he created and whose rights he defined became a standard and his name a talisman and a challenge to succeeding generations. The comparative oratory of Grattan and Flood is still debated. Both, after a manner, were unique and unsurpassed. Flood possessed staying power and sheer invective and sustained reasoning. Grattan was fluent in epigram and most inspiring when condensed, and he had an immense moral advantage. The Parliament which made him a grant was independent, but it was from one of subservience that Flood drew his salary. Henceforth Grattan was haunted by the jealous and discredited herald of himself. A great genius, Flood lacked the keen judgment and careless magnanimity without which leadership in Ireland brings misunderstanding and disaster. In the English house, he achieved total failure. Grattan followed him after the Union, but retained the attention, if not the power, of Dublin days. Neither influenced English affairs, and their eloquence, curiously, was considered cold and sententious. Their rhapsody appeared artificial, and their exposition laboured. The failure of these men was no stigma. What is called Irish oratory arose with the inclusion of the Celtic understrata in politics. Burke's speeches were delivered to an empty house. Though he lived out of Ireland and never became an Irish leader in Ireland, Burke had an influence in England greater than that of any Irishman before or since. The beauty and diction of his speech fostered future parliamentary speaking. Macaulay, Gladstone, Peel, and Brougham were suckled on him. His farthest reaching achievement was his treatment of the French Revolution. His single voice rolled back that storm in Europe. But no words could retard revolution in Ireland herself. Venal government made the noblest conservative thinking seem treason to the highest interests of the country. The temporary success of Grattan's parliament had been largely won by the volunteers. They had been drilled ostensibly against foreign invasion, but virtually to secure reforms at home. Their power became one with which England had to reckon, and which she never forgave. Lord Charlemont, their president, was an estimable country gentleman, but not a national leader. A more dashing figure appeared in the singular Earl of Bristol. Though an Irish bishop and an English peer, he set himself in the front rank of the movement, assuming, with general consent, the demeanour and trappings of royalty. He would not have hesitated to plunge Ireland into war had he obtained Charlemont's position, but it was not so fated. After forcing parliamentary independence, the volunteers meekly disbanded, and the United Irishmen took their place. The brilliancy of Grattan's parliament never fulfilled national aspirations. Bristol was succeeded by another recruit from the aristocracy, Lord Edward Fitzgerald. With Wolf Tone and Robert Emmett, he has become legendary. All three attained popular canonization, for all three sealed their brief leadership with death. Lord Edward was a dreamer, an Irish Bayard, too chivalrous to conspire successfully, and too frankly courageous to match a government of guile. Tone was far more dangerous. He realized that foreign invasion was necessary to successful rebellion, and he allowed no scruple or obstacle in his path. He washed his hands of law and politics entirely. To divert Napoleon to Ireland was his object, and the total separation of Ireland his ambition. The United Irishmen favoured the invasion which the volunteers had been formed to repel. The feud between moral and physical force broke out. The failure of the Sterner policy in 1798 did not daunt Emmett from his ill-starred attempt in 1803. He combined Lord Edward's chivalry with some abilities worthy of tone, but he failed. The failure he redeemed by a swan song from the dock and a demeanour on the scaffold, which had become part of Irish tradition. After the Union, Irish leaders sprang up in the English house, 
which Pitt had unwittingly made the cockpit of the racial struggle. Far from absorbing the Irish element, the commons found themselves forced to resist, rally, and finally succumb. The Irish House cannot be dismissed without mention of Curran. He was a brilliant enemy of corruption and servility. O'Connell said, quote, there was never so honest an Irishman, end quote, which may account for his greater success as a lawyer than a politician. To be an Irish leader and a successful lawyer is given to no man. For the former, the sacrifice of a great career is needed. This sacrifice, Daniel O'Connell was prepared to make. His place in history will never be estimated, for few have been so loved or hated, or for stronger reasons. Never did a tribune, rising to power, lift his people to such sudden hope and success. Never did a champion leave his followers at his death and decline to more terrible despair. Friend and foe admit his immensity. He was the greatest Irishman that ever lived, or seemingly could live. In his own person, he contained the whole genius of the Celt. Ireland could not hold his emotions, which overflowed into the world for expression. He rose on a crest of religious agitation, but emancipation won. He had the foresight to associate the Irish cause with the advent of reform and liberalism throughout Europe. He sounded the notes of free trade and anti-slavery. What he said in Parliament one day, Ireland re-echoed the next. To her he was all in all, her hero and her prophet, her messiah and her strong deliverer. On the continent he roughly personified Christian democracy. In public oratory, O'Connell introduced a new style. Torrential and overwhelming, as Flood and Grattan had never been, he proved more successful if less polished. The exaggerations of Gaelic speech found outburst in his English. Peel's smile was the silver plate on a coffin, Wellington a stunted corporal, and Israeli the lineal descendant of the impenitent thief. It sounds bombastic, but in those feudal forties it rang more magnificent than war. Single-voiced, he overawed the host of bigots, dullards, and reactionaries. Unhappily, he let his people abandon their native tongue, while teaching them how to balance the rival parties in England, the latter a policy that has proved Ireland's fortune since. He loosed the spirit of sectarianism in the Tithe War, and he crushed the Young Ireland movement, which bred Fenianism in its death agony. But he made the Catholic a citizen. Results stupendous as far-reaching sprang from his steps every way. The finest pen sketch of O'Connell is by Mitchell, who says, quote, Besides superhuman and subterhuman passions, yet with all a boundless fund of masterly affectation and consummate histrionism, hating and loving heartily, outrageous in his merriment and passionate in his lamentation, he had the power to make other men hate or love, laugh or weep at his good pleasure. End quote. Yet during his lifetime there lived others worthy of national leadership. O'Brien, Duffy, and Davis played their part in England as well as in Ireland. Father Matthew founded the Temperance as Fergus O'Connor the Chartist movement. And there was an orator who fascinated Gladstone, Scheel. Father Matthew succeeded in keeping many millions of men sober during the forties, until the Great Famine engulfed his work as it did O'Connell's. To him is due as a feature of Irish life, the brass band with banners, which he originally organized as a counter-intoxicant. Fergus O'Connor founded radical socialism in England. As the Lion of Freedom, he enjoyed a popularity with English workmen approaching that of O'Connell in Ireland. He ended in lunacy, but he had the credit of forwarding peasant proprietorship far in advance of his times. Scheel was a tragic orator, an iambic rhapsodist, O'Connell called him, who might have been leader, did not a greater tragedian occupy the stage. And Scheel was content to be O'Connell's organizer. Without O'Connell's voice or presence, he was his rhetorical superior, excelling in irony and the byplays of speech for which O'Connell was too exuberant. Scheel's speeches touch exquisite, though not the deep notes of O'Connell, 
whom he criticized for, quote, throwing out broods of sturdy young ideas upon the world without a rag to cover them, end quote. He discredited his master and his cause by taking office. The fruits of emancipation were tempting to those who had borne the heat of the day, but there was a rising school of patriots who refused acquiescence to anything less than total freedom. The young Irelanders reincarnated the men of ninety-eight. They were neither too late nor too soon. They snatched the sacred torch of liberty from the dying hands of O'Connell, who summoned in vain old Ireland against his young rivals. But men like Davis and Duffy appealed to types O'Connell never swayed. He could carry the mob, but poet, journalist, and idealist were enrolled with young Ireland. For this reason, the history of their failure is brighter in literature than the tale of O'Connell's triumphs. To read Duffy's Young Ireland and Mitchell's Jail Journal with the drafts from the spirit of the nation is to relive the period. Without the Young Irelanders, Irish nationalism might not have survived the famine. Mitchell, as open advocate of physical force, became father to Fenianism. An honest conspirator and brilliant writer, he proved that the pen of journalism was sharper than the Irish pike. Carlyle described him as, quote, a fine, elastic-spirited young fellow, whom I grieve to see rushing on destruction palpable by attack of windmills, end quote. Destruction came surely, but coupled with immortality. He was transported as a felon before the insurrection, while his writings sprang up in angry but unarmed men. Mitchell and O'Connell both sought the liberation of Ireland, but their viewpoint differed. Mitchell thought only of liberty. O'Connell, not unnaturally, considered the liberator. His refusal to allow a drop of blood to be shed caused young Ireland to secede. Only when death removed his influence could the pent-up feelings of the country break out under Smith O'Brien. If Mitchell was an Irish Robespierre, O'Brien was their Lafayette. His advance from the level of dead aristocracy had been rapid. From defending Whigs in Parliament, he passed to opposition and contempt of the House. He resigned from the bench from which O'Connell had been dismissed, became a repealer, adding the words, no compromise, and finally gloried in his treason before the House. His next step brought a price upon his head. Grave and frigid, but inwardly warm-hearted and passionate, O'Brien had little aptitude for rebellion. But the death penalty, commuted to transportation which he incurred, went far to redeem his forlorn failure. Mitchell, who shared his Australian imprisonment, left a fine picture of, quote, this noblest of Irishmen thrust in among the off-scourings of England's jails, with his home desolated and his hopes ruined, and defeated life falling into the sear and yellow leaf, a man who cannot be crushed or bowed or broken, anchored immovably upon his own brave heart within, his clear eye and soul open as ever to all the melodies and splendors of heaven and earth, and calmly waiting for the angel death. End quote. The Irish cause was not revived until the Fenian movement, disgust with the politicians, drove the noblest into their ranks. In Stevens they found an organizing chief, in Boyle O'Reilly a poet, and in John O'Leary a political thinker, men who, under other conditions, had achieved mundane success. The Fenians were defended by Isaac Butt, a big-hearted, broad-minded lawyer, who afterwards organized a party to convince Englishmen that repeal was innocuous when called home rule. The people stood his patient ways patiently, but when a more desperate leader arrived, they transferred allegiance, and Butt died of a broken heart. Parnell took his place and began to marshal the broken forces of Irish democracy against his own class. Butt had been a polite parliamentarian, reverencing the courtesy of debate and at heart loving the British Constitution. Parnell felt that his mission lay in breaking rather than interpreting the law. The well-bred house stared and protested when he defied their chosen six hundred. Parnell faced them with their own marble callousness. 
he outdid them in political cynicism and outbowed them in frigid courtesy, while maintaining a policy before which tradition melted and a time-honored system collapsed. In one stormy decade, he tore the cloak from the mother of parliaments, reducing her to a plain-speaking democratic machine. Through the breach he made, the English Labour Party has since entered. He united priest and peasant, physical and moral force under him. He could lay Ireland under storm or lull at his pleasure. His achievement equaled his self-confidence. He reversed the Irish land system and threw English politics out of gear. With a balance of power in his hand, he made Tory and Radical outbid each other for his support. He was no organizer or orator, but he fascinated able men to conduct his schemes as Napoleon used his marshals. On a pregnant day, he equaled the achievement of St. Paul and converted Gladstone, who had once been his jailer. Gladstone became a home ruler, and henceforth English politics knew no peace. Parnell stood for the fall and rise of many. Under his banner, Irish peasants became human beings with human rights. He felled the feudal class in Ireland and undermined them in England. Incalculable forces were set to destroy him. A forged letter in the Times classed him with assassins, while a legal commission was sent to try his whole movement. It is history that his triumphant vindication was followed by a greater fall. The happiness of Ireland was sucked into the maelstrom of his ruin. He refused to retire from leadership at Gladstone's bidding, and Ireland staggered into civil war. The end is known. Parnell died as he lived. Of his moral fault, there is no palliation, but it may be said he held his country's honour dearer than his own, for he could not bear to see her win even independence by obeying the word of an Englishman. Irish Heroines by Alice Milligan The worth and glory of a nation may well be measured and judged by the typical character of its womanhood. Not so much, I would say, by the eminence attained to by the rarely gifted, exceptionally developed individuals, as by the prevalence of noble types at every period and amongst all classes of the community, and by their recurrence from age to age under varying circumstances of national fortune. Judged by such a standard, Ireland emerges triumphant and points to the role of her chequered history, the story of her ancient race, with confidence and pride. Gaze into the furthest vistas of her legendary past, into the remotest eras of which tradition preserves a misty memory, and the figure of some fair noble woman stands forth glimmering like a white statue against the gloom. At every period of stern endeavour, through all the generations of recorded time, the pages of our annals are inscribed with the names of mothers, sisters, wives, not unworthy to stand there beside those of the world-renowned heroes of the Gael. In the ancient tales of Ireland we read of great female physicians and distinguished female lawyers and judges. There were Banfilla, or women poets, who, like the Phila, were at the same time soothsayers and poetesses, and there are other evidences of the high esteem in which women were held. There can be no doubt, to judge by the elaborate descriptions of garments in the saga texts, that the women were very skilful in weaving and needlework. The Irish peasant girls of today inherit from them not a little of their gift for lace-making and linen embroidery. Ladies of the highest rank practice needlework as an accomplishment and a recreation. Some of the scissors and shears they used have come to light in excavations. In the stories of the loves of the ancient Irish, whether immortals or mortals, the woman's role is the more accentuated, while in Teutonic tradition man plays the chief part. Again, it has often been remarked that the feminine interest is absent from the earlier heroic forms of some literatures. Not so, however, in the earliest saga texts of the Irish. Many are the famous women to whom the old tales introduce us and who stand out and compel attention like the characters of the Greek drama. Everyone knows of the faithful Deirdre, the heroine of the touching story of the exile of the sons of Usnoc, and of her death, of the proud and selfish Maeve, the ambitious Queen of Connacht, the most warlike and most expert in the use of weapons of the women of the Gael, 
far superior in combat and counsel to her husband, Elil, of Emer, the faithful wife of Cuchulain, of Etin of the Horses, that was her name in Fairyland, and of many others too numerous to mention. It is with the introduction of Christianity into Ireland that the Irish woman came into her rightful place and attained the preponderating influence which she, ever since, has held among the Celtic people. In the period which followed the evangelization of the island, many were the women of worth who upheld the honour and glory of Inish Fall the Fair, and women were neither the less numerous nor the less ardent who hung upon the lips of the Apostle of Ireland. Amid the galaxy of the saints, how lustrous, how divinely fair shines the star of Bridget, the shepherd maiden of Focard, the disciple of Patrick the Apostle, the guardian of the holy light that burned beneath the oak trees of Kildare. Over all Ireland and through the Hebridean Isles, she is renowned above any other. We think of her, moreover, not alone, but as the centre of a great company of cloistered maidens, the refuge and helper of the sinful and sorrowful, who found in the gospel that Patrick preached a message of consolation and deliverance. Let it be remembered that the shroud of Patrick is deemed to have been woven by Bridget's hand, that when she died in 525, Colum Kill, the future apostle of Scotland, was a child of four. So she stands midmost of that trilogy of saints whose dust is said to rest in down. Who that hears of Colum Kill will forget how he won that name, Dove of the Church, because of his early piety and that surely bespeaks a mother's guiding care. Etna, mother of Colm Kill, remains a vague but picturesque figure, seen against the background of the rugged heath-clad hills of Tyrconnell by the bright blue waters of Garton's Triple Lake. Her hearthstone or couch is shown there to this day, where, once in slumber, before the birth of her son, she saw in a glorious visionary dream a symbol of his future greatness. A vast veil woven of sunshine and flowers seemed to float down upon her from heaven, an exquisitely poetic thought which gives us warrant to believe that Columkill's poetic skill was inherited from his mother. Ronnet, the mother of his biographer St. Adam Nunn, plays a more notable part in history, for, according to an ancient Gaelic text recently published, it was to her that the women of Ireland owed the royal decree which liberated them from military service. The story goes that once, as she walked beside the Boyne, after some sanguinary conflict, she came upon the bodies of two women who had fallen in battle. One grasped a reaping hook, the other a sword, and dreadful wounds disfigured them. Horrified at the sight, she brought strong pressure to bear upon her son, and his influence in the councils of the land availed to bring about the promulgation of the decree which freed women from war service. Our warrior kings had noble queens to rule their households, and of these none stands out so distinctly after long lapse of time as Gormley, the daughter of Flan Shunna, and wife of Neil Glondov. Her story has in it that element of romance which touches the heart and wins the sympathy of all who hear it. Her father was king of the Mahan branch of the Clan Neil and Ardry of Ireland for thirty-seven years. Neil Glondov was king of Tyrone and heir of Flan in the High Kingship, for at that era it was the custom for the kings of Meath and of Tyrone to hold the supreme power alternately. In order to knit north and south, Flan betrothed his beautiful daughter to Cormac Macquillanan, king of Cashel an ideal husband, one would have thought, for a poetess like Gormley, for Cormac was the foremost scholar of the day. But his mind was so set on learning and religion that he took holy orders and became Bishop King of Cashel, repudiating his destined bride. Gormley was then given as wife to Ciarvel, King of Leinster, and war was waged against Cormac, who was killed in the Battle of Ballymoon. Coming home wounded, Ciarvel lay on his couch, and while tended by Gormley and her ladies, told the story of the battle and boasted of having insulted the dead body of King Cormac. Gormley reproached him for his ignoble conduct in such terms that his anger and jealousy flamed up, and striking her with his fist he hurled her to the ground. Gormley rose indignant and left his house forever, returning to the palace of King Flan, and on Carvel's death she at last found a true lover and worthy mate in Neil Glondov, who brought her northward to rule over the famous palace of Ailoc. In 916 Neil became High King, but the place of honour was also the place of danger, and soon he led the mustered hosts of the north against the pagan foreigners who held Dublin and Fingal, and he fell in battle at Rathfarnham. A poem, preserved for us ever since, tells us that Gormley was present at his burial and chanted a funeral ode. Her long widowhood was a period of disconsolate mourning. 
At length it is said she had a dream or vision in which King Neil appeared to her in such a lifelike shape that she spread her arms to embrace him, and thus wounded her breast against the carven headpost of her couch, and of that wound she died. Many saintly, many noble, many hospitable and learned women lightened the darkness that fell over Ireland after the coming of the Normans. I pass to the time when a sovereign lady filled the throne of England, the spacious days of Great Elizabeth, which were also the period of Ireland's greatest, sternest struggle against a policy of extermination towards her nobles and suppression of her ancient faith. Amid all the heroes and leaders of that wondrous age in Ireland, there appears, like a reincarnation of legendary Maeve, a warlike queen in Connacht, Grace O'Malley, Granula of the Ballads. Instead of a chariot, she mounts to the prow of a swift-sailing galley and sweeps over the wild Atlantic billows, from isle to isle, from coast to coast, taking tribute, or is it plunder, from the clans. First an O'Flaherty is her husband, then a Norman Burke. In Clare Island they show her the castle tower, with a hole in the wall, through which they say she tied a cable from her ship, ready by day or night for a summons from her seamen. She voyaged as far as London town and stood face to face with the roughed and hooped Elizabeth, meeting her offer of an English title with the assertion that she was a princess in her own land. The mother of Red Hugh O'Donnell, Ineen Dove, though daughter of the Scottish Lord of the Isles, was nonetheless of the old Irish stock. Her character is finely sketched for us by the Franciscan chronicler who wrote the story of the captivity and mighty deeds of her son. When the clans of Tyrconnell assembled to elect the youthful chieftain, he writes, it was an advantage that she came to the gathering, for she was the head of the advice and counsel of the Kinel Connell, and though she was slow and deliberate and much praised for her womanly qualities, she had the heart of a hero and the soul of a soldier. Her daughter, Nula, is the woman of the piercing wail in Mangan's translation of the Bard's Lament for the death of the Ulster chieftains in Rome. Modern critics like to interpret the Dark Rosaline poem as an expression of Red Hugh's devotion to Ireland but I think that Rose, O'Doherty's daughter, wife of the peerless Owen Roe, deserves recognition as she whose wholly delicate white hands should girdle him with steel. The record has come down to us that she prompted and encouraged her husband to return from the Low Countries and a position of dignity in a foreign court to command the war in Ireland, and in her first letter, ere she followed him over sea, she asked eagerly, How stands Tyrconnell? True daughter of Ulster was Owen's wife so let us henceforth acknowledge her as the Roisin Dove, Dark Rosaline of the sublimest of all patriot songs. In the Cromwellian and Williamite wars, we see the mournful mothers and daughters of the Gaeldom passing in sad processions to Connacht, or wailing on Shannon banks for the flight of the wild geese. But what of Limerick Wall? What of the valorous rush of the women of the beleaguered city to stem the inroads of the besiegers and rally the defenders to the breach? The decree of St. Adam Nunn was quite forgotten then and when manly courage for a moment was daunted, woman's fortitude replaced and re-inspired it. And fortitude was sorely needed through the black years that followed, the penal days, when Ireland, crushed in the dust, bereft of arms, achieved a sublimer victory than did even King Brian himself, champion of the cross, against the last muster of European heathendom. Yes, her women have done their share in making Ireland what she is, a heroic land, unconquered by long centuries of wrath and wrong, a land that has not abandoned its faith through stress of direst persecution or bartered it for the lure of worldly dominion, no, nor ever yielded to despair in face of repeated national disaster. It was this fidelity to principle on the part of the Irish Catholic people which won for them the alliance of all that were worthiest among the Protestants of North and South in the days of the Volunteers and the United Irishmen. What interesting and pathetic portraits of Irish women are added to our role at this period? None is more tenderly mournful than that of Sarah Curran, the beloved of Robert Emmet. The graceful prose of Washington Irving, the poignant verses of Moore, have enshrined the memory of her, weeping for him in the shadow of the scaffold, dying of heartbreak at last in a far-off land. No more need be said of her, for whom the pity of the whole world has been awakened by song allied to sweetest, saddest music. What of Anne Devlin, Emmet's faithful servant? helping in his preparations for insurrection, aiding his flight, shielding him in hiding, even when tortured, scourged, half-hanged by a brutal soldiery, with stern-shut lips refusing to utter a word to compromise her master Robert. What of the sister of Henry Joy McCracken, Mary, the friend and fellow-worker with the Belfast United Irishmen, 
An independent, self-reliant businesswoman, she earned the money which she gave so liberally in the good cause, or to help the poor and distressed, through the whole period of a long life. Some still living have seen Mary passing along the streets of Belfast, an aged woman, clad in sombre gown, to whom Catholic artisans raised their caps reverently, remembering how in ninety-eight she had walked hand in hand with her brother to the steps of the scaffold and how, in 1803, she had aided Thomas Russell in his escape from the North after Emmett's failure, had bribed his captors after arrest, provided for his defence, and preserved for futurity a record of his dying words. Madden's History of the United Irishmen, as far as it tells of the North, is mainly the record that she kept as a sacred trust in letters, papers, long-treasured memories of the men who fought and died to make Ireland a united nation. And now a scene in America comes last to my mind. Wolf Tone, a political fugitive who has served Ireland well and come through danger to safety, is busy laying the foundations of a happy and prosperous future with a beloved wife and sister and young children to brighten his home. An estate near Princeton, New Jersey, has been all but bought, possibilities of a career in the New Republic open before him, when a letter comes from Belfast, asking him to return to the post of danger to undertake a mission to France for the sake of Ireland. Let his own pen describe what happened. I handed the letter to my wife and sister and desired their opinion, my wife especially, whose courage and whose zeal for my honour and interest were not in the least abated by all her past sufferings, supplicated me to let no consideration of her or our children stand for a moment in the way of my duty to our country, adding that she would answer for our family during my absence and that the same providence which had so often, as it were, miraculously preserved us would not desert us now. Inspired by the fortitude of this noble woman, Tone went forth on his perilous mission, and similarly the young Ireland leaders, Mitchell and Smith O'Brien, were sustained by the courage of their nearest and dearest. Eva, the poetess of the nation, gave her troth plight to one who had prison and exile to face ere he could claim her hand. Other names recur to me. Speranza with her lyric fire, Ellen O'Leary, fervent and still patient and wise, Fanny Parnell and her sister. And what of the women of Ireland today? Shall they come short of the high ideal of the past, falter and fail if devotion and sacrifice are required of them? Never, whilst they keep in memory and honour the illustrious ones of whom I have written. The name of Irish woman today stands for steadfast virtue, for hospitality, for simple piety, for cheerful endurance. And in a changing world, let us trust it is the will of God that in this there will be no change. Irish Nationality Irish Nationality by Lord Ashbourne Note, this chapter was written by Lord Ashbourne in French, because he is so strong an Irishman that he objects to write it in English. This translation has been made by the editors. To those of us who are interested in the future of our country, there is at this very moment presented a really serious problem. The political struggle of the last century has been so intense that many of our people have come to have none but a political solution in view. For them, the whole question is one of politics, and they will continue to believe that Ireland will have found salvation the moment we get home rule or something like it. Such an attitude seems natural enough when we remember what our people have suffered in the past. Nevertheless, on a little reflection, this error, for error it is, and an enormous one too, will be quickly dissipated. In the first place, the political struggle of today is only the continuation of a conflict which has lasted 700 years. And in point of fact, we have a right to be proud that after so many trials there still remains to us anything of our national inheritance. We find ourselves indeed on the battlefield, somewhat seriously bruised, but we can console ourselves with the thought that our opponent is in equally doleful case, that he is beginning to suffer from a fatal weariness, and that he is anxious to make peace with us. In order to place the present political situation in its true light, and to take into account its comparatively limited importance, we must not lose sight of the fundamental fact that what home rule connotes is rather a tender of peace on the part of Ireland than a gift which England presents us of her own free will. In fact, our neighbour across the Channel has as much interest as ourselves, and perhaps even more, in bringing the struggle to an end. Through us, 
England has already lost much prestige, and that famous British constitution, which in times past everyone admired, while trying in vain to imitate it, has lost caste considerably. I am not now speaking of the danger which an Ireland discontented and even hostile, and having nothing to lose, would constitute for England in case of war. It is especially from our neighbour's point of view that we can cry up home rule or any other solution that will bring peace. But let us leave to Great Britain the task of getting out of trouble as best she may. On our side, what shall we say of it? In our conflict with the English, we are not wearied. Rather, are we hardened for the fray. We have acquired the habit of fighting, and many of us can now scarcely regulate our conduct in a manner suitable to a state of peace with England. Nevertheless, as I have already said, we have not emerged unscathed from this war of the centuries. National sentiment remains with us, no doubt, and our traditions are not wholly lost, especially among the country people of the West. But our commerce is almost ruined, and the national language is no longer spoken throughout the greater part of the country. It is true that a continuation of the hitherto existing state of war cannot do us much harm, that for purposes of mere destruction all the advantages are on our side, and that on the other hand we can begin a reconstruction at home without waiting for a treaty of peace to be signed. But we have some things to do for which a home government would be useful to us, and further, in the absence of such a government, it would be difficult to imagine what means could be employed to turn the people away from their too exclusive absorption in Anglo-Irish politics. It is then, from a practical point of view, that we wish for peace. But we may lawfully ask, will not this peace bring with it a special danger against which we ought to take precautions? As a matter of fact, there is such a danger, and it lies in the fact that the people have been to so great an extent obsessed by the political struggle that they run the risk, once their end is attained, of collapsing and of losing interest in the national question. Let us not forget that the question is to save our language and our civilization. Without it, it is all over for our nationality. Let us endeavor to turn our Parliament to account in order to work seriously on the reconstruction of our national life, and it is certain that Ireland will find therein her salvation. We can therefore take advantage either of England's prolonged resistance or of peace. If England decides to continue the contest, she will suffer more from it than we. Her empire, her institutions, her safety will be more and more impaired. Well, as for us, there will result a strong growth in patriotism and an anti-British bitterness. What we have to do right now is to take our bearings in such a way that no matter what happens to England, our own future shall be assured. We can do it if we wish it. The question is, shall we wish it? Here it may be objected, qui bono? The English language is quite enough for us. We have it now and we speak it, sometimes even better than the English people themselves. We are proud of using the same language as Sheridan, Burke and Grattan used. Such an opinion has its modicum of truth, though less now than a hundred years ago. Formerly there was in Ireland, and especially around Dublin, a little colony of Anglo-Irish. The members of this colony spoke a very pure and classic English, and this fact is largely responsible for the place which Ireland at one time held in English literature, but during the last century the remains of this colony have been swamped beneath a flood of half-anglicized people, of Irishmen from the country districts, who were formally excluded, and who brought with them such a mixture of expressions and of phonetic tendencies derived from the Gaelic that the language of Grattan, Sheridan and Burke has well nigh gone out of existence. The reason of this is that since the date of Catholic emancipation, most careers are open to everybody. The result has been that the newly enfranchised majority has ultimately absorbed the minority, and that the atmosphere of culture of which we have just spoken has disappeared. We thus reach an island which in a sense has neither culture nor language, a country in which the Gaelic spoken by a people humiliated and deeply demoralized by an anti-Catholic legislation 
which was both savage and degrading, tended to coalesce with an English already condemned to death. It is from the moment when the Catholics had finally triumphed over persecution that we must date the beginning of that political struggle with which we are familiar, a struggle which has resulted in absorbing all the energies of a great part of the population. That is why this tremendous problem presents itself to us at the very same time when we should be justified in feeling ourselves elated by triumph because of our victories in Parliament. And let not England rejoice too much at our dilemma. If we are doomed to die, she will die with us. For before disappearing, we shall prove to be a great destructive force. And out of the ruins of the British power, we shall raise such a monument that future generations will know what it costs to murder a nation. But if possible, we must live and let live. The elements of Reconstruction are always at hand. Anglo-Irish culture is indeed dead, but Gaelic culture is only seriously sick. And on that side, there is always room for hope. Sooth to say, its sickness consists above all in the fact that the Irish language is no longer spoken in the great part of the country. But on the other hand, where it is preserved, that same language is spoken in all its purity. By going there to find it, all Ireland will gradually become Gaelic. But it will be objected. What a loss of time and energy! If it is a question of languages, why not learn one of the more useful ones? To this we may reply that while English deforms the mouth and makes it incapable of pronouncing any language which is not spoken from the tip of the lips, Gaelic on the contrary so exercises the organs of speech that it renders easy the acquisition and the practice of most European idioms. Let us add, by way of example, that French, which is usually difficult for strangers, is much more within the compass of Irishmen who speak Irish, no less because of certain linguistic customs than from the original relationship between the two languages. This remark brings us to another objection which is often lodged against our movement. It is urged that Ireland is already isolated enough and that by making a Gaelic-speaking nation, we shall make that state of affairs still worse. English, say the objectors, is spoken more or less everywhere, while Gaelic will never be able to claim the position of a quasi-universal language. To this line of reasoning, it might be answered, for one thing, that no one can tell how far Gaelic will go in case our movement is a success, and that many a language formerly universal is today as dead as a doornail. But we must look at the question from another point of view. John Bull's language is spread everywhere, while he himself retains the most exclusive insularity. He travels to every land and there finds his own language and his own customs. Now, it goes without saying that from this very universalization, his language is corrupted and becomes vulgarized. The idiom of Shakespeare and Milton gives place gradually to the idiom of the seaports. Furthermore, far from isolating us, Gaelic will tend to put us in touch with the civilization of the West. As a people, anglicized and badly anglicized at that, we share and even exaggerate the faults which I have just described. It is Anglo-Saxon speech which isolates us, and we wish on this ground to break with it and to hold out our hand to our brothers of the continent. But it may be said, what a pity to dig yet another abyss between Ireland and Great Britain, for it is with the latter that our geographical position will always link us for common defence. For while it is true that history does not show us a single case of an empire which has not sooner or later fallen to pieces, nevertheless, whatever happens, the two islands will be necessarily forced to cooperate for the common good. Well, let us take it that many things will so fall out, and let us suppose an anglicized Ireland called upon to face such a situation. It would be a revolutionary island, a restless island, an island seeking vaguely for revenge on someone, deprived of really national character, and in a general way suspecting England of responsibility 
for the disappearance from our country of everything that constitutes the idea of nationality. And let us remark that we are no longer living in those good old times when entire nations allowed themselves to be absorbed by their conquerors. The art of printing has changed all that. Today, a suppressed nation is one that will sooner or later have its revenge. Thus, let us suppose that we are destined to make political peace with England and to enter of our own accord into a Hiberno-Britannic confederation. From our point of view, what would be the result of that arrangement? The result would be strange. Here again, as in the case of Home Rule, it is rather we who offer advantages to England than she who offers them to us. Only in this latter case, the result depends on ourselves alone. If we die, it will be because we have wished it. Our language is not dead. On the contrary, although not widely spread, it is in itself much more alive than English, which, as a literary language, is in full decay. We may congratulate ourselves that our idiom is intact. Our civilization is old, but it has not yet lived its full life. If we wish, the future is ours, and let us truly believe that that is worthwhile. For the race, which has produced epics like that of Ossian, and all that magnificent literature which has been preserved for us through the ages, the race that gave to Europe that great impulse of missionary activity, which is associated with the names of Columkill, Brendan, Columbanus, and Gaul, not to mention men like the famous Scotus Erigena. That race is certainly called upon to play an important part in the modern world. But, let us repeat it, it must have the wish. Famous Irish Societies by John O'Day, National Historian, AOH In the social organization of no nation of antiquity were societies of greater influence than in pagan Ireland. During many centuries these societies, composed of the Bards, Olavs, Brayons, Druids, and Knights, contended for precedence. In no country did the literary societies display greater vigor and exercise a more beneficent power than in pagan Ireland. Although the Hebrews and other Asiatic nations had societies organized from among the professions, yet in Ireland alone these societies seem to have been constructed with a patriotic purpose, and in Ireland alone they seem to have had ceremonies of initiation with constitutions and laws. These societies existed from the earliest times until after the coming of St. Patrick. Traces of them are visible during all the centuries from the conversion of Ireland down to the Anglo-Norman epoch, and it is apparent that the clan system and the introduction of the feudal system by the English failed to eliminate completely their influence. When the Irish emigration flowed towards the American colonies in the 18th century, the social instinct early found expression in societies. One of the earliest of these was founded in Boston, where, in 1737, 26, quote, gentlemen, merchants, and others, natives of Ireland or of Irish extraction, unquote, organized the Charitable Irish Society. In Pennsylvania, where the Irish emigration had been larger than in any other colony, the Hibernian Fire Company was organized in 1751. The Friendly Sons of St. Patrick was founded in Philadelphia in 1771, and about that time societies bearing this name were founded in Boston and New York, as convivial clubs welcoming Irish immigrants to their festive boards. These societies were formed upon the model of the Friendly Brothers of St. Patrick, which had existed in Dublin and other Irish cities a generation before, and was well and favorably known throughout Ireland. The Society of the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick in Philadelphia contained some of the most prominent merchants and leading citizens of the city, and in 1780 they subscribed 103,000 pounds, or one-third of the sum collected, to supply the Continental Army with food. Among its members were Commodore Barry, the father of the American Navy, General Stephen Moylan, General Anthony Wayne, and the great merchants Blair McClenahan, Thomas Fitzsimmons, and Robert Morris. Washington, who was an honorary member, described it, quote, as a society distinguished for the firm adherence of its members to the glorious cause in which we are embarked, unquote. Whether upon the field or upon the sea, in council or in the sacrifice of their wealth, their names are foremost in the crisis of the revolution. 
The Hibernian Society for the Relief of Emigrants from Ireland was founded in Philadelphia on March 3, 1790. Other Hibernian societies, with the same title and organized for the same purpose, were founded in other cities along the Atlantic coast in the early years of the 19th century. But the Philadelphia Hibernian Society was, from the character of its members, the extent of its beneficence, and the length of its existence, the most famous. The emigrants from Ireland during the 18th century had pushed on to the frontier, or in some instances remained in the cities and engaged successfully in mercantile pursuits. The emigration which came after the revolution was, however, in great part composed of families almost without means. Unable to subsist while clearing farms in the virgin forest, thousands were congested in the cities. The Hibernian Society extended a ready and strong hand to these helpless people, and not only aided the emigrants with gifts of money, but also secured for them employment, disseminated among them useful information, and provided them with medical attendance. While the Hibernian Society was regarded as the successor of the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick, yet the two societies, which contained largely a membership role bearing the same names, flourished in the work of patriotism side by side. The first officers of the Hibernian Society for the Relief of Emigrants from Ireland were President Chief Justice Thomas McCain, Vice President General Walter Stewart, Secretary Matthew Carey, the historian, Treasurer John Taylor. It was said that no other society in America contained so many men distinguished in civil, military, and official life as the Hibernian Society. In almost every city where the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick and the Hibernian Society for the Relief of Emigrants were found, there was a close and intimate connection between them, which ultimately resulted in amalgamation. The ancient order of Hibernians traces its origin to those orders which flourished in pagan Ireland, and which exercised so potent an influence upon the history of the Celtic race. The Order of Knighthood was the first of these orders to be founded. It existed from the earliest times and is visible in the annals of the nation until the Anglo-Normans invaded the land in the 12th century. In pagan Ireland, the knightly orders became provincial standing armies, and there are many glorious pages describing the feats of the Clan Adea of Munster, the Clan Morna of Connacht, the Feeney of Leinster, and the Knights of the Red Branch of Ulster. When the island was Christianized, these knightly orders were among the staunchest supporters of the missionary priests, and were consecrated to the service of the Church in the 6th century, assuming the cross as their distinctive emblem and becoming the defenders of religion. Among the names which are upon the rolls of the ancient orders of knighthood are those of most of the kings, bards, saints, and statesmen, and in the long list there was no family of greater renown than that of Roderick the Great, to which belonged Connell Carnac and Logod, who, according to McGagan and others, were the direct ancestors of the O'Moores of Leeks. In this family, the ancient splendor of the knightly orders was a tradition which survived for centuries, and they were an almost continual rebellion against the English, from the siege of Dublin by Roderick O'Connor until the rebellion against Queen Elizabeth, led by Rory Ogui O'Moore and his son Owen in the latter part of the 16th and the early 17th century. A nephew of Rory Ogui, the sagacious and statesmanlike Rory O'Moore, revived the ancient orders in the Catholic Confederation of Kilkenny in 1642. A grandson of Rory O'Moore, Patrick Sarsfield, Earl of Lucan, was the most distinguished commander of Irish armies who opposed in Ireland the forces of William of Orange. There's no stranger story in all history than the intimate connection of the O'Moore family with the annals of the ancient order of Hibernians. The lineage of this family furnishes the links connecting the ancient orders of pagan Ireland through the centuries with the ancient order in modern times. Under the names of Rapparees, White Boys, Defenders, Ribbon Men, etc., the Confederation of Kilkenny was carried on through the 17th and 18th centuries until the 19th. At various times, the duties of these organizations were subject to local conditions. Thus, the defenders were occupied in protecting themselves and their priests against the hostility of the penal laws, engaging in armed conflict with the orange men in the north, while the white boys were waging war against the atrocities of landlordism in the south. Between these two organizations, there was a secret code, which operated until they were combined under the name of ribbon men in the early 19th century. The contentions of the white boys regarding Irish landlordism have since been acknowledged to be just, and have been enacted into statutes. The defenders joined with Wolf Tone in the formation of the United Irishmen.
About 1825, the Ribbon Men changed their name to St. Patrick's Fraternal Society, and branches were established in England and Scotland under the name of the Hibernian Funeral Society. In 1836, a charter was received by members in New York City and in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania. The headquarters were for some years in Pennsylvania, but in 1851, a charter was granted to the New York divisions under the name of the Ancient Order of Hibernians. New York thus became the American headquarters. National conventions were held there until 1878, since which year they have been held in many other cities biennially. Many of the most distinguished leaders of the Irish race in America have been members of the order, and from a humble beginning, with a few emigrants gathered together in a strange land, the membership has grown to nearly 200,000. General Thomas Francis Marr, Colonel Michael Doheny, General Michael Corcoran, and Colonel John O'Mahony were among the members in the late 50s. Among the organizations which have sprung from the ranks of the AOH were the powerful Fenian Brotherhood, the Emmett Monument Association, and scores of smaller associations in all sections of the United States and Canada. During the Know Nothing Riots, the Order furnished armed defenders for the Catholic churches in New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston, and it has ever been foremost in preserving its position as the hereditary defender of the faith. In 1894, the Ladies Auxiliary was founded, and this body of women numbered in 1914 over 63,000, and had donated great sums to charity, education, and religion. The AOH had, in 1914, assets of $2,230,000. It pays annually for charity, sick and death benefits and maintenance over $1 million, and during its existence in America has donated nearly $20 million to works of beneficence. One of the most celebrated of the gifts of the Order was the endowment of the Chair of Celtic in the Catholic University of America and one of its greatest gifts to charity was its contribution of $40,000 to the sufferers from the San Francisco earthquake. The Clan na Gael is a society organized to secure the independence of Ireland by armed revolution. Its organization is secret, and it is the successor of the Irish Revolutionary Brotherhood, called in America the Fenian Brotherhood, which promoted many daring raids and risings in Ireland in 1867. The IRB was perfected by James Stevens in Ireland and by John O'Mahony in America from 1857 to 1867. An invasion of Canada was made in great force under the general direction of Colonel William R. Roberts, president of the Fenian Brotherhood, but was unsuccessful owing to the attitude of the United States government, which declared that the Fenians were violating the principles of neutrality. After the disorganization of the Fenian Brotherhood, the idea of revolution languished until revived by the founding of the Clan na Gael by Jerome J. Collins in 1869, and the membership during the 20 years from 1880 to 1900 included almost 50,000 of the flower of the men of Irish blood in America. The principle of revolution was first given organized public expression in America through the formation in 1848 of the Irish Republican Union which was succeeded by the Emmett Monument Association, these societies influencing the creation of the 69th and 75th Regiments of the New York State Militia, and the 9th Massachusetts, which became so famous for valor during the Civil War. Although not putting forth all its strength so as to allow full scope to the parliamentary efforts to ameliorate the state of the Irish people, the Clan na Gael is as vigorous a section as ever of the forces organized for the service of patriotism. The Land League, founded in Ireland in 1879, was transplanted to America in 1880, when the first branch was established in New York City through the efforts of Patrick Ford, John Boyle O'Reilly, John Devoy, and others. Michael Davitt soon after came to America and traveled through the country founding branches of the League. In a few years, the whole American continent was organized, and in this organization, Michael Davitt declared that the members of the Ancient Order of Hibernians and the Clan na Gael were everywhere foremost. To the enormous sums collected by the League in this country, and to the magnificent labors of Parnell, Davitt, Redmond, Ferguson, Dillon, Kettle, Webb, and others in Ireland, is due in a large measure the present improved state of the people, resulting from the sacrifices made by those who supported this greatest of leagues devoted to the amelioration of unbearable economic conditions. A Ladies' Auxiliary to the Land League was established by the Sisters of Parnell, 
and was for some years a brilliant vindication of the power and justice of feminine participation in public questions. The Land League, the name of which was changed to the Irish National League in the early 80s, having prepared the path to eventual victory, declined in potency after the political movement was divided into Parnellites and Anti-Parnellites in 1890. The elements composing these rival parties were, through the initiative of William O'Brien, MP, and in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the United Irishmen of Wolf Tones Day, joined in 1898 under the name of the United Irish League, John E. Redmond becoming the first president, and also the chairman of the Parliamentary Party, which it had been instrumental in uniting. This organization is now a living, vital force in the affairs of Ireland on both sides of the Atlantic, Mr. Redmond being still its head, with Michael J. Ryan of Philadelphia as president of the American branch. The Knights of Columbus were organized in 1881 by Reverend Michael McGivney in New Haven, Connecticut, and a charter was granted by the Connecticut legislature on March 29, 1882. At first, the activity of the organization was confined to Connecticut, but the time was ripe for its mission, and it soon spread rapidly throughout New England. In 1896, it began to attract the attention of Catholic young men in other parts of the nation, and during the next few years, its appeal was made irresistibly in almost every state. It now exists in all the states of the Union, the Dominion of Canada, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Panama, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Cuba, and the Philippine Islands with a total membership of 328,000, of whom 108,000 are insurance members and 220,000 associate members. Its mortuary reserve fund is $4,500,000, being over $1 million more than is required by law. It is one of the most successful fraternal societies ever organized, and the Irish American Catholics have given to it the full strength of their enthusiasm and purpose. The temperance movement among Catholics was, from the visit of Father Matthew in 1849, largely Irish. The societies first formed were united by no bond until 1871, when the Connecticut societies formed a state union. Other states formed unions, and a national convention in Baltimore in 1872 created a national union. In 1878, there were 90,000 priests, laymen, women, and children in the Catholic Total Abstinence Benevolent Union. In 1883, the Union was introduced into Canada, and in 1895 there were 150,000 members on the American continent. From the CTABU were formed the Knights of Father Matthew, a total abstinence and semi-military body, first instituted in St. Louis in 1872. The Catholic Knights of America, with a membership chiefly Irish-American, were organized in Memphis, Tennessee in 1877 and the advantages offered for insurance soon attracted 20,000 members. The decade of the 70s was prolific of Irish Catholic associations. The Catholic Benevolent Legion was founded in 1873, shortly followed by the Catholic Mutual Benevolent Association, the Catholic Order of Foresters, which started in Massachusetts and spread to other states, the Irish Catholic Benevolent Union, and the Society of the Holy Name, which latter, although tracing its origin to Lisbon in 1432, is yet dominantly Irish in America. In the large industrial centers, there are scores of Irish county and other societies composed of Irishmen and Irish Americans, organized for the service of country and faith, beneficence and education, and all dedicated to the uplifting of humanity and to the progress of civilization. The ancient genius for organization has not been lost. The spirit of brotherhood pulsates strongly in the Irish heart, and through its powerful societies, the race retains its place in the advance of mankind. The Irish in the United States by Michael J. O'Brien, Historiographer, American Irish Historical Society Students of early American history will find in the colonial records abundant evidence to justify the statement of Ramsey, the historian of South Carolina, when he wrote in 1789 that the colonies which now form the United States may be considered as Europe transplanted, Ireland, England, Scotland, France, Germany, Holland, Switzerland, Sweden, Poland, and Italy furnished 
the original stock of the present population, and are generally supposed to have contributed to it in the order named. For the last seventy or eighty years, no nation has contributed so much to the population of America as Ireland. It will be astonishing to one who looks into the question to find that, in face of all the evidence that abounds in American annals, showing that our people were here on this soil fighting the battles of the colonists, and in a later day of the infant republic, thus proving our claim to the gratitude of this nation, America has produced men so ignoble and disingenuous as to say that the Irish who were here in revolutionary days were for the most part heartily loyal, that the combatants were of the same race and blood, and that the great uprising became in fact a contest between brothers. Although many writers have made inquiries into this subject, nearly all have confined themselves to the period of the Revolution. We are of the fighting race, and in our enthusiasm for the fighting man, the fact seems to have been overlooked that in other noble fields of endeavor, and in some respects infinitely more important, men of Irish blood have occupied prominent places in American history for which they have received but scant recognition. The pioneers before whose hands the primeval forests fell prostrate, the builders by whose magic touch have sprung into existence flourishing towns and cities where once no sounds were heard save those of nature and her wildest offspring, the orators who roused the colonists into activity and showed them the way to achieve their independence, the schoolmasters who imparted to the American youth their first lessons in intellectuality and patriotism. All have their place in history, and of these we can claim that Ireland furnished her full quota to the American colonies. It must now be accepted as an indisputable fact that a very large proportion of the earliest settlers in the American colonies were of Irish blood, for the Irish have been coming here since the beginning of the English colonization. It has been estimated by competent authorities that in the middle of the seventeenth century the English-speaking colonists numbered fifty thousand. Sir William Petty, the English statistician, tells us that during the decade from 1649 to 1659, the annual emigration from Ireland to the Western Continent was upwards of 6,000, thus making, in that space of time, 60,000 souls, or about one-half of what the whole population must have been in 1659. And from 1659 to 1672 there emigrated from Ireland to America the yearly number of 3,000. Dobbs on Irish Trade, Dublin, 1729. Prendergast, another noted authority in the Cromwellian settlement of Ireland, furnishes ample verification of this by the statistics which he quotes from the English records. Richard Hacklett, the chronicler of the first Virginia expeditions in his Voyages, Navigations, Traffics, and Discoveries of the English Nation, London, 1600, shows that Irishmen came with Raleigh to Virginia in 1587, and, in fact, the ubiquitous Celts were with Sir John Hawkins in his voyage to the Gulf of Mexico twenty years earlier. The famous work of John Camden Houghton, entitled The Original Lists of Persons of Quality, Emigrants, Religious Exiles, Political Rebels, Serving Men, Sold for a Term of Years, etc., who were brought to the Virginia plantations between 1600 and 1700, as well as his List of the Living and the Dead 
in Virginia in 1623, contains numerous Celtic names, and further evidence of these continuous migrations of the Irish is contained in A Book of Entry for Passengers Passing Beyond the Seas in the year 1632. The Virginia records also show that as early as 1621, a colony of Irish people sailed from Cork in the Flying Heart under the patronage of Sir William Noose and located at what is now Newport News, and some few years later, Daniel Gookin, a merchant of Cork, transported hither great multitudes of people and cattle from England and Ireland. In the William and Mary College Quarterly, in the transcripts of the original records published by the Virginia Historical Society, and in all county histories of Virginia, there are numerous references to the Irish redemptioners who were brought to that colony during the 17th century. But the redemptioners were not the only class who came, for the colonial records also contain many references to Irishmen of good birth and education who received grants of land in the colony, and who, in turn, induced many of their countrymen to emigrate. Planters named McCarty, Lynch, O'Neill, Sullivan, Farrell, MacDonnell, O'Brien, and others denoting an ancient Irish lineage appear frequently in the early records. Much that is romantic is found in the lives of these men and their descendants. Some of them served in the council chamber and the field. Their sons and daughters were educated to hold place with elegance and dignity with the foremost of the cavaliers. And when in after years the great conflict with England began, Virginians of Irish blood were among the first and the most eager to answer the call. Those historians who claim that the South was exclusively an Anglo-Saxon heritage would be completely disillusioned were they to examine the lists of colonial and revolutionary troops of Celtic name who held the Indians and the British at bay, and who helped in those troublous times to lay the foundations of a great republic. There is no portion of the Atlantic seaboard that did not profit by the Irish immigrations of the seventeenth century. We learn from the Irish state papers of the year 1595 that ships were regularly plying between Ireland and Newfoundland, and so important was the trade between Ireland and the far distant fishing banks that all English ships bound out always made provisions that the convoy out should remain forty-eight hours in Cork. In some of Lord Baltimore's accounts of his voyages to Newfoundland, he refers to his having sailed from Ireland, and to his return to Ireland, and so it is highly probable that he settled Irishmen on his Avalon plantations. After Baltimore's departure, Lord Falkland also sent out a number of Irish colonists, and, at a later date, they were so largely reinforced by settlers from Ireland that the Celtic part of the population at this day is not far short of equality in numbers with the Saxon portion. Hatton and Harvey, History of Newfoundland, page 32. Pedley attributes the large proportion of Irishmen and the influence of the Catholics in Newfoundland to Lord Falkland's company, and Prowse, in his history, pages 200 to 201, refers to the large number of Irishmen in that colony who fled from Waterford and Cork during the troubled times which preceded the Williamite War, 1688. Many of these in after years are known to have settled in New England. But it was to Maryland and Pennsylvania that the greatest flow of Irish immigration directed its course. In the celebrated Account of the Voyage to Maryland, written in the year 1634 by Mucius Vitalestus, the general of the Jesuit order, it is related that when the Ark and the Dove arrived in the West Indies in that year, 
they found the island of Montserrat inhabited by a colony of Irishmen who had been banished from Virginia on account of their professing the Catholic faith. It is known also that there were many families in Ireland of substance and good social standing who, at their own expense, took venture in the enterprise of Lord Baltimore and afterwards in that of William Penn, and who applied for and received grants of land, which, as the deeds on record show, were afterwards divided into farms, bought and settled by O'Briens, McCarthy's, O'Connor's, and many other of the ancient Gaelic race, the descendants of those heroic men, whose passion for liberty, while causing their ruin, inspired and impelled their sons to follow westward the star of empire. After the first English colonies in Maryland were founded, we find in all the proclamations concerning these settlements by the proprietary government that they were limited to persons of British or Irish descent. The religious liberty established in Maryland was the magnet which attracted Irish Catholics to that province, and so they came in large numbers in search of peace and comfort and freedom from the turmoil produced by religious animosities in their native land. The major part of this Irish immigration seems to have come in through the ports of Philadelphia and Charleston, and a portion through Chesapeake Bay, whence they passed on to Pennsylvania and the southern colonies. The certificates of land grants in Maryland show that it was customary for those Irish colonists to name their lands after places in their native country and I find that there is hardly a town or city in the old Gaelic strongholds in Ireland that is not represented in the nomenclature of the early Maryland grants. One entire section of the province, named the County of New Ireland, by proclamation of Lord Baltimore in the year 1684, was occupied wholly by Irish families. This section is now embraced in Cecil and Harford counties. New Ireland County was divided into three parts, known as New Connaught, New Munster, and New Leinster. New Connaught was founded by George Talbot from Roscommon, who was Surveyor General of the province, New Munster by Edward O'Dwyer from Tipperary, and New Leinster by Brian O'Daly from Wicklow, all of whom were in Maryland prior to 1683. Among the prominent men in the province may be mentioned Charles O'Carroll, who was secretary to the proprietor, John Hart, from County Cavan, who was governor of Maryland, from 1714 to 1720, Philip Connor, from Kerry, known in history as the last commander of Old Kent, Daniel Delaney, of the O. Delaney family from Queens County, one of the most famous lawyers in the American colonies, Michael Tawney, or Taney, ancestor of the celebrated judge, Roger Brooke Taney, the Corsis from Cork, one of the oldest families in the state, the Kings from Dublin, and many others. The only place in the state bearing a genuine Irish name which has reached any prominence is Baltimore. Not only has the monumental city received its name from Ireland, but the tract of land on which the city is now situate was originally named in 1695, Eli O'Carroll, after the barony of that name in Kings and Tipperary Counties, the ancient home of the clan O'Carroll. To subdivisions of the tract were given such names as Dublin, Waterford, Tralee, Rappo, Tremor, Mallow, Kinsale, Lurgan, Coleraine, Tipperary, Antrim, Belfast, Derry, Kildare, Enniskillen, Wexford, Letterkenny, Lifford, Burr, Galway, Limerick, and so on, all indicating the nationality of the patentees as well as the places from which they came. From such sources is the evidence available of the coming of the Irish to Maryland in large numbers, and so it is that we are not surprised to find on the rosters of the Maryland Revolutionary Regiments 4,633 
distinctive Irish names, exclusive of the large numbers who joined the navy and the militia, as well as those who were held to guard the frontier from Indian raids, whose names are not on record. However, it is not possible now to determine the proportion of the revolutionary soldiers who were of Irish birth or descent, for where the nationality is not stated in the rosters, all non-Irish names must be left out of the reckoning. The first census of Maryland, 1790, published by the United States government, enumerates the names of all heads of families and the number of persons in each family. A count of the Irish names shows approximately 21,000 persons. This does not take into account the great number of people who could not be recorded under that head, as it is known there were many thousand Irish redemptioners in Maryland prior to the taking of the census, and while no precise data exist to indicate the number of Irish immigrants who settled in Maryland, I estimate that the number of people of Irish descent in the state in 1790 was not far short of 40,000. The land records and council journals of Georgia of the last half of the 17th and the first half of the 18th century afford like testimony to the presence of the Irish who crossed the sea and colonized the waste places of that wild territory and whose descendants in after years contributed much of the strength of the patriot forces who confronted the armed cohorts of Carleton and Cornwallis. From the colonial records of Georgia, published under the auspices of the state legislature, I have extracted a long list of people of Irish name and blood who received grants of land in that colony. They came with Oglethorpe as early as 1735 and continued to arrive for many years. It was an Irishman named Mitchell who laid out the site of Atlanta, the metropolis of the South, and O'Brien founded the city of Augusta, and a McCormick named the city of Dublin, Georgia. From the records of the Carolinas, we obtain similar data, many of an absorbingly interesting character, and the number of places in that section bearing names of a decidedly Celtic flavor is striking evidence of the presence of Irish people, the line of whose settlements across the whole state of North Carolina may be traced on the high roads leading from Pennsylvania and Virginia. Hawk, one of the historians of North Carolina, refers to the Irish Romanists who were resident in that province as early as 1700, and Williamson says that the most numerous settlers in the northwestern part of the province during the first half of the 18th century were from Ireland. The manuscript records in the office of the Secretary of State refer to a shipload of immigrants who, in the year 1761, came to the Carolinas from Dublin. The names of the Irish pioneers in the Carolinas are found in every conceivable connection, in the parochial and court records, in the will books, in the minutes of the General Assembly, in the quaint old records of the land and registers offices in the patents granted by the colonial government, and in sundry other official records. In public affairs they seem to have had the same adaptability for politics, which, among other things, has in later days brought their countrymen into prominence. Florence O'Sullivan from Kerry was Surveyor General of South Carolina in 1671. James Moore, a native of Ireland and a descendant of the famous Irish chieftain Rory O'More, was governor of South Carolina in 1700. Matthew Rowan from Carrickfergus was president of the North Carolina Council during the term of office of his townsman, Governor Arthur Dobbs, 1754-1764. John Connor was attorney general of the province in 1730, and was succeeded in turn by David O'Sheill and Thomas Maguire. Cornelius Hartnett, Hugh Waddell, and Terence Sweeney 
All Irishmen were members of the court, and among the members of the provincial assembly I find such names as Murphy, Leary, Kearney, McLuhan, Dunn, Keenan, McManus, Ryan, Bork, Logan, and others showing an Irish origin, and in this connection we must not overlook Thomas Burke, a native of the City of the Tribes, distinguished as lawyer, soldier, and statesman, who became governor of North Carolina in 1781, as did his cousin, Adnes Burke, also from Galway, who was judge of the Supreme Court of South Carolina in 1778. John Rutledge, son of Dr. John Rutledge from Ireland, was governor of South Carolina in 1776, and his brother Edward became governor of the state in 1788. But there were Irishmen in the Carolinas long before the advent of these, and indeed Irish names are found occasionally as far back as the records of those colonies reach. They are scattered profusely through the will-books and records of deeds as early as 1676 and down to the end of the century, and in a list of immigrants from Barbados in the year 1678, quoted by John Camden Houghton in the work already alluded to, we find about 120 persons of Irish name who settled in the Carolinas in that year. In 1719, 500 persons from Ireland transported themselves to Carolina to take the benefit of an act passed by the Assembly by which the lands of the Yamasee Indians were thrown open to settlers, and Ramsey, History of South Carolina, Volume 1, page 20, says, Of all countries none has furnished the province with so many inhabitants as Ireland. In the Pennsylvania records, one is also struck with the very frequent mention of Irish names. William Penn had lived in Ireland for several years, and was acquainted with the sturdy character of its people, and when he arrived on board the Welcome in 1682, he had with him a number of Irishmen, who are described as people of property and people of consequence. In 1699 he brought over a brilliant young Irishman, James Logan from Lurgan, who for nearly half a century occupied a leading position in the province, and for some time was its governor. But the first Irish immigration to Pennsylvania of any numerical importance came in the year 1717. They settled in Lancaster County. They and their descendants, says Rupp, an impartial historian, have always been justly regarded as among the most intelligent people in the county, and their progress will be found to be but little behind the boasted efforts of the colony of Plymouth. In 1727, as the records show, 1,155 Irish people arrived in Philadelphia, and in 1728, the number reached the high total of 5,600. It looks as if Ireland is to send all her inhabitants hither, wrote Secretary Logan to the provincial proprietors in 1729, for last week not less than six ships arrived. The common fear is that if they continue to come, they will make themselves proprietors of the province. Rupp's History of Dauphin County the continuous stream of Irish immigration was viewed with so much alarm by the legislature that in 1728 a law was passed against these crowds of Irish papists and convicts who are yearly powered upon us, the convicts being the political refugees who fled from the persecutions of the English government. But the operations of this statute were wholly nullified by the captains of the vessels landing their passengers at Newcastle, Delaware, and Burlington, New Jersey, and, as one instance of this, I find in the Philadelphia American Weekly Mercury of August 14, 1729, a statement to this effect. It is reported from Newcastle that there arrived there this last week about 2,000 Irish, 
and an abundance more daily expectant. This expectation was realized, for, according to an account of passengers and servants landed in Philadelphia between December 25, 1728 and December 25, 1729, which I find in the New England Weekly Journal for March 30, 1730, the number of Irish who came in via the Delaware River in that year was 5,655, while the total number of all other Europeans who arrived during the same period was only 553. Holmes, in his Annals of America, corroborates this. The Philadelphia newspapers down to the year 1741 also contained many similar references, indicating that the flood of Irish immigration was unceasing and that it was at all times in excess of that from other European countries. Later issues of the Mercury also published accounts of the number of ships from Ireland which arrived in the Delaware, and from these it appears that from 1735 to 1738, 66 vessels entered Philadelphia from Ireland and 50 cleared thereto. And in the New York Gazette and Weekly Postboy of the years 1750 to 1752, I find under the caption, Vessels Registered at the Philadelphia Custom House, a total of 183 ships destined from or to Ireland or an average of five sailings per month between Irish ports and the port of Philadelphia alone. A careful search fails to disclose any record of the number of persons who came in these ships, but from the fact that it is stated that all carried passengers as well as merchandise from Irish ports, we may safely assume that the human freight must have been very large. Spencer, in his History of the United States, says, In the years 1771 and 1772, the number of emigrants to America from Ireland was 17,350, almost all of whom emigrated at their own expense. A great majority of them consisted of persons employed in the linen manufacture or farmers possessed of some property, which they converted into money and brought with them. Within the first fortnight of August 1773, there arrived at Philadelphia 3,500 immigrants from Ireland, as most of the emigrants, particularly those from Ireland and Scotland, were personally discontent with their treatment in Europe. Their accession to the colonial population, it might reasonably be supposed, had no tendency to diminish or counteract the hostile sentiments toward Britain which were daily gathering force in America. Marmion, in his Ancient and Modern History of the Maritime Ports of Ireland, verifies this. He says that the number of Irish who came during the years 1771, 1772, and 1773 was 25,000. The bulk of these came in by way of Philadelphia and settled in Pennsylvania and the Virginias. The Irish were arriving in the province in such great numbers during this period as to be the cause of considerable jealousy on the part of other settlers from continental Europe. They were a vigorous and aggressive element, eager for that freedom which was denied them at home. Large numbers of them went out on the frontier. While the war whoop of the savage still echoed within the surrounding valleys, and his council fires blazed upon the hills, those daring adventurers penetrated the hitherto pathless wilderness and passed through unexampled hardships with heroic endurance. They opened up the roads, bridged the streams, and cut down the forests, turning the wilderness into a place fit for man's abode. With their sturdy sons, they constituted the skirmish line of civilization, standing as a bulwark against Indian incursions into the more prosperous and populous settlements between them and the coast. 
From 1740 down to the period of the Revolution, hardly a year passed without a fresh infusion of Irish blood into the existing population, and as an indication that they distributed themselves all over the province, I find in every town and county history of Pennsylvania, and in the land records of every section, Irish names in the greatest profusion. They settled in great numbers, chiefly along the Susquehanna and its tributaries. They laid out many prosperous settlements in the wilderness of western Pennsylvania, and in these sections Irishmen are seen occupying some of the foremost and most coveted positions, and their sons, in after years, contributed much to the power and commercial greatness of the Commonwealth. They are mentioned prominently as manufacturers, merchants, and farmers, and in the professions they occupied a place second to none among the natives of the state. In several sections, they were numerous enough to establish their own independent settlements, to which they gave the names of their Irish home places, several of which are preserved to this day. It is not to be wondered at, then, that General Harry Lee named the Pennsylvania Line of the Continental Army the Line of Ireland. Ireland gave many eminent men to the Commonwealth, among whom may be mentioned John Burns, its first governor after the adoption of the Constitution, who was born in Dublin, George Bryan, also a native of Dublin, who was its governor in 1788, James O'Hara, one of the founders of Pittsburgh, Thomas Fitzsimmons, a native of Limerick, member of the First Congress under the Constitution which began the United States government and father of the policy of protection to American industries, Matthew Carey from Dublin, the famous political economist, and many others who were prominent as nation builders in the early days of the Keystone State. While the historians usually give all the credit to England and to English men for the early colonization of New England, whose results have been attended with such important consequences to America and the civilized world, Ireland and her sons can also claim a large part in the development of this territory, as is evidenced by the town, land, church, and other colonial records, and the names of the pioneers, as well as the names given to several of the early settlements, that the Irish had been coming to New England almost from the beginning of the English colonization is indicated by an order entered in the Massachusetts record under date of September 25, 1634, granting liberty to the Scottish and Irish gentlemen who intend to come hither to sit down in any place up Merrimack River. This, doubtless, referred to a Scotch and Irish company, which about that time had announced its intention of founding a settlement on the Merrimack. It comprised in all 140 passengers, who embarked in the Eagle Wing from Carrickfergus in September 1636, bringing with them a considerable quantity of equipment and merchandise to meet the exigencies of their settlement in the new country. The vessel, however, never reached its destination and was obliged to return to Ireland on account of the Atlantic storms, and there is no record of a renewal of the attempt. In the Massachusetts records of the year 1640, volume 1, page 295, is another entry relating to the persons come from Ireland, and in the town books of Boston may be seen references to Irishmen who were residents of the town in that year. From local histories, which in many cases are but verbatim copies of the original entries in the town books, we get occasional glimpses of the Irish who were in the colony of Massachusetts Bay between this period and the end of the century. For example, between 1640 and 1660, such names as O'Neill, Sexton, Gibbons, Lynch, Keeney, Kelly, and Hogan appear on the town records of Hartford, and one of the first schoolmasters 
who taught the children of the Puritans in New Haven, was an Irishman named William Collins, who, in the year 1640, came there with a number of Irish refugees from Barbados Island. An Irishman named Joseph Collins, with his wife and family, came to Lynn, Massachusetts, in 1635. Richard Duffy and Matthias Curran were at Ipswich in 1633. John Kelly came to Newbury in 1635 with the first English settlers of the town. David O'Killia, or O'Kelly, was a resident of Old Yarmouth in 1657, and I find on various records of that section a great number of people named Kelly, who probably were descended from David O'Killia. Peter O'Kelly and his family are mentioned as of Dorchester in 1696. At Springfield in 1656, there were families named Riley and O'Day, and Richard Burke, said to be of the male family of that name, is mentioned prominently in Middlesex County as early as 1670. The first legal instrument of record in Hampton County was a deed of conveyance in the year 1683 to one Patrick Riley of Lands and Chicopee. With a number of his countrymen, Riley located in this vicinity and gave the name of Ireland Parish to their settlement. John Maloney and Daniel McGuinness were at Woburn in 1676, and Michael Bacon, an Irishman of Woburn, fought in King Philip's War in 1675. John Joyce was at Lynn in 1637, and I find the names of William Healy, William Rail, William Barrett, and Roger Burke signed to a petition to the General Court of Massachusetts on August 17, 1664. Such names as McCarty, Gleason, Coggan, Lawler, Kelly, Hurley, McQuaid, and McCleary also appear on the Cambridge Church records down to 1690. These are but desultory instances of the first comers among the Irish to Massachusetts, selected from a great mass of similar data. In the early history of every town in Massachusetts, without exception, I find mention of Irish people, and while the majority came originally as poor redemptioners, yet, in course of time and despite puritanical prejudices, not a few of them rose to positions of worth and independence. Perhaps the most noted of these was Matthew Lyon of Vermont, known as the Hampton of Congress, who, on his arrival in New York in 1765, was sold as a redemptioner to pay his passage money. This distinguished American was a native of County Wicklow, other notable examples of Irish redemptioners who attained eminence in America were George Taylor, a native of Dublin, one of Pennsylvania's signers of the Declaration of Independence, Charles Thompson, a native of County Tyrone, the perennial secretary of the Continental Congress, and William Killen, who became Chief Justice and Chancellor of Delaware. Some of the descendants of the Irish redemptioners in Massachusetts are found among the prominent New Englanders of the past hundred years. The Puritans of Massachusetts extended no welcoming hand to the Irish, who had the temerity to come among them. Yet, as an historical writer has truly said, by one of those strange transformations which time occasionally works, it has come to pass that Massachusetts today contains more people of Irish blood in proportion to the total population than any other state in the Union. So great and so continuous was Irish immigration to Massachusetts during the early part of the 18th century that on St. Patrick's Day in the year 1737 a number of merchants who described themselves as of the Irish nation residing in Boston, formed the Charitable Irish Society, an organization which exists even to the present day. It was provided that the officers should be natives of Ireland or of Irish extraction, and they announced 
that the society was organized in an affectionate and compassionate concern for their countrymen in these parts who may be reduced by sickness, shipwreck, old age, and other infirmities and unforeseen accidents. I have copied from the town books as reproduced by the city of Boston 1,600 Irish names of persons who were married or had declared their intentions of marriage in Boston between the years 1710 and 1790, exclusive of 956 other Irish names which appear on the minutes between 1720 and 1775. In 1718, one of the largest single colonies of Irish arrived in Boston. It consisted of 100 families who settled at different places in Massachusetts. One contingent headed by Edward Fitzgerald, located at Worcester, and another at Palmer, under the leadership of Robert Farrell, while a number went to the already established settlement at Londonderry, New Hampshire. About the same time, a colony of fishermen from the west coast of Ireland settled on the Cape Cod Peninsula, and I find a number of them recorded on the marriage registers of the towns in this vicinity between 1719 and and 1743. In 1720, a number of families from County Tyrone came to Shrewsbury, and eight years later another large contingent came to Leicester County from the same neighborhood, who gave the name of Dublin to the section where they located. The annals of Leicester County are rich in Irish names. On the town books of various places in this vicinity, and on the rosters of the troops enrolled for the Indian War, Irishmen are recorded, and we learn from the records that not a few of them were important and useful men, active in the development of the settlements, and often chosen as selectmen or representatives. On the minutes of the meetings of the selectmen of Pelham, Spencer, Sutton, Charleston, Canton, Situate, Stoughton, Salem, Amesbury, Stoneham, and other Massachusetts towns, Irish names are recorded many years before the Revolution. In local histories, these people are usually called Scotch-Irish, a racial misnomer that has been very much overworked by a certain class of historical writers who seem to be un able to understand that a non-Catholic native of Ireland can be an Irishman. In an exhaustive study of American history, I cannot find any other race where such a distinction is drawn as in the case of the non-Catholic or so-called Scotch-Irish. In many instances, this hybrid racial designation obviously springs from prejudice and a desire to withhold from Ireland any credit that may belong to her, although in some cases the writers are genuinely mistaken in their belief that the Scotch as a race are the antithesis of the Irish, and that whatever commendable qualities the non-Catholic Irish are possessed of naturally spring from the Scotch. The first recorded Irish settlement in Maine was made by families named Kelly and Haley from Galway, who located on the Isles of Shoals about the year 1653. In 1692, Roger Kelly was a representative from the Isles to the General Court of Massachusetts and is described in local annals as King of the Isles. The large number of islands, bays, and promontories on the main coast, bearing distinctive Celtic names, attest the presence and influence of Irish people in this section in colonial times. In 1720, Robert Temple from Cork brought to Maine five shiploads of people, mostly from the province of Munster. They landed at the junction of the Kennebec and Eastern Rivers, where they established the town of Cork, which, however, after a precarious existence of only six years, was entirely destroyed by the Indians. For nearly a century, the place was familiarly known to the residents of the locality as Ireland. The records of York, 
Lincoln, and Cumberland counties contain references to large numbers of Irish people who settled in those localities during the early years of the 18th century. The town books of Georgetown, Curdery, and Kennebunkport of the period 1740 to 1775 are especially rich in Irish names, and in the Seiko Valley, numerous settlements were made by Irish immigrants, not a few of whom are referred to by local historians as men of wealth and social standing. In the Marriage and Other Records of Limerick, Maine, as published by the Maine Historical and Genealogical Recorder and the Marriage Registers of the First Congregational Church of Scarborough, and in other similarly unquestionable records, I find a surprisingly large number of Irish names at various periods during the 17th and 18th centuries. In fact, there is not one town in the province that did not have its quota of Irish people who came either direct from Ireland or migrated from other sections of New England. The records of New Hampshire and Rhode Island are also a fruitful source of information on this subject, and the provincial papers indicate an almost unbroken tide of Irish immigration to this section, beginning as early as the year 1640. One of the most noted of Exeter's pioneer settlers was an Irishman named Darby Field, who came to that place in 1631 and who has been credited by Governor Winthrop as the first European who witnessed the White Mountains. He is also recorded as an Irish soldier for discovery, and I find his name in the annals of Exeter as one of the grantees of an Indian deed dated April 3, 1638, as well as several other Irish names down to the year 1664. In examining the town registers, gazetteers, and genealogies, as well as the local histories of New Hampshire, in which are embodied copies of the original entries made by the town clerks, I find numerous references to the Irish pioneers, and in many instances they are written down, among others, as the first settlers. Some are mentioned as selectmen, town clerks, representatives, or colonial soldiers, and it is indeed remarkable that there is not one of these authorities that I have examined out of more than two hundred that does not contain Irish names. From these Irish pioneers sprang many men who attained prominence in New Hampshire in the legislature, the professions, the military, the arts and crafts, and in all departments of civil life down to the present time. In the marriage registers of Portsmouth, Boscoan, New Boston, Antrim, Londonderry, and other New Hampshire towns are recorded in some cases as early as 1716, names of Irish persons with the places of their nativity, indicating that they came from all parts of Ireland. At Hampton, I find Humphrey Sullivan teaching school in 1714, while the name of John Sullivan from Limerick, schoolmaster at Dover and at Berwick, Maine, for upwards of fifty years, is one of the most honored in early New Hampshire history. This John Sullivan was surely one of the grandest characters in the colony of Massachusetts Bay, and the record of his descendants serves as an all-sufficient reply to the anti-Irish prejudices of some American historians. He was the father of a governor of New Hampshire and of a governor of Massachusetts, of an attorney general of New Hampshire and of an attorney general of Massachusetts, of New Hampshire's only major general in the Continental Army, of the first judge appointed by Washington in New Hampshire, and of four sons who were officers in the Continental Army. He was grandfather of an attorney general of New Hampshire, of a governor of Maine, and of a United States Senator from New Hampshire. He was great-grandfather of an Attorney General of New Hampshire and great-great-grandfather of an officer in the 13th New Hampshire Regiment in the Civil War. In Rhode Island, Irish people are on record as far back as 1640 
and for many years after that date, they continued to come. Edward Larkin was an esteemed citizen of Newport in 1655. Charles McCarthy was one of the founders of the town of East Greenwich in 1677, while in this vicinity as early as 1680 are found such names as Casey, Higgins, McGinnis, Kelly, Murphy, Riley, Maloney, Healy, Delaney, Walsh, and others of Irish origin. On the rosters of the colonial militia who fought in King Philip's War, 1675, are found the names of 110 soldiers of Irish birth or descent, some of whom, for their services at the Battle of Narragansett, received grants of land in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. The New England Historical and Genealogical Register for 1848 contains some remarkable testimony of the sympathy of the people of Ireland for the sufferers in this cruel war, and the Irish donation sent out from Dublin in the year 1676 will always stand in history to Ireland's credit and as an instance of her intimate familiarity with American affairs, 100 years prior to that revolution which emancipated the people of this land from the same tyranny under which she herself has groaned. And yet, what a cruel travesty on history it reads like now, when we scan the official records of the New England colonies and find that the Irish were often called convicts and it was thought that measures should be taken to prevent their landing on the soil, where they and their sons afterwards shed their blood in the cause of their fellow colonists. In the minutes of the provincial assemblies, and in the reports rendered to the general court, as well as in other official documents of the period, are found expressions of the sentiment which prevailed against the natives of the Island of Sorrows. Only 20 years before the outbreak of King Philip's War, the Government of England was asked to provide a law to prevent the importation of Irish papas and convicts that are yearly powered upon us and to make provision against the growth of this pernicious evil. And the colonial courts themselves, on account of what they called the cruel and malignant spirit that has from time to time been manifest in the Irish nation against the English nation, prohibited the bringing over of any Irish men, women, or children into this jurisdiction on the penalty of 50 pounds sterling to each inhabitant who shall buy of any merchant, shipmaster, or other agent any such person or persons so transported by them. This order was promulgated by the General Court of Massachusetts in October 1654 and is given in full in the American Historical Review for October 1896. With the convicts and the redemptioners came the Irish schoolmaster, the man then most needed in America, and the fighting man, he too was to the fore, for when the colonies in after years called for volunteers to resist the tyranny of the British, the descendants of the Irish convicts were among the first and the most eager to answer the call. End of section 21. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.